Raise your hands if anybody is guilty. All right, Councilor Perusa, we're about to go live. to order. Today's meeting is being held by video conference. City staff are also connecting to the meeting by video conference. As City Hall remains closed, the public will continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council live. The clerk staff have connected all registered speakers to the meeting by audio. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Infrastructure and Environment Committee's page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. I ask for everyone's patience if we experience any delays or technical problems during the meeting. Members, the City Clerk has provided all agenda material on toronto.ca slash council and on CMP, the Clerk's meeting portal. Clerk's IT staff will be, able, will be available to you remotely if you need help with your devices. I would like to remind staff to keep their mics muted and their videos turned off unless they need to answer questions or speak to the committee. This will make it easier for me as chair to observe those participating in the meeting. Members, please keep your mic muted unless you wish to question staff or speak to an item and ensure that your video is on. As part of each item, I will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their mic if they wish to question staff or speak. I will then create a speakers list and I will call on members when it is their turn to speak. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask members ensure that they keep their video on and raise their hand to indicate their vote. Members, I want to remind you that you must still submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at IEC at Toronto.ca to help with motions. If there are any visiting members of council, I see two today, um, please keep your video on so that I know you are present and can give you the opportunity to ask questions of staff or speak. This will also assist the clerk to record attendance for the meeting. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you do, please uh, raise your hand and unmute your mic. Seeing none, may I have a motion to confirm the minutes? Councillor Layton, uh, all those in favour, that item carries. We have 18 items on our agenda and one addition. Let's proceed with a review of the agenda first and then uh, we will talk about new business. The first item is IE 21.1, amendment to the non-competitive blank contract number 47022986 with AccuWox Works, incorporated for provision of a hydraulic vacuum and pumping truck contractor with drive operators. Um, would somebody like to, anybody want to hold the item? Councillor Pasternak to move I'll the item. Move All those in favour, that item carries. Item IE 21.2, contract award of negotiable request for proposal number DOC 27959759900 for the trenchless rehabilitation of water mains, cured in place, pipe structural. Um, anybody want to hold the item? Someone move the item. Move Councillor Pasternak. All those in favour, that item carries. IE 21.3, amendments to the policy for accepting potentially contaminated lands to be conveyed to the city under the Planning Act. Uh, anyone want to hold the item? Someone like to move the item? I'll move it. Councillor Pasternak, I can always count on you. All those on favour, please raise your hand. Any opposed? That item carries. IE 21.4, extension of existing construction coordination agreement with Toronto Hydro. Anyone to hold the item? Can somebody move the item? Councillor Pasternak, uh, all those in favour? That item carries. IE 21.5, authority to negotiate and enter into regional waste management cooperation and contingency agreements. I will hold that item as there is one deputant. IE 21.6, creating a plan for safe environment days. Would anybody like to hold the item? No. Oh, um Madam Speaker, I'd like to move uh, the item and thank staff uh, for the flexibility on this matter. I think we can run safe and effective environment days as a drive-through. 
and I appreciate staff's uh, report um, and, uh, and their support for this important city program. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pasternak is moving the item. All those in favor? Any opposed? That item carries. IE 21.7, e-scooters accessibility and insurance issues. I will hold this item as there are many deputants. IE 21.8, transportation innovation challenges, fostering local outcomes oriented transformation. Uh, any questions on the item? We have a speaker on this item. Okay, thank you. We will hold this item. Uh, IE 21.9, traffic concerns and parking amendments, construction hub hall routes on Broadway Avenue, Roehampton Avenue and Redpath Avenue, wards 8, 12 and 15. Anyone like to hold the item? Okay, somebody like to move the item? Councillor Layton, all those in favor? That item carries. IE 21.10, Highland Creek Transportation Master Plan, Ward 25. Um, I would like to move the item as it is in my community. Um, anyone have questions? Seeing none, I'll move that item. All those in favor? That item carries. 21.11, safety and well-being of parks, forestry and recreation frontline workers. I will hold this item as there is a presentation from staff. IE 21.12, update on opening of washrooms. Anyone like to hold the item? Council Layton. Move, move the staff recommendation and thank staff for their quick action to provide facilities for people to enjoy their parks and not have to rush home, as well as the, the serious equity implications of providing places for people to properly go to the washroom. Okay. When you got to go, you go. Thank you, Councillor Layton. All those in favor? This item carries. IE 21.13, safe opening of the Barry Zuckerman Amphitheater, Ward 6. Councillor Pasternak to move the item. So, yes, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to, uh, to move the item. I, I thank staff for the report. The amphitheater has 1,500 seats. It's all outdoor. It has a massive stage. Um, if things keep going as planned with vaccinations and, and if the public health agrees, we could probably do outdoor uh, events uh, this coming summer. Uh, we rarely get more than about 300 people in there, so there's lots of room for social distancing. I thank staff for this report. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pasternak is moving the item. All those in favor? Any opposed? That item carries. Item IE 21.14, review of potential Riverdale Park East Top Bank improvements in coordination with Broadview Avenue, Ward 14. Uh, I know, um, Councillor Fletcher, you're here. Did you want to speak to the item or did you just want? Uh, yes, I just uh, sent a motion, Chair, yes. that I believe the clerks have, but we just asked for a scope of work to come back in September. Uh, this park is, Premier Park with the view of the city. It has had a new road built right through the park in order to put in part of the tank tunnel. So it's it's pretty invasive. Broadview will be ripped up over two years for streetcar tracks and then water mains and uh, just somehow I believe when we're doing that amount of infrastructure work in and around a major park, there should be some ability to uh, coordinate some upgrades to the park. So uh, I've had that conversation with staff, but I'd like to see what the scope would be before in for the budget 22. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fletcher. I'm prepared to move that on, on your behalf so that the Infrastructure and Environment Committee requests the General Manager Park Forestry and Recreation. It's disappearing on my screen. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, on options for the scope of this work to the September 14th, 2021 meeting of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. Okay, thank you. So when my screen toggles back, uh, we can vote on the amendment. All those in favor? All those in favor of the item as amended? Uh, that item carries. That brings us to IE 21.15, Indigenous Inclusion and Consultation in the Toronto Ravine Strategy and Stewardship Manual. Um, I know that, uh, Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion here to move as well as Councillor Layton. So, Councillor Pasternak? Yes, so um, I was approached by um, a strong voice in the Indigenous community who wanted to make sure that their uh, their opinions uh, and voice was uh, respected as we move forward 
mostly uh, on a stewardship manual. Now, the motion uh, that's before us it seems to say that it's on the, the Ravine, uh, Toronto Ravine strategy. Uh, we'll take that as an umbrella phrase, which would include the stewardship motion. So this is this is fine, and uh, and I think it's an important ingredient. So I understand you have a um, a companion uh, motion, uh, Councillor Layton. Yes, apparently. Do clerks have it? Sorry, just one moment. Councilor Layton, do you have two motions on this item? I don't believe so. The other one that I just sent was for a different item. Oh, okay. Okay. Then, yes, let's put up. okay, great. Okay, so we'll pull up. Uh, which one do you want to put? Councillor Pasternak's first. The... Uh, no, we'll do the Councillor Councilor Layton's first. Okay, we'll do Councillor Layton's, which is the um, Aboriginal Advisory Commissioner's rec uh, Affairs recommendation, and then followed by Councillor Pasternak's. Okay, Councillor Layton, yours is up if you'd like to introduce it. Okay. Yes, the City Council requests General Manager Parks, Forestry and Recreation in consultation with the Director Indigenous Affairs Office and other appropriate city agencies to consult with the broader Indigenous community on the implementation of their Toronto Ravine strategy. Okay, thank you. We're just waiting for yours to come up there, Councilor Pasternak. Okay, so it's the item, the original item that was submitted. So we'll vote on that one first and then followed by Councillor Layton. So all those in favor of, oh, here we go. They were able to find it. Okay, uh, so uh, Councillor Pasternak's motion is here. When we toggle back, we'll vote on this one. All those in favor? The amendment carries. All those in favor of Councillor Layton's motion? And then all those in favor of the item, the item carries. Great, that's 21.15. Uh, we now move to 21.16, further consideration of reducing salt use in our public realm. We have two deputations, so I will hold that item, i.e. 21.17, urging the federal government to take action to manage plastics. Uh, Councillor Layton, I know you have a deferral on this item as it will be before us next month. Yes, uh, I'm prepared to defer the item. I'd like to hold it, please. Okay, all right. Uh, the plan was to defer it to next month when we're having a wider discussion about plastics, Councilman and Wong, if that suits your needs. But if not, I'll try, that's, my that's answer, fine. I'll, I'll try and get my answers from staff beforehand. Okay. But okay. if I can get some work done now, it'd be more efficient for the next meeting. Okay, we can go to questions later, um, but I will point out that the single use item is coming before committee next month, and there are recommendations from staff in there related to um, items for the federal government, which is why we thought we would consider it there. So um, we can do the questions of staff now, but I think we'd still be deferring the item anyway. Um, okay, so we well, can- I'm happy to ask questions offline for efficiency's sake. Okay, so then we can move for now and then come back up with it later, or do you wanna still hold it until then? I think we've got a few deputants to listen to today, so I might have a few minutes of time. 
Okay. Okay. Great. Okay, we'll hold it and we can vote on the deferral later. Um, IE 21.18, supporting precarious driver work, sorry, supporting precarious delivery workers and bike couriers in Toronto, Ward 11. Um, I will hold as there is a deputant. Uh, that brings us to new business. Um, Councillor Crawford has circulated his letter. It is uh, creating designated waterfront areas for post funeral rites. Um, Councillor Crawford, as you're here, would you like to introduce it? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, I sorry, I was supposed to send this letter out a bit earlier. Uh, this is really just a report request to come back. Uh, it originated from a report out of the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. Um, uh, what it is is along a number of waterfront areas, uh, particularly in my ward, commonplace uh, to conduct post-funeral rites, which is really the scattering of ashes along the waterfront areas. It's a recognized uh, tradition um, with various uh, cultures. This has been an issue on and off over the years in, in my ward, and it come to late, came to light with uh, some media attention uh, about a month ago. Uh, what I'm looking to do is staff just to look at this and the potential of having a designated area for these cultural rights. Uh, it's something that Pickering and Mississauga have done successfully. Um, so I'm looking at having um, staff just come back and to report out on the uh, ability of maybe looking at something similar to those two jurisdictions to manage this. Uh, it's a traditional right. It's, it's, it's a very sensitive issue um, culturally uh, understanding that, but we need to figure out something in the city. So that's primarily what this is, just a report back uh, for next month to have a look at that. And I'd appreciate the support from the committee. Okay, uh, we'll first vote on introducing the item. So all those in favor of introducing the item. And next we can vote, I think there's, unless nobody needs to hold it, we can vote on the item, if we can pull it up. So I'll move on, Councillor uh, Councilor Crawford's behalf, behalf, that City Council direct the General Manager, Parks, Forestry and Recreation to report to the May 25th, 2021 meeting of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee on the feasibility of creating designated areas for the scattering of ashes along the city's waterfront. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, that item carries. Thank you, Councillor Crawford, for joining us. That brings us back to our regularly scheduled program. We have a lot of deputants, so I would like to move uh, three minutes uh, for deputation, so we can pull that up. Okay, there we go. I move that speakers who have not pre-registered be allowed to register to speak until 10 a.m. Uh, on April 28, 2021, after which no further registration is allowed and speakers list will be closed. Uh, two, that the length of public presentations be limited to three minutes. And three, that questions to speakers from each member of the committee, uh, including and council, be limited to three minutes. All those in favor? Uh, that carries. Okay, that brings us to our first item today, which is IE 21.5 and uh, authority to negotiate and enter into regional waste management cooperation and contingency agreements. We have one speaker. Emily Alfred, are you on the line? Not present. Okay. Um, are there questions of staff? Oh, she's here. Okay. Hi, thank you. Sorry, I was unable to unmute my microphone. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. You have five minutes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. 
So, um, councillors, I'm here from the Toronto Environmental Alliance. Um, Toronto Environmental Alliance is an environmental nonprofit organization. Uh, we fight for zero waste and we advocate for zero waste programs in Toronto. I'm here to talk about the item before you, which is seeking authority to send Toronto's waste to energy from waste and incinera incineration facilities in neighbouring communities. Um, at T, we believe that the thermal treatment of waste, including incineration with energy recovery or without, is an expensive and toxic form of disposal that works directly against Toronto Council's environmental commitments. It is not consistent with Toronto's zero waste commitments, a circular economy, and it seriously undermines Toronto's climate change goals. Further, sending Toronto's waste to incinerators and other municipalities directly contributes to the air pollution and toxic burden facing those communities. I've submitted a letter that I hope you all have a chance to read, and I'll summarize some of the key points in there. So first, the thermal treatment of waste is in direct opposition to a circular economy. Toronto has committed to being a leader in the circular economy. Toronto is a proud member of the International Circular Economy Network. The city has signed on to the C40 City Zero Waste Declaration that commits to reducing waste and diverting 70% of waste from landfill and incineration by 2030. These are important commitments and Toronto can show real leadership internationally. Uh, thermal treatment is of waste also contributes to climate change. In 2019, Toronto Council declared a climate emergency and committed to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Incineration is a very inefficient source of non-renewable energy. Only a very small amount of energy is collected by burning mixed garbage. Most of the energy comes from burning plastics, which is a fossil fuel product. From a climate perspective, it is undisputed that diverting waste by increasing recycling and composting conserves far more energy than any form of disposal. Energy from waste creates a mix of toxic air pollutants. This includes pollutants such as particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxides, but it also creates something very toxic known as dioxins and furans. These are extremely toxic substances that accumulate in the soil and in our bodies, and even the most sophisticated filtration systems cannot remove all of these substances. It's important to know that emission levels um, that are approved in certificates of approval are based on computer modeling. Real world emission testing is very limited and in many cases, cases happens only once per year or uh, in the case of the Durham York Energy Centre east of Toronto, twice per year. This is concerning and it shows that theoretical modeling may not be giving us the full picture of actual emissions. For the Durham York Energy Centre east of Toronto, this was built and only was commissioned five years ago. But since it began operation, dioxins have been released steadily by the facility, and there have been a number of events when dioxins were exceeded, including when the limits were 14 times what is allowed. After the incineration process, about one third of the waste remains as bottom ash and fly ash, and these often contain toxic substances. From Durham in 2020, 41,000 tons of this ash was trucked to another site in Niagara Falls or across the border to New York. This is spreading the waste and the potential toxic ash to even more communities. When we think about this request to send Toronto's waste to neighboring facilities, I think it's important to name those facilities. There are two energy from waste facilities near Toronto, one in Durham and one in Peel region. The Durham York Energy Centre was, was built recently, but despite pollution control, controls, that community surrounding the facility has been subject to a steady flow of various air pollutants, all known to cause significant mm -hmm. harm. It's also worth noting that in addition to this incinerator, that community faces emissions from one of the biggest polluters, St. Mary's Cement Facility. The local council and community in that area is appealing St. Mary's plans to burn 400 tons of garbage per day. This raises questions about the cumulative impact of incineration and communities around us that are bearing the impact of our lifestyle. The second facility is the privately owned Emerald Energy from Waste Incinerator in Brampton. This facility is more than 20 years old. It takes waste from anywhere in Ontario, including commercial and industrial waste. Air monitoring for the most toxic substances at this site happens only once per year. I think the final point I wanna make right now is to remember that Toronto's waste consistently, uh, City of Toronto audits of Toronto's waste have consistently shown that what's in Toronto's garbage isn't actually garbage. About 25% uh, of garbage in uh, the average garbage bag is actually recyclable materials, including single-use packaging and plastics, and materials that could have been recycled in the blue bin. About 30% is food and organic waste that should be composted and have those nutrients recycled. And also we can capture the green bin energy from uh, in Toronto's anaerobic digesters. The remainder of the waste includes also reusable materials, hazardous goods, and special waste like batteries and electronics and textiles. The fact is none of these materials belong in an incinerator. They should not be burned. It's an expensive and toxic form of waste management. There are alternatives and Toronto should manage waste in its own facility. 
Thank you. Are there questions of uh, the deputant? Okay, thank you very much, Emily, for joining us today. Um, are there questions of staff? Um, Councillor Layton, I know you have a motion and, and staff need more time to prepare it. So um, I also think that it's significant enough that it should be advanced circulated to the committee. So um, I, I leave it to the committee. Do you want to go to questions of staff or would you like to hold back this item so that there's time for that motion to be prepared and circulated? I'm fine for it to be for us to take some time to, uh, to circulate it. Okay, and Councillor Pasnack, do you have something to add to that? I was going to uh, start with questions of staff, but if, if, if you're holding down the item, we'll wait. Okay, so we'll hold that item um, while that is prepared and, and circulated. Um, and uh, that will then move us to item 21.5. Authority to, sorry, um, that that brings us to 21.7, e-scooters, accessibility and insurance issues. Uh, we have a considerable number of deputants on the line. The first deputant is Edward Eddie Rice with Canadians okay. with Disabilities Subcommittee of the Benai Brith Can Can Canada's League for Human Rights. Um, Eddie, are you on the line? Eddie? We think Edward Rice is on the line. Edward, would you like to unmute, please? Okay, we'll come back to Edward. Uh, that will bring us to Paul Michaels with Benai Brith Canada. Benai Brith, the uh, manager. Benai Brith, thank you. Paul Michaels, can you please connect your microphone? Um, can you hear me? Hi, Paul, we can hear you. You have five minutes. Uh, well, you know, um, I had made an application uh, to appear this morning. And, and sorry, uh, I just I want to correct back. myself. You have three minutes. I forgot we moved that. Okay, sorry, apologies yeah, for that. You made a three-minute ruling. Um, yes. So what happened, I, I made an application, and I didn't hear back, and Eddie called me. I think he's having trouble getting, um, getting connected. Um, I've sent him a note, and I hope he'll be able to join you. So I'm stepping in at the very last minute. I had been in the preliminary meeting um, to this, and uh, I just made a presentation emphasizing the, the risk that uh, the e-scooter clutter uh, poses to uh, to the disabled, and I used um, examples in my own family, uh, a nephew and and a cousin, both of whom have cerebral palsy, and the problems they've confronted already. They faced um, having e-scooters um, on sidewalks, uh, abandoned on sidewalks, and the impediment <clears throat> this pose, and even the threat uh, that it, that it poses to them. And uh, I, I myself have a, a, a walking um, issue, and uh, I fear, you know, in the future, what is going to happen as this industry grows in strength and power? It's it's a very very large business, apparently, um, and the business interest should not be allowed to overwhelm, for sure, uh, the safety and accessibility matters uh, pertaining to people with with disabilities. Um, I just want to point out something. This may be unusual to, to quote from an article. There was a very important piece in the New Yorker magazine, April 19th, by John Seabrook. And in it, he pointed out it is a large, it's a long article, and it's a survey of all the issues uh, dealing with, um, with e the e-scooter industry and the effect on individuals, and including those with disabilities. But he pointed out in terms of um, of safety issues, he talked about um, he talked about his his wife. Um, he said, "I just want to read this because it's very interesting. My wife rode maybe fifty yards down the unprotected bike lane on a street in Brooklyn because New York is now undertaking a pilot project um, 
I believe in Brooklyn or the Bronx, went over a speed bump and that was it. Uh, like a woman in an Irish racing study, a cycling study, she didn't feel safe. Of course, did you a micro mobility seer told me that he considers women to be a quote indicator species when it comes to new forms of transportation. He himself had his own problems um, in these scooters. He said uh, um, while he was riding on on the sidewalk as well, um, a chunk was missing between the plaza and the adjoining concrete, more pockmarked than pothole. My scooter caught it, caught it instantly, uh, ending my joyride and suddenly sending me hurtling um, toward the pavement face first. Um, we all know we've also heard reports that about one third of all the injuries occur in um, in first time users, but the threat to uh, to the disabled is an ongoing and is an ongoing problem and threat. And even the efforts to confine the scooters from the sidewalks to bike lanes poses its own own difficulties um, as well. So I could I could cite more from the uh, the report. All I can emphasize again is that uh, the first and foremost um, consideration must be safety and the impediments and the the risk that the flood of e-scooters uncontrolled. Even if you do impose certain restrictions, there are always exceptions. Great, thank you. And I need your does, final thought. Okay. No, just I can only emphasize. They need to take the concerns and the considerations of the disabled uh, into account as a, as a high, high Great. priority thank in you. deciding what you're going to do with these these devices. Okay, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for your deputation. I'll just do a check again. Do we have Edward on the line? Oh, he's still trying? Okay, we'll carry on with Amanda McKenzie with the March of Dimes Canada. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you very much. For Hi, Amanda. Uh, you have three minutes. Hi. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, thank you, the chair members of committee for allowing me to speak today. Um, my name is Amanda McKenzie. I'm the national manager of public affairs at March of Dimes Canada, one of the country's largest nonprofit organizations supporting people living with a disability. While we have a national reach, our headquarters is based in Thorncliffe Park, and we have a long history of providing services and programs for Torontonians with disabilities with seven sites across the city. Both in professional and personal capacities, I'm here today to urge the committee not to move forward with the e-scooter rental pilot project and to continue to enforce the ban on e-scooters in the city of Toronto. See, I also speak from lived experience. My little brother Graham is profoundly disabled with both physical and intellectual disabilities. I'm his guardian. He uses exclusively a manual wheelchair, which someone has to push to get him around his home and our community, which we consider to be the whole of our city. Before the pandemic and once we're out of it, Graham and I go on city adventures. Every week we get on the TTC and go to an area of the city we aren't as familiar with. We've done Liberty Village, the distillery, islands and the Danforth, the bluffs and to one of our favorite restaurants and going to movies downtown. Common to all of our adventures are the challenges we face in getting around on our sidewalks. With the usual issues related to transit accessibility and construction, broken sidewalks, having to go across busy intersection backwards so his wheels don't get stuck in streetcar tracks, snow removals and ice issues in the winter, we deal with more than our share of challenges in accessing our city's amenities and getting around town to generally live life. Our city sidewalks are being used for a multitude of programs and as terrific as Cafe TO is, the program has created some more barriers. We understand there needs to be a balance, but we really can't manage any additional challenges on our sidewalks. Allowing e-scooters on our streets is a very definition of an additional sidewalk barrier. Other deputants will provide statistics, but a real life example is that of Calgary. My older brother lives there and is the kind of guy you'd expect would relish e-scooters. Instead, he calls them a menace, with scooters being dropped anywhere on the sidewalks once users are done with them, causing obvious problems. Additionally, there were over 700 emergency room and urgent care visits of adults and children alone with scooter-related injuries in the first season of their pilot. The cost to our system and to the people in our city with disabilities and seniors just aren't worth it. Our city is larger and denser than the others. Our roads and sidewalks are simply not designed for this new form of transportation, and riders are still learning how to use e-scooters. Now's not the time. We've heard unanimously from the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee twice not to lift the ban. City staff has concluded that 
accessibility barriers, safety concerns, and insurance issues remain unresolved. And as I've heard loudly and clearly from our March of Dimes Canada community and others in our stakeholder community, e-scooters pose a dangerous safety risk for people with physical disabilities and those who use mobility devices, seniors, and those with vision or hearing loss. The City of Toronto is committed to creating an accessible city and a vision zero approach for roadway safety. I urge you to live these commitments by listening to the unanimous voices of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee and the broader community and just, just say no to e-scooters in our city. Thank you for the opportunity to present and we'll be following the discussion closely. Great, thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions for Amanda? Seeing none, we will move to Arda Urtuk, Rural Technologies Incorporated. You have three minutes. Thank, thank you, Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Arda Hetrick, and I'm the co-founder and the chief communications officer at Roll. Roll is a Canadian-owned, developed, and operated shared micromobility company incubated in the University of Toronto's Entrepreneurship Hub. We operated our fleet of e-scooters in Ottawa, Calgary, and currently operating in Kelowna. Since the introduction of shared e-scooter systems in 2017, the e-scooter industry has been pivotal, pivotal in changing transportation in many communities. The industry has been relentlessly working on finding solutions to common challenges. In other Canadian cities, the measures we have implemented work extremely well, and one of the cities, Calgary, has approved a permanent micromobility program after seeing the success and the benefits of shared e-scooters. I respectfully disagree with some of the conclusions reached by the staff. With respect to the import parking, there are many solutions that are being used, such as this lock to system, docking stations, validating the end of trip pictures, and etc. The staff also concluded that the insurance products for e scooter operators are not available in Canada. In other major cities in Canada where e scooters are allowed, there are identification clauses and there are various insurance products available for e scooter operators, including general commercial liability. In terms of enforcement, there are many measures that are in place by e scooter operators. Shared scooters have a speed governor that limits the speed. We're using geofencing technology that we can set no park, slow speed, and no right zones. There are technologies available for sidewalk riding protection on a real-time basis. The enforcement is done by the operators without using the city's resources. With respect to safety and accessibility barriers, we had more multiple meetings with CNIB to introduce new technologies like a sound emitting device and still developing them with their consultation. The data from other major cities in Canada suggests that e-scooters are not more than dangerous than bicycles. For example, in Calgary, there were only three incidents involving a pedestrian being injured by e-scooter and one incident involved a cyclist out of more than a million rides. COVID-19 has had profound impacts on small businesses in Toronto. Shared e-scooters play an important role during the economic recovery from COVID-19. More than 70% of road trips in Ottawa and Calgary ended at business improvement areas in 2020. Despite not being permitted currently in Toronto, e-scooters are increasingly present on city streets since last year with the COVID-19 pandemic. I counted 28 personal e-scooters yesterday on Yonge Street while out for a walk. There is no practical way to restrict the use of personal e-scooters, and the city can choose to not regulate while the use of micro-mobility vehicles continues to grow substantially, or the city can develop a sensible framework for personal and shared micromobility vehicles to advance public safety. As outlined in our written submission, we submitted along with other operators, we suggest a working group be established comprised of City of Toronto staff, the e-scooter operators, and members of the accessibility community, including AODA Alliance and CNIB, to work collaboratively to address mutual areas of interest and concerns and report back to this committee by July 5th, 2021. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of Arda? Okay, seeing none, we will move to Nisha Mitchell, Canadian National Institute for the Blind, Greater Toronto Area Foundation. Nisha, are you on the line? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, thanks for joining us, Nisha. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you this morning. My name is Nisha Mitchell. I am the Advocacy and Outreach Coordinator with CNIB. I am also a member of the Sight Loss Committee. I utilize a white cane as my mobility aid. I am also a resident of the Scarborough region. In early March of this year, 
the CNIB, along with the AODA Alliance, held a joint town hall meeting with roughly 30 members of our sight loss community and our sighted supporters to discuss the e-scooter, the dangers of e-scooter. During that meeting, there was an overwhelming feeling of danger and clients were feeling that e-scooters posed a dangerous threat to their safety, as well as their accessibility barriers to the disability community as a whole, and not just the sight loss community. In that meeting and beyond, I've heard countless stories from members of the sight loss community of e-scooters being left on sidewalks, being driven recklessly at high speeds on busy Toronto sidewalks. And in some cases, I've heard stories from the members of the community who have been hit by someone driving an e-scooter. And one thing they have all said to me is, Nisha, I did not hear it coming. E-scooters have been very silent. And for someone with sight loss, not being able to hear the device poses an even dangerous safety threat. And for those who have been hit by someone riding an e-scooter, I have heard them being left with physical injuries, mental anguish, loss of wage, and loss of work. Yes, e-scooters may be considered a form of convenience. However, they should not be given precedence over pedestrian safety. By introducing e-scooters to our streets, you will further marginalize and isolate the sight loss community. In cities where the e-scooter pilot project has continued or failed, the problems that have been well documented and still not resolved have been e-scooters being left on sidewalks, e-scooters left haphazardly on doorways or leaning up against poles blocking assisted pedestrian single signals, as well as crosswalks. And with that said, these problems are still in existence. What does the City of Toronto think will make our experience any different with e-scooters? In conclusion, I would like to say that by introducing e-scooters to our city streets, we'll add an additional accessibility barrier brought on by this pandemic. E-scooters will join social distancing protocols along with physical measures that have once made spaces accessible to the site loss community now inaccessible, therefore spelling a recipe for further isolation for the site loss community. Madam Chair, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your deputation. Are there any questions, Venetia? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining us. That brings us to Ashley Brown with SPIN. Ashley, are you on the line? Yes, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to Madam Chair, members of the committee, General Manager Gray and staff, my name is Ashley Brown, and I am the Head of Government Partnerships at SPIN a shared micromobility company. We thank you for your consideration to bring e-scooters to the city of Toronto. I also appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Sure. At SPIN, we, we understand and share the concerns raised in the staff report. We respond to these concerns with viable solutions to increase accessibility and safety, not to paper over these issues. Our expertise at SPIN is modern micromobility systems design, operation, marketing. We are a wholly owned subsidiary of Ford Motor Company. We share Ford's core values to earn trust, do the right thing, make an impact, carry the torch and create a better tomorrow. We exemplify these values in the over 80 cities throughout North America and Europe. And just two weeks ago, we launched in Edmonton, our first city in Canada. Shared micromobility programs require rich partnerships with cities. Our mission is to give people the freedom to move. That freedom extends beyond our riders. One person's mobility cannot compromise another's. Pedestrians, people living with disabilities, and seniors deserve to move hazard-free in their communities. At SPIN, we recognize new mobility requires a multi-pronged approach and patience from the industry. We are eager to do that work over the next 12 months to work with disability groups and residents and develop new technologies that meet unresolved concerns. Explore how e-scooters can serve varying mobility needs through an adaptive vehicle program. Conduct closed demonstrations showing how new technologies can and are stopping 
sidewalk, and improper biting. Cities and neighborhoods require fitted solutions. We therefore commit to a year-long effort to assess neighborhoods individually. Our tools of choice include community-driven tactical urbanism. Our workshops will engage a minimum of 100 diverse stakeholders to meet the needs of all residents. Good infrastructure makes responsible parking easy. Our spin hubs work like docking stations. They declutter sidewalks and keep order in the public right of way. Hubs also relieve pressure and augment existing bike share programs. A strong workforce and a local team with fair wages and proper benefits shows our commitment to the city. This hiring model also helps cities with oversight. Local, locally hired staff take pride in neighborhoods where they serve. And finally, we believe e-scooter itself needs to assist in enforcement and our newest model provides real-time parking validation and sidewalk detection with 95% accuracy. This will protect our pedestrians, especially seniors and people with disabilities. We at SPIN commit to evolve our products and services in ways that meet the needs of the people of Toronto. We commit to discover, listen, learn, and experience more of the community around us. Micromobility brings communities and their urban environment closer together. At SPIN, we look forward to uh, continued collaboration and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your deputation, Ashley. Are there any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, that will bring us to our next one, Andrea Hatala. Andrea, can you please connect your microphone? I'm calling again on Andrea Hatala. Okay, we'll move to the next deputant, uh, Emily Daigle. Okay, we don't see Emily. I will move to Jonathan Hopkins. Jonathan? Uh, good, Hi, good thank you. Good morning, Council. This is, this is Jonathan Hopkins. I represent a line in Canada. I wanted to dive directly into the four issues raised by staff in their report today, considering their importance to everybody involved. Uh, this involves new updates um, that I think uh, and insights that I think council will find valuable. In reverse order, starting off with insurance. We think it is important to have first and third party insurance in Canada and that that model can copy the model used in Europe. Um, to do that, we recommend that council direct staff to put that requirement directly in the framework because cities help make the market for insurance. And this is the critical step to the city getting exactly what it wants. If it's not in the framework for the city, there's no way this will be solved. For indemnification, that issue is also solved by having first and third party insurance. It ensures that people are not risked with liability for injuries to themselves or others. Again, put this in a framework and it will not be an issue. Third, lack of city resources for enforcement. Experiences in other cities have proven that the industry can do enforcement without cities, um, as Finn just noted. Um, this includes fines for parking violations or using street teams to assess fines for people who have riding violations on the sidewalk. Again, this can be solved by putting the requirement in the framework at no cost to the city, having the necessary enforcement. It's important to note that enforcement and infrastructure are the two biggest solutions that riders state will reduce their behavior to ride on sidewalks or to miss park vehicles. This is proven in other cities. It can be done, put it in the framework. Finally, safety for people with disabilities and seniors. Um, this is solvable. The industry has provided lock two as a solution that reduces complaints in Chicago by 80%. Um, that has reduced parking citations in San Francisco to virtually zero. E-scooters, when lock two is provided, are parked correctly 99% of the time. Staff's argument against doing this has been lack of parking infrastructure, but this program is actually a solution to that as well. Seattle has proven that they can take funds, permit fees from the e-scooter companies to build more bike racks that can be used for both private bikes and for e-scooter parking off the sidewalk. The right solution for Toronto, for example, is that in downtown, there should never be a scooter parked on the sidewalk or ridden on the sidewalk the city can make that possible. Again, the solution is 
put it in a framework. Um, we think it's very important to recognize that not moving forward with e-scooters is really a vote for the status quo. And the status quo is untenable. Honestly, a lot of what we are hearing from disability advocates is frustration with the status quo and fear that any change will make matters worse. But the status quo where 40 pedestrians are killed a year on streets and 160 to 200 other serious injuries is a status quo that we could do anything that we can to change, including embracing solutions that 200 cities, other cities around the world have already taken. I, I thank you for your time and welcome any questions. Uh, thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions for Jonathan? Councillor Ainsley, three minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, Jonathan, could you explain a bit? Um, you talked about um, the lack of enforcement. How, how are scooter companies self-enforcing or self-monitoring um, people that are violating the laws, like you said, riding on sidewalks? How are they doing that in other jurisdictions? Councillor Ainsley, that's a, a really important question, and I appreciate it. Um, first, for parking, and then I'll go to sidewalk riding. For parking, um, one solution that's been done in Calgary is an audit of a select percentage of, of parking um, cases and assessing about $10 fines for missed parking of vehicles. In other jurisdictions like Portland, um, city basically bylaw in Portland has uh, you know gone out and photographed people riding on sidewalks or people missed parking and assigned 15 and $50 fines, $50 fines for missed parking or for sidewalk riding. What we are saying is that the industry you know, so can collaborate together to, to create teams to do the same thing as the city of Portland is doing at no cost to the city. It actually makes the process more efficient as it takes um, the role of bylaw and special or police and special requirements that they have out and allows the industry to within its own resources, you know, charge somebody's credit card for a fine as soon as their scooter is recognized to be misparked or riding on sidewalk. This is eminently doable. We're doing some of these things already in other cities. And then studies, like when we ask riders who ride on the sidewalk, um, what the two biggest solutions would be. Number one is infrastructure, um, bike lanes like Toronto is building 25 kilometers more of, and the second one is fines. Those are the top two solutions. They can take misbehavior down to close to zero. Okay, and and so to monitor that, are you using the GPS that's on the scooters to figure out that people are driving on sidewalks or? It can be a combination of things, Councillor. Um, for sidewalks, um, companies do have sidewalk detection, certainly Lime does, and Spin just mentioned that they do. Um, that can, it's not 100% proof that somebody's riding on the sidewalk, so we don't find based upon the sidewalk riding tech yet but we can call, warn, and ban somebody after after a second or third offense if, because three times being recognized at 95% accuracy of the right inside sidewalk, we can ban people. And then as I've stated before, we can use teams counselor that when they are, you know, walking around and making sure scooters are parked correctly, if they see somebody riding on the sidewalk, they use the license number on that sidewalk to find that rider. If you note the time and the license plate, the company knows who was riding and can charge that credit card. Okay. okay. And then what is the I lane think that's about, past um, three minutes, <laughs> Councillor Ainsley. Sorry. Um, oh, okay. All right. I'll uh, save any my questions for another deputy? Any thank additional you. questions? Okay. Uh, seeing none, thank you, Jonathan. That brings us to our next deputy, David Lepofsky. Hello, can you unmute me, please? Hi, David, you are unmuted and we can hear you. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, members of the committee, you have been advised in the strongest terms, twice unanimously by your accessibility advisory committee and by uh, impartial city staff in an excellent professional report that to allow e-scooters will endanger safety, and accessibility for people with disabilities and others. You are obliged under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act to bring Toronto to become fully accessible to us people with disabilities. If in the face of this advice and the unanimous feedback you're receiving from people with disabilities at this committee and elsewhere, 
that e-scooters will endanger us, whether rental or privately owned. If nevertheless you were to give in to the uh, calls of the corporate lobbyists, you would be the city would be intentionally creating new barriers against us at a time when Toronto is getting less accessible already, not more accessible to us. That's the wrong way to go. Listen to us, listen to the business improvement area uh, from Danforth that filed with you that said they don't want e-scooters in their area. They're bad for their business. If it's bad for us and it's bad for business, it's bad to do. So now let's turn to what the corporate lobbyists are saying as they mount the biggest feeding frenzy of lo corporate lobbying going on at City Hall right now. The biggest corporate lobby of e-scooters? What do they say? Well, they're being ridden illegally by people who own them, so let us rent them. In other words, if people are using crack cocaine illegally, I guess we should legalize it rather than enforce the law. Listen to the advice uh, of your own accessibility advisory committee. No e-scooters, no pilot, enforce the ban now. The other solutions are new technology. You just heard a corporate lobbyist concede that they will not effectively ensure they're not ridden on sidewalks. Or leave it to the corporate lobbyists who want as many ridden as possible to enforce restrictions on how they're ridden. That is laughable. Why don't we ask uh, 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 those who are committing, uh, who are involved in making money from other such behavior to enforce the law to restrict their improper behavior? That is not the way to go. And a $10 fine that they're supposed to impose, which presumably goes to their pockets, that's laughable too. That's not going to change anything. The solution, uh, members of this committee, is to stand up to the corporate lobbyist and to stand up for people with disabilities. We've suffered enough during this pandemic. We don't need to suffer more so they can flood the city with e-scooters, make money and claim to be enforcing rules that they know around the world are regularly violated. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your deputation, David. Are there questions for David? Okay. Um, seeing none, uh, that will bring us to our next uh, deputant, Patricia Israeli. Sorry, Israel. Hi, am I unmuted? Hi, Patricia. We can hear you. Thank you. You have three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm 69 years old, and I have been disabled all of my life. I am a wheelchair user, and I use a manual wheelchair. I've also been a disability rights activist all my life, and so I'm very familiar with a lot of issues that we've fought for. I had a little dog for 13 years, and I often walked her on O'Connor Drive, which is very near where I live. That's a hill. And many times, bicyclists would silently come up behind me. I didn't know they were there. Had I moved an inch or two to the right, I would have been smashed into. Had my little dog moved an inch or two to the right, she probably would have been killed. These are bicycles. I also had to contend with occasionally a guy, a grown man, on a small motorcycle on the same street. I had to move on the grass to make sure I was safe from him. I never saw this man use the street ever. Now we're talking about e-scooters. Silent e-scooters. Um, I cannot tell you how worried I am about that, about just taking a simple walk in the city that I love. Um, I've done some research. I've looked at various cities around the world with e-scooters. I have read too many horrible articles about many, many injuries, traumatic injuries, brain injuries, broken bones, and let me tell you, when a senior crashes to the sidewalk with a broken hip, he or she may die, because that happens. Do you want that? I don't. Um, E-scooters are left scattered all over sidewalks in cities around the world. Some people in wheelchairs cannot pick them up to move them. They're stuck. So we'll be on the sidewalk going, what do I do now? How do where I get to? Where can I get where I want to go? So we'll be stuck by that. 
in Paris, they're throwing them in the water in this, you know, in the river. Incredible. So toxic. Um, I don't see the need for e-scooters. I also don't hear people asking for them. I don't see petitions. I don't see big protests. We want our e-scooters. What I seem to be hearing is private companies that want to make a lot of money from renting them. And they're denying that there's any problems and all the problems are being fixed. No, they're not. Not from the research I just did. It was a horror story a lot of times. Please listen to your own advisory committee that said no. No to the pilot program. No to e-scooters. Protect us. Protect people with disabilities. Protect the seniors. Protect children. If they're hit by e-scooters, they'll be killed too. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation in three minutes on the dot. Um, are there any questions for Patricia? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Patricia, for joining us today. Um, we're gonna go back to Edward Eddie Rice with Canadians for Disabilities as he's now been connected. Uh, Edward, are you ready for your deputation? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. You have three minutes. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you for the members of the committee for listening to me. My uh, speech here today is gonna to be a little different than the other people you hear from because they are, most of them are, are talking from uh, statistical and uh, practical uh, points regarding the e-scooters. My deputation here is uh, something of my own personal experience. I believe hopefully that the documents that I submitted has been uh, divided up amongst you, especially the two pages of photographs. I hope you all have received them. Uh, the photographs are about 20 photographs demonstrating the hazards that the e-scooters pose. Now, I realize that the owners of these companies uh, want to paint a rosy picture, but the reality is they don't. Uh, there was an article yesterday in the Toronto Star touting the virtues of the e-scooter, and if you look under the comment section of the article, two hours within two hours there was a gentleman who was blind, excuse me, who was deaf, who was hit by an e-scooter trying to cross Young and Bloor, waiting for the light to change because he didn't see the, he couldn't hear uh, the e-scooter coming. My own particular personal excuse, um, excuse, sorry, my own particular experience is that the e-scooters, it's not so much the e-scooter themselves, it's the people who operate them. You can't legislate common sense. Obviously, the owners of the company want to make money, no doubt about that, but it's their clientele is where the problem is. The scooters don't leave themselves lying around haphazardly. It's the people that operate them do, and you, and you, can't, uh, you can't legislate common sense to work every time. The, the dangers that they cause is worldwide known. There's been injuries, there's been death, and I don't want to see that in our city of Toronto. I believe that the city should be, there's enough hazards out there, there's enough barriers out there, and we don't have to add to it. And just remember, that, you know, people that are able-bodied, in the split second of an eye, you can be injured and suffer a disability as well. And you have to bear that in mind. No, there's no reason to add to the problems that we already have by allowing e-scooters on our streets. Thank you very much. Thank you for your deputation and your patience connecting. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, that will bring us to our next speaker, John Ray. Second of an eye, you can be injured. Am I connected? Hi, John, thank you. You have uh, three minutes, uh, please go ahead. Can, can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is John Ray. I'm the past national president of the Alliance for Equality of Blind Canadians, and I appear today on behalf of our organization and our members. I am both a blind person, a senior, and a longtime native Torontonian. When I was here last time, I spoke about a number of issues. The fact that that e-scooters would only add to sidewalk clutter, the fact that they are dangerous, the fact that they will inevitably meander from the, from the road onto the sidewalk, and the fact that 
the the lack of noise they may emit may, may enable them to sneak up on me when I'm unaware. These pose additional dangers, and it's up to the city to, as David Lepofsky pointed out, to help create more accessibility and not create new barriers. But today, Madam Chair, I want to spend my time on one particular item. That is the issue of cost. When I was here last time, a couple of you fine councillors made the remark that, that, that the city's enforcement cupboard is barren. That was an apt comment last year, and even doubly so after the city's uh, 2021 budget process. It's true, the city's uh, enforcement cover is barren, and the money that would be required to enforce this new bylaw should be much more productively spent on dealing with providing accommodations for the homeless, for improve, improving public transportation, and preparing for the end of the pandemic for all Torontonians. The, requ the replies from the industry are not persuasive. The notion that they can self-regulate is, is absolutely ludicrous. And the notion that but continuing to ban e-scooters is support for the status quo is not entirely true. We in the disabled community are as concerned as are all other Torontonians about reducing uh, uh, greenhouse gases and, cre and helping our, our environment. And there's an answer to that. And that is to invest more in public transit, both the regular system and wheel trans. That's the answer to reducing the number of cars on our streets. Invest in public transit. In conclusion, Madam Chairman, I support the fine report of city staff. I am totally opposed to allowing this menace to be unleashed onto our streets. And I hope that the committee will overwhelmingly support the report of the uh, of staff and recommend that council continue the ban of this menace onto Toronto streets. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for your deputation, John. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, that will bring us to Chris Schaefer with Bird Canada. Chris, are you on the line? Hello, Chair. Hello, you have three minutes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good morning, committee members. My name is Chris Schaefer and I'm Vice President of Government Affairs at Bird Canada, a shared e-scooter company. Let's rewind the clock back almost two years to this day. On April 25th, 2019, this committee passed a motion directing staff to report back on a regulatory framework for e-scooters in the fourth quarter of 2019. On September 9th and then subsequently on October 2nd, 2019, this committee and city council passed a motion to temporarily ban e-scooters until such time as a regulatory framework could be introduced. Fast forward to today, it's been two years and three days and despite the growing presence of e-scooters on city streets, and without having reviewed how e-scooters could be regulated in this city, city staff are now asking you to make the temporary ban on e-scooters permanent. Canadian cities like Kelowna, Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, Waterloo, among others, have all hosted shared e-scooter programs to date. Windsor recently concluded their RFP and a shared e-scooter program is set to begin next month. A dozen other Canadian cities like Hamilton, Mississauga, Brampton, London, and Waterloo Region are at various stages of regulatory development towards shared e-scooter programs. These Canadian cities and well over 150 other global cities have all managed to figure out how to regulate e-scooters successfully with shared e-scooter programs in place. These cities include Barcelona, Berlin, Budapest, Bucharest, Brussels, Cologne, Copenhagen, Dusseldorf, Frankfurt, Hamburg, Helsinki, London, Lisbon, Madrid, 
Marseille, Munich, Milan, Oslo, Paris, Prague, Porto, Rome, Stockholm, Vienna, Warsaw, Zurich, Tel Aviv, Atlanta, Austin, Boston, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Chicago, Denver, Detroit, Kansas City, Los Angeles, Memphis, Milwaukee, Miami, Nashville, New York, Orlando, Portland, Sacramento, Salt Lake City, San Antonio, San Diego, San Francisco, San Jose, Santa Monica, Scottsdale, St. Louis, Tampa, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Rio de Janeiro, Santiago, Auckland, Singapore, Seoul, and Abu Dhabi. I could go on, but I'll stop there. I think you get the point. All of these cities have shared e-scooter programs in place that adequately address issues like insurance and accessibility. All of these cities have done what Toronto has been unable or unwilling to do. This despite the fact that a poll by Nanos Research this month found that 70 percent of Torontonians support the city establishing a pilot for shared e-scooters. I would suggest the most prudent course of action at this point is to simply refer this item back to staff. Instead of piecemeal reports, city staff would come back to you with the report you've asked for now twice and not received. How e-scooters in this city could be regulated. Thank you. I look forward to any questions. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the next deputant, which is Thea Curdy. Thea, are you on the line? Okay, uh, that will bring us to Kat Hamilton. Kat is with the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Kat, can you hear me? You're live. Mm -hmm. Good morning, can you hear me okay? We can hear you, you have three minutes, thank you. Okay, thanks very much and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present today. My name is Kat Hamilton and I'm the Senior Manager for Ontario East in Government Relations at CNIB. Uh, CNIB is a non-profit organisation delivering innovative programmes and advocacy to people who are blind or partially sighted, including over 20,000 people living in Toronto with significant sight loss. As a former resident of Toronto for the best part of 10 years, until I moved to Ottawa last year, I can speak to both my experiences in both cities, in addition to bringing forward concerns from our community members of people who are blind or partially sighted. My Ottawa colleague provided a deputation to the Toronto AAC on February 25th, which outlined CNIB's feedback from the Ottawa office that we received from residents with sight loss during the 2020 e-scooter pilot. I won't go over that old ground today in repeating what was presented at that meeting in detail, but we did hear from community members that e-scooters in Ottawa were left abandoned at intersections, lying on their sides, leaning up the accessible um, audible pedestrian signal buttons and in other really inappropriate locations. This created serious stripping hazards, injuries, barriers, and barriers to accessibility. And throughout the pilot, I personally moved dozens of e-scooters that were improperly parked on the sidewalk, and I'm certain that many more citizens felt compelled to do the same, even though in the City of Ottawa survey, only 77% uh, of people stated that they would just leave it when they came across poorly parked e-scooters, which I'm not blaming people uh, of during COVID who, who would want to touch that anyway. Um, but people would thank me in the street when they saw me moving e-scooters. But in all honesty, I don't want thanks. I want a city that is barrier-free for people with disabilities. Our sort of community members also reported being injured by e-scooters riding past them on the sidewalk. Being hit on the arm by a vehicle going 20 kilometres an hour could not only be painful, but knock a person's confidence and feeling of safety navigating the neighbourhood. These minor injuries that don't require medical treatment often go unreported, but their impact is profound. During the pilot, I also witnessed children, clearly under the legal age, riding rental company branded e-scooters, as well as two people riding on one e-scooter on multiple occasions, and in my observation, people riding intoxicated. And during the entire pilot, I probably saw less than five people in total wearing a helmet, um, and on an hourly occurrence, people riding on the sidewalk outside my apartment balcony and this is supported by the city's report where 72 percent of survey respondents witnessed sidewalk riding in the pilot so 
instead of looking at ways to flood our streets with e-scooter rentals, we should look at ways to clamp down on privately owned e-scooters that are being illegally ridden in the city of Toronto, and in particular those who are riding e-scooters that do not even meet the safety requirements for e-scooter design. Ottawa does not have a flourishing bike share programme like Toronto, which already meets many first-class mile transportation needs and provides an excellent option for active transportation that keeps people fit and healthy. The Ottawa e-scooter pilot demonstrates that e-scooters were not used as a first-last mile solution, with 76% reporting that they use e-scooters for fun and leisure. And this fact cannot be ignored when considering if e-scooters are fully realising the ambition of point-to-point transportation and really meeting the needs of our community. So in conclusion, CNIB has always maintained that we are not anti-active transportation or even anti-fun, but it cannot be at the cost of the safety of our vulnerable residents. And we are not satisfied that the regulations and technology that exist today can keep the community members safe and riders safe, concerns which were also expressed in city staff reports for the AAC. Therefore, we urge the committee today to learn from Ottawa's poor decision and enact the AAC's motion that a ban prohibiting their use in public space remain in place without any exception. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Can we just get your final thought on that? Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, okay. Uh, we're going to go back to Andrea Hatala, who is now on the line. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, we can hear you. You have three minutes. Okay, great. I just wanted to focus on the speed of um, e-scooters because um, apparently they go at um, 20, 20 miles or 20 K an hour, which is like a little bit too fast to drive on the road and way too fast to drive on the sidewalks. Um, when, I'm, when I'm walking down the street, People can, um, can, you know, riding bikes, which are a little bit slower, they can see me and they move out of the way. But East East, I'm not sure whether people have the, um, the, 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 you know, reflexes or the time to see people. And there were a lot more, there were a lot more um, um, injuries in, in places where there have been East and they've gone to the um, they've gone to the emergency room and and the city has to pay um, for the cost of injuries. So for those two reasons, I wish that you would ban or not not introduce e-scooters onto the roads. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation, Andrea. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, that will bring us back up. Emily Daigle is now on the line as well. Emily? Uh, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for joining us. Hello. You have three minutes. Hi, guys. Um, Y'all know me, so I won't have to introduce myself. Um, I'm honored to be speaking on this issue, as I have in a few places. I'm honored that I'm uh, joining many of my fellow advocate community members and, and many people like myself. I come from this from a different perspective. I'm legally blind as well as being in a power wheelchair. On top of that, I'm also hearing impaired. Many of you don't know about me, this stuff. Uh, I have been hit by e-scooters. Now let's not confuse this issue. There's kick scooters and then there's MO style scooters, like the ones with the seat that kind of look like mini motorcycles. In other cities, there's been a massive problem with this. Lime, Bird, other ones will lobby you guys, and there's other scooter people too that will lobby you, and already have and have lobbied every major city in Canada. I have friends in Portland who are in the same situation as I am who have to deal with street litter. That's what we call it. The scooters is dropped wherever they, wherever people are lazy enough to drop them, or bushes, or around sidewalks, or around buses, bus stops, bus stations, especially Portland and cities like that. I am completely against e-scooters being allowed on bike trails, 
and on the sidewalk. And here's my reasoning. They kick scooters, bike trails, fine. But as someone with multiple disabilities who has been hit, people aren't wearing helmets, they aren't signaling, they aren't calling out. Most of them have headphones on when they ride them. It is very dangerous, especially for people who are legally blind and their guide dogs. I've seen guide dogs get hit. I've seen blind people get hit. My husband, who is legally blind and uses a white cane, has been hit by these e-scooters. Now, right now, people are buying them off Amazon and different places, Canadian Tire, Walmart, wherever. But when the companies come in, they must be responsible for the usage of their vehicles. They must be held responsible for the attitude and the usage by their clients. Because that's what people are going to be. They're going to be their clients. They're going to have an app. They're going to be a member. A lot of these e-scooters are used by people who are drunk. Seen it happen. My friends in Portland have even taken video of it. And I'm sorry, but they're a menace to people with disabilities. They're a menace to anyone on sidewalks. And I agree with Lock Toronto completely. I agree with the CNIB, uh, the the AEBC, and many others. Please, City of Toronto, let's not make the mistake of putting people with disabilities' lives in even more jeopardy. I just want to thank you for opening walk the uh, open streets on the weekends. I'm going to be on May 1st, and I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I just reiterate, we need this to be dealt with. We need safety. Where are we safe? We're sidewalk users. My wheel, most wheelchairs go less than eight kilometers an hour. Great, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, thank you for your patience. I know there was some connectivity issues there. That brings us to our next speaker, Ryan thank Frazier. You. Bye -bye. Ryan Frazier. Okay, Ryan is not present. We'll move to Louise Bark. Go on here. Okay, you I, got me here? Okay. I Sounds can like hear you, coffee. Louise. You have okay. three minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay, first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Louise Bark. I'm a power, power wheelchair user. I live in the Liberty Village area. Of course, with the pandemic, I don't get out to as many places. But one place I find a big problem with these scooters, even though they're not legal in Toronto yet, is on the underpass that's on King Street heading down uh, just around Atlantic Avenue where it meets down on King. Uh, that underpass is a sidewalk. It's fairly wide, but there's a lot of pedestrians on it. And I was very surprised when I looked up the high, uh, section of the Highway Traffic Act and the recommendations of the province that when a bike or sorry, a scooter is, is going on through an underpass, they are to go on the sidewalk. They can't stay in the bike lanes. So you're actually forcing them onto the sidewalk into a sidewalk that's narrow. There's no way to step to the side that there, if you're familiar with the area, there's a fenced area because it's a drop down to the road. It's just literally not safe. Uh, I have a service dog. I've been going through that underpass on numerous occasions where a scooters come up behind me and even my dog wasn't aware until it was at the last second and it's caused the dog to startle and almost jump into the path of the scooter. Fortunately, I've been able to hold her back, but it is very scary. Uh, I think my biggest concern is that if there is a problem, what do we do next? Uh, as in, how do we report it? Uh, they're not all identifiable. Some of these are, uh, um, businesses might have an identifying mark on it, but what happens if someone's visually impaired and can't see the identifying mark on the scooter? How do you report it? What do you do about insurance if there is an injury? If there is someone acting inappropriate on it, how do you report it? And how do you, um, you know, get some sort of resolution as a result of it? There's a number of safety issues I've, I'm very concerned of. I can understand the appeal to these things, but I also think to myself, we have electric, uh, we're now talking about uh, renting out the electric bicycles uh, throughout the already bike share program that exists. And a bicycle is not restricted from having a basket or carrying some sort of cargo. Like if you're like a delivery person, you could probably carry a big bag on your back without a restriction. Uh, that restriction does exist for an e-scooter. So I see these more as a recreational toy. I think the part I'm noticing the most is people being on the sidewalk for where 
wherever it's convenient on the uh, road when it's convenient and it's going back and forth and very little regard. Some of the other points have been named from other people about the concern with headphones, people paying attention. I haven't seen enough scattered about to, you know, say they're a road hazard, but I certainly see the potential for that. And I do hear the electro, uh, the companies that are wanting to get underway talking about some of their uh, safety concerns, but I still don't see the answer that I need to hear the most. And that is what is going to prevent the scooter from hitting a person or if they're behaving badly, how is a person going to properly get it dealt with? How are they going to report it to the authorities? What kind of penalty will exist? Apparently, if they're stopped according to regulation uh, 389-19, it recommends that the person would require to show the driver's license to a police officer. Well, many people in Toronto don't have a driver's license. So where is there an ability to enforce or ensure that there isn't a repeat offender? The biggest concern, again, is the safety. And as I said, I've been issues where you have policies and laws that actually force the scooters onto sidewalks in, say, underpasses and so on. Those are big concerns, and the lack of insurance is a big concern. In the provincial recommendations, it, in the uh, highlight for Ontario e scooter pilot program, they actually say that insurance should be a strong consideration. And unless I've missed it, I don't see that as being a requirement at this point. Without insurance, without enforcement, I don't see how this can be a safe endeavor. That's Thank my you. Opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you for your deputation, Louise. Are there any questions? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll move to our next speaker, Adina Lebo with the Toronto Seniors Forum. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. You have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Adina Lebeau and I'm deputing on behalf of the Toronto Seniors Forum, which is the voice of seniors at City Hall. We're part of the new long-term care and senior services division and our members provide input to the City of Toronto staff and members of council on issues that affect older Torontonians. The current senior population in Toronto 50 plus is estimated to be around 690,000 persons and is expected to double to 1.2 million over the next 10 to 15 years as the baby boomer generation passes into old age. Toronto is also part of the age-friendly city network of the World Health Organization and our goal is to keep seniors active, healthy, engaged and independent as long as possible. What this means over the next 10 to 15 years, more and more seniors will be out on the streets with their canes, their walkers, their disability scooters, their power wheelchairs in what we call active living. While we acknowledge that e-scooters are electric and will replace gas guzzling cars, and our great environmentally friendly green additions to Toronto, we are greatly concerned about the lack of infrastructure to house these new modes of transportation and the safety concerns of all those who will be riding the scooters as well as safety of the current pedestrians, seniors, disability world, current bike riders now using the streets and sidewalks. The infrastructure, TSF is adamant that these e-scooters not be allowed on already overcrowded sidewalks. Our sidewalks are currently not wide enough to hold all the current pedestrian traffic on them, which includes those in disability scooters and wheelchairs using crutches, walking with canes and walkers, even pushing baby carriages, wagons, strollers, kids on bike, kids on their skateboard, kids on electric wheelies weaving in and out on the sidewalk. Please understand that there are a large number of people with mobility and sight and hearing issues outside on these sidewalks now, and their number will double over the next 10 to 15 years. And while we've rolled out more bike lanes during the pandemic, generally speaking, bike lanes aren't everywhere. And in most places do not even have separate corridors that separate them from cars, buses, motorcycles, and other motorized vehicles. The number of deaths of bikers riding the streets in Toronto are rising, and now we're going to put young people on electric scooters on a road shared with cars as well. In a battle between a pedestrian, a bike rider, a scooter rider, and a car, the car will always win. A run-in with a car, even at low speeds, causes serious injuries and death. Taking a lane of roadway where necessary 
needs to be considered and taken out of the car inventory and used to create separate road space for all the new electric bikes and scooters and ski boards and standing wheelies and all those new electric vehicles that will be created over the next 10 to 15 years. At this point, we agree with the staff report and in the spirit of vision zero, we say no to e-scooters on the sidewalks for pedestrian safety. And we also say no to e-scooters at this point in time without the proper infrastructure in place to support their safety Thank and those you. of their riders on the road. Great. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions for Adina? Okay. Thank you for joining us. That brings us to Igor Samardzik. Igor, are you on the line? Calling again, Igor. Okay, we'll move forward with Marion Croft. Marion, you're live. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marion Croft, and I am a member of the March of Dimes Canada post polio chapter. I wish to comment on the e scooter pilot project. It is my opinion as a person with a disability that including e scooters on the sidewalks of the city of Toronto would threaten my safety and the, that of countless others. These e scooters can attain speeds of 20 miles per hour. No matter how highly technical these machines are, they present an accident waiting to happen. For example, any person exiting a store is in jeopardy because they could be hit and injured or killed by an e-scooter going too fast, crashing into the doorway. Also, if an accelerated e-scooter goes around a corner at breakneck speed, it would definitely injure anyone it comes in contact with. I urge the Infrastructure and Environment Committee members to say no to e-scooter pilot project for the safety of everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your very concise deputation. Much appreciated. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you again for joining us. I will move to Marvin Sokoloff. Okay, uh, we don't believe Marvin is present. We'll move to e Ira Schweitzer. Okay, we don't believe Ira is present. We will move to Austin Spademan. Hello. Hi, Austin. You have three minutes. Thank you for joining us. All right. So let's start with a bit about me. I'm an associate general manager with Bird Canada, actively managing the Ottawa area. I also uh, did the pilot last year that's been talked about. Um, I'm also a fourth year board member on the ABC Residents Association, representing Yorkville generally. I'm a first year board member on the Midtown Ravine Group. I'm passionate about urban transportation and its role in reducing climate impacts, and I'm an avid biker. What I'm trying to say is you're going to be hard pressed to find a more engaged Torontonian who loves the city than me. I also boast direct experience managing e-scooters in Canada, so I'm a good resource to talk to. Secondly, uh, I've managed a successful 2020 pilot in Ottawa that was called the golden, uh, the golden standard for municipalities by the chair of the Transportation Committee. And I joined the industry purely for a mission driven purpose. I want to save the earth. I think that you've heard 70% of Torontonians want electric scooters. Don't, don't just believe that's that. Go walk the street and talk to 20 people. You will see that most people are open to electric scooters. I also think that e-scooters have a strong strategic alignment with active TO and that they're an excellent way to reduce congestion in an environmentally friendly way. I think that before making a decision today, you are not doing your due diligence without hearing directly from city staff in other cities in Canada 
Moreover, I think you need to hear from city staff in other North American cities on how they address accessibility. I agree, accessibility is extremely important. And to, to actually make a decision on this, you need to hear what other cities in North America are doing around accessibility. So I recommend that you defer a decision on this item until you've heard from cities that have had successful e-scooter programs. You use the opportunity to consult these st city staff members on their approach and data around safety and that you make a decision after this consultation. I don't think you're in a position to represent 70% of Torontonians today without doing this due diligence and hearing it directly from the horse's mouth, as it were. So uh, there's been a lot talked about Ottawa. Uh, what I wanna highlight from the Ottawa pilot report on 2020 uh, is the first sentence of the report, which is in the 2020 pilot, e-scooters provided residents with a convenient, physically distanced mobility option that some residents used to replace short car trips. They also encouraged residents to support local businesses and were observed to have a very low rate of reported injuries. So what three things should you take away from that sentence? One, they effectively replaced car trips. 46% of riders surveyed said they drove less as an individual driver, that's huge. Moreover, it enabled COVID-19 small business recovery, something we should all care about. And lastly, they were, there was safe ridership with a low injury rate. In fact, there was, um, from the report, there were seven minor injuries caused by e-scooter falls or collisions. This represents an injury rate of 0.003%. That is fantastic. That is better than biking. So. You know, if we're talking about safety, you should be looking at the baseline from Canadian municipalities before you make this decision. And you should hear from, you know, for example, the chair of the Transportation Committee, Tim Tierney, and Ottawa City staff before making a decision. That's my deputation. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your deputation. Um, Councillor Ainsley has a question. We'll move to him. Three minutes. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, Austin, could you comment um, one of the big concerns that's in the report or two of them is around insurance and indemnification. And it, it mentions some of the other jurisdictions where uh, they've had um, legal battles with scooter companies over dealing with insurance and indemnification and how you're dealing with that in Ottawa. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I think from the city of Ottawa's perspective, uh, I'm not going to be able to adequately represent them. You should hear directly from city staff, but uh, speaking broadly, I think they've been uh, satisfied with our robust uh, insurance coverage. In fact, they made the decision in 2021 to double the size of the e-scooter fleet and extend the length of their program. Do you think they would have done that if they had insurance concerns that were not attainable with the current insurance products available for the industry? I think not, personally. And what's the size of the, um, not just your companies, but do you have an idea of ballpark what the size of the scooter fleet is in Ottawa currently? So it was about 600 last year, and this year it's going to be 1,000 to 1,300, I believe, is the full uh, size of their program. Okay. And one of the, one of the safety concerns de dealing with helmets, and, you know, there, there seems some of the reading I've done, you know, tourists, you don't expect them to be carrying around helmets because um, they're tourists, so they're not traveling with a scooter helmet. Um, and then people living locally that are riding on scooters that they say should be wearing helmets. How do you deal with that? Um, so it's actually very cool. So uh, we have a lot of language. Uh, first of all, we state on our terms and conditions, so you're required to wear a helmet. Moreover, we actually provide a free helmet to anybody looking for it through our app. Any rider is entitled to a free helmet through us. We do helmet giveaways. And then uh, this year, we're looking to implement new features that include a helmet selfie at the end of the ride so a rider can prove that they were wearing appropriate headwear to protect themselves. So there and, are and logical solutions in that space as well. Yeah, and, and how does the helmet, so what do you do, Austin? I, I know that, you know, people are, you know, do you have designated parking areas in uh, in Ottawa? Like you leave the scooter somewhere with a helmet. How do you keep somebody from stealing it other than putting them back in designated areas? So to that point, we, we actually recommend that the person keeps the helmet on their person. They aren't shared helmets. That's why we will basically mail you a helmet if you request a helmet through us. So you have your individual helmet and you don't need to leave it on the scooter at risk of uh, it being stolen. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my questions. Uh, thank you for uh, your deputation. Any additional questions?
Okay, seeing none, we'll move to Kareen Schmid. Oh, sorry, my apologies, Corrine. Um I do need to go back to Igor because we did get him connected now and he was previously on the list. So we'll pop up to Igor Samardzik. Igor, you can have you three minutes. Me? Perfect. Thank you, Chairman Pelvey. Uh, good morning, councillors, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Igor, and I'm currently the chair of the Advisory Committee on Accessible Transit that provides advice to the TTC. Uh, this committee passed a motion, uh, the ACAT uh, passed a motion in November 2020 that recommended the TTC board ban the operation of e scooters and e bikes on TTC property due to safety issues for customers with disabilities, seniors, and pedestrians near and on TTC property. Although our motion extends to TTC property only, the main points of the motion and other safety concerns are relevant to this conversation as they can be brought in to include the wider public realm. As we begin to see, as we begin to use more and more of our streets for active transportation, including city programs such as Cafe TO and Curb TO, we are already placing significant pressure on limited space within the public realm. The addition of e-scooters would present another obstacle to people with disabilities. People with disabilities already have limited options when navigating the public realm, and with the addition of e-scooters, this will further impede the options available to individuals if e-scooters are left on sidewalks. There is simply not enough space or a robust enough process at this moment to implement this at this time. Although I appreciate the workarounds and solutions that the e-scooter industry has tried to implement, including taking photos of parked e-scooters, cell phone prompts, and various technological features to try to limit some of the challenges presented by the disability community, they nonetheless are not able to guarantee and enforce these measures in a consistent way that achieves a high enough standard of success. I've traveled to other cities around the world and seen firsthand e-scooters left on sidewalks, blown over by high winds, and knocked over by people passing by. People with disabilities who may come upon these barriers along their paths of travel do not have the same ability as others to simply shuffle around or step into the street to overtake these barriers. Their only option in most circumstances is to turn around. This is not good enough. This is not a good enough solution for people with disabilities. This community is already heavily marginalized against in many aspects when it comes to the way our cities are built and allowing e-scooters in the current form would only further the same. It is unacceptable to download another responsibility of navigating the public realm with these new devices onto the shoulders of people with disabilities. This affects a specific group of people more significantly than others within the city and council should prioritize their voices in this matter as they have the most to lose and will be affected the most. We join the chorus of others who have already spoken um, and support the staff report against e-scooters. Thank you for your time. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation and your patience connecting. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, thank you again. Seeing none, uh, that brings us to our next speaker, Corrine Schmidt. And my apologies, Corrine. I called you and then I talked you down again. <laughs> there you go. Now you're yes, up. You okay, three minutes. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, you, you, you deep me out there. So I've been sweating it for the last two and a half minutes. So thank you for having me and allowing me to speak. Um, I do believe I am the first that is, um, well, I am a private citizen who is asking for e-scooters. In fact, I represent a cohort of my, of my friends and my peers who all have e-scooters and who use them for various reasons, whether that's from going to one, one home to another, to meet to in the very limited opportunities on a patio when it was okay to do so. But more so, I look at this as something that I own a car, I have a motorcycle, and I recently traded in my 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 mountain bike for an e-scooter for the greater mobility it gives me, and quite frankly, the safer ride it provides to me on the street. As a motorcycle rider, I took safety training, I pay for insurance, and I ride in full gear. In the case of my e-scooter, I would ride on the street. I would honor the same rules that are respected in terms of having a motorcycle. Pedestrians have the right of way. There would be nothing more terrifying. I'm not looking to hit people on the road. I am very, very aware and astute and looking out for people who might be in alternate mobility vehicles. Of course, I'm going to be a responsible rider. I'm only going to ride in full gear, including gloves and proper footwear. I'm not someone wearing a tank top and flip flops uh, cruising around on the sidewalk. That's crazy and irresponsible. And I fully agree with the comment made before that you can't legislate common sense. But I do think we're going to have a small, very small sampling of people who are simply going to avoid and not follow the rules or legislation. And that's going to happen whether you're on a bicycle or in a car or on a motorcycle. I fully support the Ontario e-scooter pilot program, as do my friends. 
um, with the existing rules and operator and safety requirements with the following um, adjustments made. I believe bicycle helmets should be for all riders, period, full stop, not just those over 18. I think that that's a great way of preventing further injury and the and the extent of the injury if people were wearing proper protective equipment. Likewise, I think it doesn't go far enough in saying that anyone who is on a road should not have earbuds in or be distracted by a phone. I personally have been hit um, on my motorcycle by someone who was talking on their phone um, as I was going through an intersection on my motorcycle. The bike hit me and this person was talking on his phone and the person just biked away. Um, that's unacceptable. I have also been to cities where these scooters are have worked well, like Lima, Peru, like in San Diego. I believe that there's an opportunity for us to drive less. I also have a foot injury where walking is simply not an opportunity for me right now. And likewise, with my friend with knee replacement surgery, the e-scooters provide a very nimble and mobile way to get around without requiring parking or aggravating the injury. I encourage us to please uh, legalize the private use of e-scooters and represent that the fact that there is a large cohort of responsible sc scooter riders who would respect the rules and ride responsibly on the roads. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of Corrine? Okay, thank you so much, Corrine, for joining us. Uh, that brings us to our next speaker, Adam Roy Cahoon. Hi, Hi Adam. Hey, hey um, one concern I have, I will do my best to stay to three minutes, but because of accessibility issues, a lot of us plan the five minute speech so to take us back to three minutes um, is can give accessibility problem. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to say to you is people with disabilities have now been isolated for over a year now because of COVID-19. The last thing we really need is to come out and have a new menace on the street. And and ironically, we finally heard from one individual with maybe friends. So let's say we've heard from maybe ten people that actually want e-scooters totally legalized. It'll be interesting to see what kind of perks she's getting from a lobbyist, but that's beside the point. But. As disabled individuals, we're scared. Our guide dogs have not been trained on how to look after these scooters. These scooters are using technology that has them have motors that are almost three times as fast as my wheelchair. And you've all been in situations where you've seen a fast wheelchair going down the then you probably yell, you're going too fast, watch your speed, or giving them, giving them a dirty look. These scooters are going to go three times as fast, and they won't just injure somebody, they will kill somebody. And they're, they're, they weren't even asked for by a society. They were just dreamed up by a few inventors that probably, you know, just one of them be tech disruptors and they're going to be very disruptive to the disability community. And now they have not talked with us and they're not really going to want to talk with us. They're going to try and use the glee of everybody going out and wanting to do wild stuff once the pandemic is over. And, and, and this is not the time to even think of putting these scooters in. Crush this, if, if they really want to come again and get organized and come after the next council in two years, sure. But I really do not believe that any scooters are mm, needed by anybody and it will be the worst decision the city could make when it comes to accessibility thank you 
Thank you, Adam, and thank you for joining us. I miss seeing you at TTC meetings. Um, any questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, seeing none, thank you again for joining us here today. That brings us to Myra Rodriguez. Hi there. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Myra. You have three minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and Committee. I, I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I am very concerned about opening Toronto streets to e-scooters, and I'm really concerned for families, young children, seniors, and people with disabilities like myself. Um, <clears throat> I'm 78, and I have <clears throat> some mobility issues. My balance is poor because I've had four spinal, spinal surgeries and spinal fusion. And if I get hit by one of these things and fall to the ground, it's it's a death sentence for me. So that's why I'm here, not just for me, but for all the others and yourselves, because we're all going to be getting older and be facing this hazard. <clears throat> uh, having objects that are silent because these things cannot be hear heard, and those of us who are blind rely on hearing what's in our environment. These are fast driven by people who are very young, sometimes as young as 16, I understand, unlicensed. Um, it just will make Toronto Street so very, very uh, difficult for those of us who love and prize and treasure our independence and love our city and love to get around in it. Um, <clears throat> I know that there is an argument uh, and the Toronto Star article yesterday that was printed yesterday has been referenced once or twice, uh, to the which sort of says, you know, e-scooters are here, they're on the street, get used to it, accept it, and move ahead with the with the with the day. That's a ridiculous argument. Guns are also on our streets. They present horrible hazards every day in Toronto. Somebody is shot. People are killed. And that is no excuse for us to say, it's here, just get on with it and, and forget about the problem. In a recent article I read, countries as far apart as Singapore and France are working on <clears throat> uh, removing approval for e-scooters from the roads. I would really urge Toronto to not get into that situation, save the grief, prevent these things from being on the roads and on our streets. By the way, today is International Guide Dog Day. It's a day to celebrate freedom and, and independent movement. Um, let's hope we can all carry on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions for Myra? Okay, seeing none, thank you again for joining us. That brings us to Jennifer Griffiths. Can, you, can everybody hear me? We can hear you, Jennifer. You have three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Boy, I, I couldn't have said it better than the previous speakers. So I'll just get right to the point. I called the murder machines on the February the 25th. I will still call the murder machines as long as they're brought back or brought into this city, which as John Ray so eloquently stated, is getting increasingly inaccessible. I would much prefer our municipal government to spend vast sums of money on wheel trans and public transit. And I just want to say, here's what my life could look like, and presumably that of other disabled pedestrians, if you bring these menaces to this increasingly inaccessible city. I can tell you right now, I will be too afraid to leave my home for reasons that are so eloquently stated. I won't be able to hear this menace coming up behind me. I can't see. And I have a guide dog. And he's lovely, but there's a limit to how safe he can keep me if we have the onslaught of these machines. And secondly, if I fail to go out for even a walk, uh, business-related individual or things, uh, the less I use my guide dog, he'll turn into a very expensive, well-behaved pet and harness. Secondly, if he were hit, by one of these machines. It would be very soul destroying to witness this. I couldn't live with myself. The guilt would be too much. Or if 
I went out, I would have to wonder, will this be the last time for me and my guide dog? Will somebody be attending my funeral, be it virtual or face-to-face? Will I be injured? Will I have one or more injuries? And no doubt, I would get the PTSD to go along with it. And what bothers me is our freedoms would be so curtailed, the City of Toronto would still expect me and any other property owner to pay the same amount of property taxes as before, meanwhile jeopardizing our freedoms. And it's not fair. You can't have it both ways. Um, And it is International Guide Dog Day. We all have a right to be safe. And I'm frankly sick and tired of the spin that the e-scooter executives are putting on this. They know the truth. Let's face it. I really have nothing more to say. I'll take questions that I have to look after my guide dog. Uh, Thank you so much, Jennifer, for joining us. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll move to our next deputant, Louise Russo. Louise, okay, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Louise, are you in the line? Hi, Louise. Okay, uh, Louise, we're going to have you call back in and reconnect. We can't seem to get your audio turned on. Uh, While we're doing that, I will jump to Richard Pass. Richard's not here. We'll go to Ryan Casanegra. Hi. Hi, Ryan. Thank you for joining us. We can hear you. You have three minutes. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for your time. So I am a uh, 49-year-old working in North York. I commute every day to Etobicoke for work during COVID by using my electric kick scooter. I am opposed to any ban on personally used and operated kick scooters because I believe that they provide an alternate mode of transportation to those with disabilities that you can't see. Um, I've heard a lot from disability uh, accessibility advocates over the last couple of hours, and not once has it been addressed that people with disabilities that you can't see also use these things as mobility devices. I will be more than happy to take a training program or a seminar for a half a day at a community centre or something of the sort in order to gain some sort of permit in order to be able to get insurance so I can feel safer on the road myself. I wear full pad and full face helmet, gloves, and I respect all rules of the road and bicycle uh, use. Um, I think that a lot of the arguments being made, I I don't think they're invalid arguments. However, I think that there are a lot of fear mongering going on amongst these disability groups. Um, I just, uh, Personally, I I would love to have some insurance, and I don't want to have my mode of transportation to keep me safe from COVID and my partner, who has COPD, safe from COVID. I do not want to go on the public transit, and uh, this is a great way for all people with disabilities to get around. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions for Ryan? Okay, seeing none, uh, I've been told that Louise Russo is now connected. Louise? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for joining us. You have three minutes. Fantastic. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee and staff. My name is Louise Russo, and I'm a longtime resident of Toronto. 2004, I was a victim of violent crime, which left me with a high level paralysis. I've had to learn to adapt to doing everything, nor- everyday normal activities differently and I use the wheelchair for the rest of my life. On an ongoing struggle, I have to deal with daily basis, trying to figure out if places I was going to were being accessible, if I can find a disabled parking spot, are these curb cuts close by the entrance, where's the closest gas station I can fuel my van. These are just a few of the things I didn't even have to consider before my injury, but now it's something I have to constantly think about before venturing out. When the issues of these scooters were brought to my attention, I immediately envisioned added stress that would bring to my life and the lives of anyone with a disability 
and also the impact it would have on our seniors. The more research I did, the more I talked to individuals that had experience with e-scooters, made me realize I had to speak up about this very important issue. Sure, the corporate lobbyists make it look easy and fun and easy to get around with, but it's not the safe way. As you heard from other speakers, e-scooters endanger public safety and are a hazard to both riders and innocent pedestrians that are seriously injured and sometimes killed. Scooters that are discarded lying around sidewalks, hindering pathways, creating accessibility barriers to anyone using a wheelchair, walker or scooter are a danger to our seniors and a trip hazard for people with vision loss. Instead of Toronto becoming more accessible, it will just make it more difficult to get around. They're driven by uninsured, unentrained individuals who are not wearing a helmet. To the research, I came across many publications. One was stood out was in Time magazine on February the 5th, 2019. And here's a short piece of that content of that magazine. 228 scooter riders and 21 pedestrians were treated at two emergency departments over a year's time. Head injuries and fractures were the most common diagnosis. Among the scooter riders, 80% were injured in a fall, 11 collided with an object, and 9% were hit by a moving vehicle or um, another object. Almost 5% of the patients intoxicated was a factor, and just 4% of the riders wore a helmet. Approximately one to two major traumatic brain injuries a month are admitted to the trauma center. The reason is simple. Who's carrying a helmet? No one. No one's wearing them because no one's carrying them. This is through the UCLA researcher, researchers. Um, do we, what I'm trying to say is, do we really need to add to the cost of burden of our health care system when we're already in a crisis situation? And as you know, city staff reported recommended that the e-scooters would not be it should not be allowed it's based on the fact that e-scooters pose a safety and danger to the public and they would also create new accessibility barriers the toronto accessibility advisory committee has twice passed the recommendation toronto city council e-scooters not be allowed there's a reason why we have the accessibility advisory board and the report from city staff to be asked for their input. It is our hope that our city officials take the recommendations that of our and our presentation seriously and do what is best to keep all Torontonians safe. Thank you for listening, protecting those who need safe, accessible streets and sidewalks and not the interest of corporate lobbyists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Uh, questions of the deputy and Councillor Pasternak, three minutes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, Louise, for coming uh, today. Appreciate your comments. So the scooter companies um, say they can they can self manage and they can keep it safe. Um, from the research you've done, uh, I guess you've looked at the experience in other cities. What what can Toronto expect on on this level of self governance? Well, I would think that Toronto would, um, you know, be in a very difficult situation where the injuries, I mean, are, as you can hear from the media every day, is that there is, um, you know, we, we are canceling surgeries where imagine someone going to emerge and, you know, not being having to dealt with because we already dealing with the crisis situation as it is. We don't need to put more and more emphasis, you know, uh, stress and pressure on our healthcare system, and this will just be a safety issue for many. Do you think that um, cities are defined by how they treat their um, disabled? I think cities are defined how they treat their most vulnerable. That would include also seniors. Um, you know, I just had a a seniors group uh, talked to me yesterday about this uh, particular issue about the banning of these scooters. They don't want them. They said, you know, we're just minding our own business, walking, have a leisurely walk, and all of a sudden, two kids on e-scooters are just whipping by us. We didn't hear them. And if I had just turned around at that moment, it would have scared the daylights out of me and I would have been injured. You know, uh, people don't need that type of stress in our lives. So we, uh, Toronto is a beautiful, beautiful city and let's keep it safe and let's protect it um, the best we can. And thank you, okay. uh, Councillor Pasternak for your support. I, I wanna mention that it's been, you know, really, we all really appreciate it. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. And I certainly appreciate our conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Councillor Pasternak, uh, and thank you, Louise. Um, I will be going back up to our deputy, that was missed earlier, Thea Curdy. I hear you're now on the line, Thea. Hi, good morning. Yes, this is Thea Curdy. Thank you for joining um, us. You have three minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much. I, I don't intend to take all of them. Um, I would like to support the AODA Alliance's submission about the problems with uh, including e-scooters on our streets and sidewalks. Um, I have been an accessibility specialist for the built environment for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, we've been working with all levels of government all across the country and internationally. And uh, what we have seen over and over again is the difficulty in even implementing the AODA design of public spaces for our sidewalks to make them accessible for people with disabilities. Adding on top of that, the encroachment on just the storage of the e-scooters, um, let alone all of the other fabulous points people have been making about the problems of people using these e-scooters, I can see only adding to the difficulties. I also worry that it really goes against the principles of the AODA, which is to create an accessible Ontario by 2025. And if we're not able to do it without e-scooters, we're certainly going to be having an even harder time with the addition of e-scooters. Um, as we have seen reported, uh, the number of instances of um, accidents in all other cities that have tried to implement this, all other test projects that have tried to implement this have skyrocketed. The fact that people with a variety of different disabilities and, and older persons that have reported feeling unsafe on our sidewalks, which shouldn't be happening as a result of them. Uh, and that includes not just people with mobility disabilities or people who are using canes or unsteady on their feet, but people with sensory disabilities and people who are deaf who can't um, hear the e-scooters uh, coming easily. Um, as mentioned before, uh, the uh, scooter companies uh, will say that there's a way for them to monitor this. Well, that wasn't the case um, as they tried to test this uh, last year in 2020 in the city of Montreal, where the city of Montreal found that there were so many people breaking the rules, the e-scooter companies were not able to uh, enforce or monitor what was happening. There was so much breaking of the rules that there was no way the city of um, uh, Montreal was able to keep up with it. There was no way they could police it properly and they stopped the program as a result. So the addition of uh, accidents, the addition of uh, liability concerns, there's just so many reasons why this doesn't work at a city level, but also why it doesn't work for the equality that our Charter of Rights and our Human Rights Code are trying to enshrine. Thank you very much. Thank you for your deputation and for joining us today. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, that brings us to Luca Cheramelli, um, Asorato yes. alla Mobilita Roma Capital. I don't know if I got that right. Please correct me. Uh, okay, okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You have three minutes. Okay, good morning. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Luca Cerimelle and I'm working on behalf of the Mobility Council of Rome, Italy, on our e-scooters pilot program. So, first of all, sorry for my English. I try to be as much clear as possible. Our program started during the last summer, May 2020, with four sharing operators and a starting fleet of 4,000 e-scooters. Actually, after almost one year of activity, we have seven operators with an overall fleet of uh, 14,000 e-scooters. In light of our experience, we strongly believe that micromobility is a real opportunity for a more sustainable mobility, but it's required to work on two main levels. Parking and management and, uh, in general, use of public space, safety and safety clearing. On the first point, we face issue, issue with bad parking habits of e-scooter users. In particular, e-scooters were being parked on sidewalk, which posed a threat to pedestrian users. This issue has many different routes. Besides the user habits, there is a structural lack of space dedicated to micromobility in our city. It is evident that our city is designed for cars and not for bikes or e-scooters. We need to work on it. Moreover, some operators decided to focus their fleets in the city center in order to maximize their profits. Um, that choice brought relevant cluttering in our streets. 
For these reasons, we decided to adopt a stricter regulation about parking. We asked each operator to limit their fleet deployment to a maximum of five e-scooters in every 70, uh, 70 meters, and we defined interdicted areas for parking in the city center in order to avoid cluttering. Our suggestion here is to use geolocalization to define no parking zone and to provide dedicated parking zone in the most critical part of your city. Safety needs a different approach to understand the real problem. At the moment, I have to say we don't have evidence of a major impact of e scooters on accident rates. But first of all, I need to point out the lack of consistent figures on injuries rates per trip acquired in a relevant time frame. We are talking about a new kind of vehicle only recently allowed to circulate on our streets. Acquiring greater data on incident is the key to improve the safety performance of these vehicles. It could also facilitate a proper assessment of measures that are frequently prospected, but rarely measured such, for example, as the introduction of the obligation of an helmet or a speed limitation. To summarize, our suggestions here are to require from the operator reports on incidents and to require high standard of vehicles designed on brake system and wheel size. In conclusion, micromobility could be a powerful tool to change mobility in a more sustainable way. Don't underestimate it. But it requires a different use of space in cities, providing dedicated parking areas and infrastructure and the education of citizens. Thank you for the opportunity. I will follow the discussion. Thank you for joining us at what is probably a much later time of day. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, thank you so very much for taking the time to, to uh, join us today. Um, I think the one silver lining of this pandemic is that we've had our meetings move into a virtual format. So um, thank you. Uh, that brings us to our next deputant, Chris Cherry, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Hi there. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank um, you. And uh, again, I appreciate the, the remote uh, nature of this. Um, my name is Chris Cherry. I'm a professor in civil engineering at uh, University of Tennessee, and I'm a professional engineer, and I'm also the director of the Light Electric Vehicle Education and Research Institute and also chair uh, committees focused on micromobility safety at the Society of Automotive Engineers and also the Transportation Research Board. So I've been doing what we now refer to as micromobility uh, vehicle research for about 15 years, and uh, that starts with e-bikes and now scooters uh, focused on safety and sustainability. And I think that uh, the, the discussion here, I agree with almost everything everybody said. It's almost hard to disagree with uh, most of the comments. Um, and I, I thank Ms. Russo for raising some important questions. I think if her and I had some coffee, we could talk for a long time about this. But the idea that uh, micromobility safety is a, a greater problem than any other sorts of safety or, or even not part of the solution is kind of a challenge because this is a new mode of transportation. And the studies that Ms. Russo and others have focused on have focused on this increase in hospitalizations of e-scooter riders. Uh, not even hospitalizations, emergency department visits mostly. And so most of these crashes are epidemiology crashes, uh, studies rather, and, uh, and they focus on falls, scratches, broken bones, yes, uh, but not really focused on the severe injuries that we really care about in a vision zero framework. Um, only uh, less than 10% of the injuries in that study were serious injuries. Um, far fewer than 10% involved pedestrians, uh, either falling or being hit. And even the pedestrian injuries were minor injuries in that case. So the, the challenge is how do we focus on this from a, a serious injury perspective? And uh, how do we focus on this in a broader safe systems uh, framework? And that's the work we do. Um, the, the major injuries involve cars, and that's uh, where we focused on. We just published a safety study in Nashville on scooters and bikes uh, with car crashes about a week ago. You can find that if you Google it, I guess. Um, but it digs into what the differences and, and similarities are between scooter riders and car and bike riders when they are hit by cars. 
And scooter riders tend to get hit when they're coming off of sidewalks. So we know that sidewalk riding is a problem. And uh, what we find, though, is that the city of Nashville is using this pilot to respond to that by focusing on on street scooter parking to keep the scooters off of sidewalks. Uh, and and that's one of the real things that we uh, can find from that uh, a pilot like this is we can actually inform. That's the point of the pilot, right? It also our study debunked a bunch of stereotypes that uh, scooter riders are drunk tourists at, at night. That they're what, what we found is that they're almost all utilitarian trips. Crashes occur in the daytime. Crash victims are local, and almost none of them were intoxicated. So uh, I urge you all to look at the safe systems uh, approach at micromobility. Uh, I pose the question, do we want fewer overall injuries or do we want fewer scooter injuries? And when we're talking about the pedestrian realm, I agree with pedestrian and disability advocates. The pedestrian realm is key and cities that proactively uh, build bike infrastructure that's safe, uh, they do that to support the sanctity of the sidewalk. Not so much for scooter riders or bicyclists, but for the pedestrians. So there's ways to do this right, um, and focusing on the you know the uh, focusing on the very narrow question of scooters is really not going to solve the big Vision Zero and greenhouse gas challenges that Toronto and other global cities are facing. And uh, and so I urge Toronto to look at these out of the you might say out of the box, but maybe mainstream approaches uh, to, to solve the, the big big picture problems in policy. Okay, thank you very much for your deputation. Any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, that will take us to our next deputation by Jen Freeman. Hi there. Hi, thank you, Jen. Hi you there. have three minutes. Thank you. So, good morning. Uh, my name is Jen Freeman. I'm Lyme's general manager for Canada. Um, I'm a Toronto resident. I was born here. I've lived here almost my entire life. Um, I'm also a mother of two young children, and I live in Councillor Layton's neighbourhood of Christie Pitts. I took on this role with Lyme because I wanted to bring innovative solutions to cities where the current solutions aren't working. Um, I wanted to make a safer and a more sustainable city and world for my kids and a more accessible and mobile city for all of us who live here. But I'm worried that right now, Toronto doesn't want the same thing. Um, we're faced with a moment where the city is spending over $100 million, including my tax dollars, to reduce car congestion, but are choosing not to provide new options that are safer than cars, that are more sustainable, and that cost zero tax dollars. This is what doesn't make sense to me. Um, as a mother, I'm not worried about my two young children um, being hit by someone on uh, by a scooter in Toronto. Um, there's already thousands of scooters on the street. Just this morning, I saw two pass me as I was walking along Bloor Street with my kids in the bike lanes. Um, what does scare me, though, is a frustrated driver ripping down one of the side streets by my house and hitting one of us as we cross the street. You know, this concern or this nightmare really wouldn't exist if everyone in our city felt safe walking, biking, or taking scooters um, or transit. And those are the solutions that we need to make safe and accessible to everybody. In addition to my children in this city, I also worry about my parents. Um, obviously, there's, there's seniors living here. Um, I'm not concerned about them tripping over scooters on sidewalks. I think as others in the industry have mentioned, we have sort of solutions and ways that we can work with cities to prevent and manage those risks. But similar to my kids, I do worry about their safety as a pedestrian due to the risks posed by cars. And I think this is a reasonable concern. Sort of looking at the statistics since 2006, we've had nearly 500 pedestrians killed on our streets and over 2,500 seriously injured. Um, I want City Council to have a solution to that, not just a status quo or do-nothing approach. As my representative, Councillor Layton, I really do appreciate your strong and successful advocacy for more bike lanes in our city. Um, it's important and it's critical, but it's only 25 kilometres of streets this year. And we know that most people in the city do not bike regularly. And so we want to be able to give options for the 80% of Torontonians who are choosing not to bike. If Toronto followed the lead of other cities like Paris, London, Seoul, to name a few, there would be nearly as many e-scooter trips as bike trips in our city, and this could save anywhere from 5 to 15 million car trips a year. And most of the people riding scooters are different than those riding bikes. We know this from the data in our American cities that show three-quarters of scooter users never use bike share and half never bike. So these would be new non-car riders in our system. Um, I think that's a great option. Um, right now, there's not even an attempt at a plan in front of us. 
We see 200 cities around the world um, trying pilot programs and working with scooters. And it seems like in Toronto, we can't even be bothered to try. What I ask of council and my counselors that we try, that we work together with um, staff in the city to come up with the best practices framework and to test the solution here in our city. We want to work with this with the city to develop a plan that takes into the consideration all the needs and concerns that we've heard today. Um, but I think taking no action is irresponsible as other cities are continue to move forward. And I would ask the council to please take action to move this forward today. Great. Thank you for your deputation. Any questions to the deputants? Seeing none, that brings us to our next uh, presenter, uh, Debbie, Gilles sorry, Debbie Gillespie uh, with the TTC Advisory Committee. Debbie, you're on the line. Try again, Debbie. Uh, Debbie, uh, the clerk is asking that you call into the line. Um, so we'll have you call in. We'll move to the next deputant. We'll move back. back. So the next deputant is Nick Brown. Okay. Uh, we do not believe Nick is online. That brings us to Anna Zivartz with the Disability Rights Washington. Hi, Anna. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for joining us. You're joining us from Beautiful. Washington? Yes. Okay. Yeah, good. I'm working. Thank you. You have three minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I am um, I am a person with a visual disability. I have nystagmus, um, so I'm low vision. I live in Seattle, and I work for Disability Rights Washington. And Seattle is a city with e-scooters. From... Um, Someone who has uh, both bike share and e-scooters in their city uh, in large numbers, we have thousands of each, e-scooters are not a major threat to our streets. I um, was taking my kid to preschool this morning. I have a four-year-old and we almost got hit by a car. Um, and that happens almost every day um, as, I, as I navigate our streets. That has never happened to me with an e-scooter. The dangers we face every day are from streets overrun by cars. That's why instead of, we welcome uh, we welcome e-scooters because they reduce car use. Well-managed scooter programs, e-scooter programs do exist, and those are safe programs that benefit the community. Instead of banning e-scooters, most cities leverage them as a tool to achieve the city's goals um, and envision zero needs. This is why places like New York, Seattle, and Port this is what places like New York, Seattle, and Portland are doing. We know that safer cities are achieved by fewer people in cars, and we hope that e-scooter programs can help us get there. Um, from what I can tell, Toronto needs to take action. Over 40 pedestrians die a year in Toronto, all due to cars. That's a lot. Car injuries and deaths are horrific. Um, it's one of my biggest fears as a mom. Uh, every time I leave the house with my kid, I don't have that fear uh, with e-scooters. I encourage the city to make a serious effort to bring new options to the streets. The status quo isn't working um, for many folks, uh, and it's not doing us any favors. Embracing new options is what a world class is what world class cities are doing uh, around the globe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Uh, are there any questions, of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move to our next deputant who is uh, We're just seeing if some of the deputants we missed previously have joined back in. Okay, great. We're going to go with Tammy Adams. Tammy, are you online? You have three minutes. Okay, we'll move to Wendy Hong. Hi, Wendy. Hi. Thank you for joining us. You have three minutes. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Wendy Hong. I'm a single parent and I'm visually impaired. We should not allow um, e-scooters on our already crowded streets of Toronto. I'm also a member of the Canadian Council of the Blind Toronto Visionaries. And what we run programs is to tackle social isolations, mostly um, commonly in with a lot of seniors and blind and visually impaired. I am also coming to you today as a first generation Canadian. I am especially um, concerned about the safety for my own grandparents, my mother who is schizophrenic, and I do have family who have uh, physical disability and cognitive disabilities. My family came from a third world country. Uh, my family came from a third world country for a better life, and they practice Good Samaritans. Allowing e-scooters will pose a uh, pose a quality to their life and possible death. This is not how we as Torontonians say thank you to uh, wonderful community members who have contributed to Toronto multiculturalism. I don't want my daughter to lose a mom. I don't want any of my loved ones to be a, to be a statistic. And I don't want all of Toronto to live in fear just for taking a walk. E-scooters are a recipe for disaster. They are like a moving landmine and the trigger is collision. Please don't allow e-scooters in Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll move to our next deputant, uh, Lucy Catania. Do we have Lucy on the line? Okay, uh, we do not believe Lucy is present. That brings us to Aaron Binder with Segway of Ontario. Hello. Hi, thank you, Aaron. You have three minutes. Thank you. And hello, Infrastructure Committee. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Aaron Binder, and I'm the Chief Experience Officer at Segway of Ontario. Uh, we've been a retailer of micro mobility and personal electric devices like kick scooters and segways since 2004. Uh, first off, I do wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here. And today I'm specifically talking about privately owned e-scooters already on the streets of Toronto. Uh, we recently polled our customers and learned some pretty incredible stats. 60% uh, of the people polled uh, use their devices to commute to and from work. Another 30% are primarily using them to move around downtown university and college campuses. Uh, we, we dug into our sales metrics and one of the most interesting takes is that people above 50 years of age are actually our second fastest growing market segment. Our fastest uh, folks in postal codes with traditionally low frequency TTC service. Over one third of the people I've just described are now exchanging car trips for scooter trips. In addition to reducing wear and tear on city streets compared to cars, privately owned e-scooters do offer additional benefits to the city, like they're low cost, they're equitable, they're affordable transportation, and they don't have emissions. They do improve citizen mental health and allow riders to explore new parts of Toronto and spend their money in uh, new BIA zones. They also reduce the potential for COVID-19 transmission compared to public transit or ride sharing. Uh, privately owned scooters are also easily insured by tenant or homeowner's insurance. And as Anna just said, safer cities become achievable with less car trips. We're helping fill that gap. We do agree with the conclusion from city staff and the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee that e-scooters definitely shouldn't be used on sidewalks. The staff at Segway of Ontario provide a safety training session for every customer that walks through our doors. And we recommend stuff like the best helmet, best lights, what kind of bell to use, and how to safely ride on Toronto streets, cycle tracks, and multi-use paths. 
Unfortunately, other retailers like uh, Amazon, Best Buy, Canadian Tire, the big guys, they don't offer the same training or advice, um, and that has definitely created a safety knowledge gap. We're recommending to close this gap with the following measures. We recommend that the city adopt a legal private use model to facilitate existing and future e-scooter owners, identify key safety features that must be present on e-scooters, and treat e-scooters under the same MTO classification as bicycles or electric bikes, and explore the idea of a formal training program delivered through retailers like us or similar to CAN Bike. Pedestrian, cyclist, and driver road rights are already discussed as an ongoing conversation. We need to add micromobility users to that mix instead of adopting a head in the sand ban on private owners. Especially as ownership adoption rates are expected to skyrocket over the next decade. Just like drinking <laughs> a drinking ban in public parks, people aren't going to stop riding just because the city recommends against it. Let's work together on this. Thank you. Thank you very much for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, we're going to go back to Lucy Catania. I believe Lucy's now on the line. Okay, we've lost Lucy again, so we're going to go to Jeff Kettle. Uh, Jeff also needs to collect, uh, connect his mic while he's doing that. We're going to go back to Debbie Gillespie with TTC Advisory Committee as she's now connected. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, Debbie. Thank you for joining us. Okay, not a problem. Uh, um, thank you, by the way, Councillor McKelvey, for the opportunity to speak to the committee on the issue of e-scooters. Um, I'm going to stick to facts. I'm not going to use anxiety and I'm not going to use fear mongering as one of the uh, deputants um, intimated earlier. And um, but we'll, we'll just proceed. And I do have questions at the end that I'd like the councillors to consider. Um, I believe that um, allowing the pilot of e-scooters could seriously jeopardize the safety of pedestrians in the city of Toronto and I believe they pose serious accessibility concerns. I'm not saying they can never be overcome, but I'm saying they are unable to be overcome at this moment in time. My, the, out, the barriers I'm gonna outline are the following. Um, I'm a blind person who uses a guide dog. Um, the, the reality of e-scooters is that these are silent vehicles. They make no sound. Um, if you're walking on the sidewalk, you have no way of knowing when they are approaching if you are unable to see them. And this is a serious concern for people who have vision loss. These vehicles travel, uh, can travel up to 20 kilometers an hour, and the reaction time is non-existent if they're too close to you and you don't know they're there in the first place. Um, how would this affect people, seniors and uh, safety, people who have disabilities and balance issues, and parents who have children in strollers? I understand there was insurance issues regarding e-scooters, and I believe that is still to be uh, addressed before any pilot would be able to continue in the city of Toronto. I believe also that when I go out on the sidewalk or others who have vision loss, um, we feel relatively safe on the sidewalk. Uh, we have to navigate around obstacles and there are more of those granted in the city of Toronto of this size, uh, but it is the reality of living in a big city. And I don't think there's anyone who doesn't recognize that fact that you need to learn how to navigate around obstacles in, in larger cities. Having e-scooters as a silent vehicle is an obstacle for, for not only safety, but if, a, if e scooters are left on the sidewalk at transit stops, unattended, they create mobility hazards for people who are unable to see them and have to determine the best course of action to navigate around these. 
I have a couple of questions to finish my deputation. Excuse me. How, if an accident does occur, how would one report it? What options are there for the injured party? If it were myself, as an example, what, what options would I have when I'm not able to identify the driver, there's no license number, and so on? I urge the committee to accept the city's excellent staff report and not proceed with the pilot at this time in Toronto. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Any questions of the deputant? Okay. Um, we have uh, Lucy Catania, and then we'll go to Jeff Gettle, and then we'll need to do some procedural items before lunch. So, uh, Lucy? Yes, and I'm... Thank you. You have three morning, minutes. Speaker. Okay. Good morning, Madam Speaker and everyone else. Um, uh, I'm a senior myself. I've uh, been in Toronto 55 years. And um, I'm the president of the Golden Age Academy of the Seniors. I also run a volunteer group, heart group at Carmen Stefano Community Center. I'm from Western Road and Shepard, Mr. Caruza. And um, so anyway, I, um, the other day was Sunday, I decided, I have an impairment on my back. I have a, so I decided to walk down uh, my driveway with my cane. And uh, all at once I seen a scooter, a talent crescent. We took kids on top of it. I'm sure they were going over 20 kilometers, something. Like, I couldn't believe it. I don't know if they were from Poland or Santa Drive down the street. And uh, one thing I have to say, I'm against, and I'm speaking for all the seniors I know. I know quite a, se quite a lot of seniors. And uh, I've been volunteering for years for seniors. I, um, I, uh, I made myself ready for when I was going to be a senior, helping the seniors. And for all those people that are healthy, they can ride the scooter, I, I believe that they have grandparents and parents. And uh, I wish them the best. But one day they will be seniors. And I tell you, seniors have been deprived of a lot of things. That's all we need now, to deprive us to walk on our sidewalk. Just thinking about two seniors coming to the community center to paint. One, one end with a cane, the other one with a bag, so they can take our cam the canvas. Eh? Can you imagine that? And one of these scooters is going to hit them? And one thing also, I one more thing I would like to say. Thank you for the great work you're doing. And, and I'm telling you, seniors, we are the one. They paved the road for all these people and these scooters. Have a little respect for the seniors. We should be put up front at any times. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your deputation. You. Are there Thank any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions for Lucy? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll move to Jeff Kettle, which will be our last speaker before we break for lunch. Uh, Jeff, are you on the line? <laughs> Jeff, we can't hear you. Best speech I ever heard him make. This is the I, first. I think you know he's trying to get it all in and under his five and under his three minute first. limit. Jeff, can you use the call in number that was provided, please? Okay, Jeff, we'll connect with you over lunch and you'll be the first speaker when we get back. We'll try, um, as the last speaker before lunch, show up, Ahmed. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, thank you, Shoab. You have three minutes. You're last speaker before lunch on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair, and hello, committee members. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm here to speak on behalf of Scooty, a Toronto-based micromobility company incubated at Ryerson University's 
Digital Media Zone. I'm here to speak against the recommendations items 21.7, and I say with respect uh, the recommendation that Toronto not opt into the provincial e-scooter pilot and continue to prohibit e-scooters. Um, you have heard me speak about micromobility in various meetings and the benefit that it comes from local mobility, and you've heard me speak about integration with transit and supporting local businesses. Today, um, I'm here to talk about mobility equity. As an immigrant, as an immigrant to Canada, access to public transit was my lifeline and is con and continues to be my lifeline. And I started Scooty to improve mobility equity, to help residents find new and easier ways to go to get to and from work, services, school, and opportunities, to help everyone, but especially the disadvantaged. These people, many who share my heritage and enthusiasm and a sense of hope, I feel are not being heard and left behind. I understand the concerns raised by the staff and Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee about the new and unfamiliar forms of mobility. We are committed to proactively addressing these concerns. Scooty has shared extensive research and feedback with staff, and I've spoken in front of the, of the Toronto's Accessibility Advisory Committee and this committee and offered suggestions along with my colleagues on ways to address these concerns. By not opting in, we missed the opportunity to provide more additional local mobility options. This is a great opportunity here to reduce the risk associated with congestion and crowding, which will likely happen again post COVID. More importantly, as operators and as, as offered uh, by my colleagues, it is our collective responsibility to address the broader pedestrian and road safety concerns that have been raised by many stakeholders, including WalkTO, CycleTO, friends and families of safe streets, and so many other stakeholders that came and spoke today. As mentioned others, enforcements can be done, uh, but can be managed by scooter companies. Scooty has shared better approaches that align with the city's strategic uh, strategies and goals. And I ask that you consider these approaches rather than prohibition. I believe there are practical solutions and pathways forward for each of the concerns raised by staff and the broader public. And I welcome the opportunity to further engage and dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, the rest of the deputations will be held, will be heard at 1.30 when we resume. Um, in light of that, there's a few releases that we wanted to release so that staff could leave. Um, so the first one is on uh, IE 21.11. Uh, this was an item that was brought forward by uh, Councillor Wong Tam, and uh, she's agreed to defer that to the next meeting so we can have a more fulsome uh, presentation and time for conversation. So we'll pull that one up. Uh, IE 21.11, I'll move that we defer consideration of the presentation from the General Manager, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, the Director of Management Services, Park, Forestry and Recreation, to the meeting on May 25th. All in all in favor of that one? Okay, uh, so that's deferred item 2117, uh, urging the federal government to take action to manage plastics. Um, Deputy Mayor, I know that uh, you were okay to n not hold this item with questions right now and deal with it in the next the next council meeting. So Councillor Layton was going to move deferral. I had my questions answered. Okay, great. So we'll pull that up. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Layton. Yes, I'll move to defer consideration until the May 25th meeting to coincide with the uh, report from staff on the subject. Great, thank you. When the screen's moved back, we can vote on this item. So all in favor of the deferral, that carries. Um, members, we ask that you do try to advance circulate motions that are on the, the remaining items just to make the meeting proceed a little bit smoother. And then uh, before we break too, um, I just want to recognize, and maybe you can turn his camera on, uh, Jim Baxter. This is his last infrastructure and environment committee meeting. I know he's here and I know he's listening. Thank you. So Jim, we just wanted to make sure that we recognize this momentous occasion that this is your last time uh, meeting us today, our last opportunity to grill you with a Q&A session. 
um, and do know that uh, we just wanted to wish you all the very best in your retirement. I've said it before, I won't wish you a relaxing retirement. I don't think it suits you. Instead, I will wish you one full of adventure and, uh, and going forward. So um, unless there is anything to add to that, I see that uh, the deputy manager has also joined us. Maybe I'll let uh, the deputy manager say a word. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just I wanted to make sure I got to see Jim's smiling face as uh, we say farewell to him on his last infrastructure and environment uh, committee meeting. Uh, thank him for the 11 plus years of incredible service and setting the city up in, in a great way that he has with the footprint with Transform TO. And uh, always a pleasure to work with you, Jim. And I know Josie wanted to be here. I don't know if she's been able to dial in right now. Uh, but just on behalf of SLT, definitely to say uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to miss you, but we trust we're going to see you around and you're going to keep our feet to the proverbial fire to carry on the good work that you've done. Thank you, Councillor McKelvey. Thank you. I, Madam Chair, I just, if I could chime in for one sec. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, I don't make it any secret that I've sat on the, the Parks and Environment uh, Committee when I first arrived at City Hall for, for four years and, of course, um, last two years, uh, infrastructure and environment. And I just wanted to say that any time we had to deal with uh, environmental issues, climate change issues, uh, and the various uh, levels of government and how we got things done, uh, Jim was always there. And I appreciated the advice uh, he gave, the knowledge base he has, and his drives to to make programs work. So I wanted to uh, personally wish Jim all the best. Um, sorry you're leaving, but of course, uh, happy happy for your your future. So thank you so much uh, for your work of the various committees that I sat on and chaired, and I wish you all the best. Thank you, Councillor Pasternak. And unless anybody else wanted to to wish him well, I will ask um, Jim. Would you like to say good riddance and goodbye to us? Oh, you can't mute. You're unmuted. We're trying to unmute you. We're we're not trying to to you know hold you back here on your last day. <laughs> Uh, Josie was able to to join if she wants while we're trying to reconnect Jim. Uh, Josie, you're welcome to also say a word. Okay, we're going to deal with tech issues over the break, and then maybe um, uh, Jim Baxter will we'll give you that opportunity to say good riddance to us at 1.30. Oh, is he live? I think I'm there. Yeah, oh, there you go. Okay, here you go. Um, over to you. I, you know, this is like, I, I feel like I'm saying goodbye more than who here, um, but I, I just wanted to thank this committee. I think, you know, over the 11 years, um, we have been able to do an incredible amount of work. We've we've introduced, you know, Transform TO. We 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 do Environment Days over 150 days a year. We've got the Home Energy Loan Program. We 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 participate in in climate action groups around the world. We're leading in some areas, um, and you know this is this is a result of a joint effort between staff um, and the Environment and Energy Division is a is a powerhouse group. Um, but we, we can't do that. We would not have been able to do what we, we did without um, the assistance and, and the, the, uh, the, the working alongside uh, those on council. So um, I wanted to thank all of you that, that sit on, on, on this committee um, and all of those that, uh, that had gone before. Um, I know that we've done a lot of work, but we've got much more to do. 
and, and I look forward to watching from the outside for a while uh, to see um, how this progresses. He guaranteed I will not be far away. Um, I wish you all luck um, and, uh, and, and happy trails and the things that you do for, for climate and for yourselves. So thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm glad we were able to get you connected. Um, I did, I know Josie, you had problems connecting. If you wanted to say something, just nod and we can try and get you back on. Otherwise we will break for lunch. I don't know if she can hear us. Okay, that's a break for lunch. Thank you so much again, Jim. And uh, we're, uh, we're gonna what miss you. What time are we back, Madam Chair? Um, sorry, what was that? What time are we back? Uh, 1.30. Okay. Okay, happy lunch.
Okay, great. We're going to get started. Uh, we're on item IE 21.7, e-scooters accessibility and insurance issues, um, and uh, the remaining speakers. So first up is Jeff Kettle with the Federation of North Toronto Residents Association. Uh, Jeff, do we have you online? Yes, um, am I, am I being heard? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. There is a little bit of feedback, so if, oh, he's okay now? Okay, you're great. Go ahead, you um, have three minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, my name is Jeff Cattell. I'm co-chair of Fontrelli. We represent over 30 resident associations in Midtown, North Toronto, North York. We um, strongly support the staff report, its analysis and recommendations. We continue to have serious concerns with the proposal, consistent with our comments submitted on the early report last, last July. Uh, we appreciate the update um, from staff, the extensive research and stakeholder consultations are being reported on right now by transportation services, including the learning from other jurisdictions with much more experience on this matter. Uh, large cities like Chicago, New York, London, Amsterdam, which are comparable in size and population, have had numerous um, unresolved issues associated with the use of e-scooters. Uh, like those that experience is likely to be similar and relevant uh, to, to Toronto, um, more so than the, than the small cities like Ottawa. But even Ottawa, one of the smaller cities, has banned these scooters from its most popular destination, the Bywood Market, and from National Capital Commission, walkways and paths. So the staff report outlines in, in uh, really good, good detail the un unique risk factors associated with Toronto's existing public infrastructure, its road and sidewalk design that does not con that did not um, contemplate the addition of e-scooters, so, uh, risk to public safety, public health, um, vulnerable seniors, people um, with disabilities, community nuisance, all those left left around, uh, the cost uh, to the healthcare system of increased um, accidents, uh, liability and cost to the city as well. And the lack of insurance, uh, medical and disability coverage for e-scooter users and non-users when in injured. Um, so it, for example, the additional barriers created for pedestrians and persons with disabilities who use sidewalks out of necessity, especially people living with low vision, um, users of mobility assistive devices, or older adults encountering illegal sidewalk riding or poorly parked e-scooters. The challenges with enforcing moving violations, the lack of policing resources to, to um, witness or enforce illegal e-scooter use on sidewalks, hidden runs, and the inability to identify the e-scooter rider. How someone injured by, by an e-scooter rider or trip hazard caused by an improperly parked e-scooter would be compensated for damages, for rehabilitation, lost wages, and medical costs. And then e-scooters tend to replace bike share programs and would certainly make walking less safe. So while, while we obviously support in today's age the alternative modes of transportation, especially climate-friendly modes that reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but we, we, um, we would believe that devoting increased city resources to improving pedestrian and biking infrastructure would provide more benefit and safer transportation to more of the city's population than e-scooters and without the increased risks and costs associated with them. So we would say double down on, on our existing plans around walking and biking and, and, um, and let this one go by. So we're recommending that Planning and Housing Committee recommend the City Council that it decline the option to participate in the pilot project. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, and thank you for your patience getting connected. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Stanley Rose. Can you hear me? We can hear you, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am advocating for no one but myself. I, um, I am a, lifelong resident of Toronto, and I'm also a member of the disability community. But um, as is indicated in my letter that I submitted to the committee, th this is a problem for everybody on the sidewalks of Toronto. 
I had my first encounter with e-scooters last week in the two block distance from my office to Young Street. Three people on e-scooters came from in front of me and the first two were fine. They slowed down, they, they had ample room to pass and, and they did safely. The third one was coming at me at high speed and I didn't know whether they could avoid a collision. I pulled hard to my left and, and um, got right next to the building that was near me as it, it was by. And it caused me a lot of concern about what could happen, not just to me, but to anybody, particularly if these e-scooters <laughs> approach from behind. Um, people often veer to one way to the or the other in their walking on the sidewalks in order to avoid oncoming traffic. They turn into buildings, and I'm aware of that from the use of my electric wheelchair. And I, I exercise caution as I go past people who are walking because I wish to avoid the collision as well. But um, it's usually the dis difficulty is when you are approaching them from behind, they can't hear the vehicle and um, they, they make their turn into the path of the vehicle and quite accidentally uh, could have a collision. Uh, that was a concern to me. Um, as I say, the first two e-scooter drivers that I encountered um, were proper drivers. The third one was driving at high speed and seemed to have somewhat of a reckless disabandon to um, just approach to the driving on the sidewalk. My concern is with the sidewalks. Um, I, I, uh, I don't see any reason why e-scooters can't be put into bike lanes um, or, or a, a separate lane for them, but it's the pedestrian that, that concerns me. And uh, that is all I have to offer. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, seeing none, our next speaker is Hasneet Singh Punia. I can you hear me? We can hear you, Hasneet. You have three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for allowing me an opportunity to delegate this afternoon. My name is Hasneet Singh Punia, and I am the public policy manager at Super Pedestrian Canada Inc., a shared micromobility company. And we look forward to continuing to engage in a collaborative way with council, staff, and members of the Toronto community. I'm also a resident of Ontario, and I think shared e-scooters should at least be provided an opportunity to be piloted in the city so everyone can see what they are capable of. Because right now we have a lot of discussion about different aspects of e-scooters and pedestrian safety. And I, for one, am confident that the technological advancements occurring every day, we can overcome these issues. At Super Pedestrian Canada, we are a team of safety obsessed urban mobility specialists who understand that scooters have the potential to be a transformative force, strengthening last mile connections to existing transit, bolstering equitable access to jobs and resources, and becoming a dependable, reliable, and fun transportation option for residents and visitors alike. From the beginning, we focused on durability and safety. We've, just, we've dedicated over eight years to engineering the safest scooter. I want to start by acknowledging the joint letter that was sent to this committee by a large number of operators, uh, where we suggest a working group be established comprised of cities the City of the Toronto staff, the e-school operators listed in the letter, and members of the accessibility community. I'll to work collaboratively to address mutual areas of interest and concerns and report back to this committee by July 5th, 2021. Once the results of the working group are known, the committee would be in a better position to make a decision on participating in the Ontario e scooter pilot. I think having the ability to meet with staff in the community to address a number of these issues, and we would really appreciate the opportunity to be able to discuss solutions directly so that we can ensure that we can bring shared e-scooters to Toronto in a safe and thoughtful way, which will give the city another affordable mode of transportation that Torontonians can utilize to address the first mile, last mile connections to ensure more residents have improved access to public transit and increased usage that currently sits at 10% of the public and decrease our reliance on cars. Finally, e-scooters and other micro-mobility options will help the city of Toronto and the province of Ontario meet their new 2040 GHG emission caps. I believe strongly that e-scooters will give low income and marginalized diverse communities an affordable option when it comes to moving around Toronto. We have all read story after story of frontline workers not being able to afford a car 
or for that matter, afford sky high auto insurance rates in Ontario, especially parts of Toronto. I think this issue requires members of the community to consider all aspects of the decision that is before them before accepting the staff recommendations today, as this decision will impact all Toronto residents. I know members of the committee are torn between all the delegations they have heard today, and rightfully so. But please, let the operators work with staff and members of the community before making a final decision on this matter, as it deserves more attention. Thousands of people per year are killed by cars, including many pedestrians. Despite more than three years of shared East Grove operations and hundreds of millions of trips, I was unable to find any documented case of a shared East scooter rider killing a pedestrian in North America. The number one thing that Toronto can do to make streets safe is to reduce automobile trips. It generally requires expensive investments or painful mandates. By allowing e-scooters, you can reduce automobility trips, buy people out of cars, reduce greenhouse gas to emissions. And we have a lot of personal anecdotes thrown around in this meeting, but I would urge this committee to look at the data. E-scooters have been successfully introduced in hundreds of cities around the world, and overwhelmingly, they have been safe for pedestrians and other vulnerable road users. I know Toronto can do this. Give us the time. Let us work together. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you for your deputation. Any questions of the deputant? Okay. We're going to do a roll call on deputants that had difficulty um, connecting earlier just to see if any of them have joined us. Uh, so we'll start with Ryan Frazier. Ryan, if you're present, please unmute. Okay. Uh, Marvin Sokoloff. Ira Schweitzer. Richard Pass, Nick Brown, and Tammy Adams. Okay, thank you. Uh, five minutes. I get. Sorry, go ahead, Councillor Ainsley. You, you can ask questions, okay. staff. You have five minutes. Yep. Okay. Thank. you. Councillor Ainsley, do you want to turn off your camera while you ask questions? That might improve your broadband or, or improve your connection. Does that help? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So currently, can e-scooters, can they be purchased in retail stores in Toronto? Uh, yes. I mean, they're allowed to be used on private property, and um, we don't believe there's any authority that the city would have to be able to um, to really prevent uh, e-scooters from being pri uh, purchased for for those purposes. Okay, and and that would be the same as you know if I wanted to go buy an e-scooter on Amazon or eBay or Kijiji, there's nothing that could stop me as a resident of Toronto from from buying one and using it. Um, that that's correct. I think also what's challenging is that I'm trying to understand that. Sure. Um, basically, it was just to summarize that the city's concerns in terms of um, adequate insurance and adequate indemnification um, are not being met. And for those reasons, we, we don't advise opting into a pilot. Um, I can get into each of those if, if that would help explain um, some of the significant concerns, such as um, um, sorry. indemnification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was more I was more interested in where it just said unresolved, trying to understand whether because there's other cities, for example, where Ottawa, uh, my understanding is they've managed to work out many of these and they're in the the second year of a pilot project. I I think the important part is to look at the city's context. Um, Toronto's downtown is twelve times larger than Calgary's downtown, for instance, and we're fifty times larger than Windsor's downtown. So we are looking at or like large peer cities. So Chicago, after their pilot, banned rental e-scooters from their entire downtown and waterfront. New York City does not allow e-scooters um, in their downtown, and that's under state legislation. A lot of northeastern states and cities like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, so uh, Boston, Philadelphia, um, and many other cities um, also, we've, we've actually been talking directly. Um, I noticed um, one of the companies said we, we actually have been consulting closely with the Department of Transportation uh, in New York City. Uh, we've, we've been in connection with Transport for London. 
um, and others to directly get uh, information. Um, Montreal is, is not piloting, um, again, uh, not in 2020 and not in 2021. So I, I wouldn't say that issues are resolved in other jurisdictions. And in fact, what we're seeing is even in cities like uh, Berlin and Stockholm and Copenhagen and others, that there's still outstanding issues and concerns. Okay. And did you did you talk with staff in Ottawa? Yes. Okay. And they, right. uh, they they have they have said that they totally understand why we would take our stance given our pedestrian mode share, um, the greater friction of the, the the number of people on our streets, whether it's uh, pedestrians, cyclists, um, and and the like. Okay, and that also takes in the, because often we talk about the last mile and dealing with the last mile, and I would think that e-scooters would be a key component of that when you're taking the mix of everything that we have or that we're trying to use to deal with the last mile. But staff are yeah, not we're... seeing that as e scoot as a usable e-scooters as being a viable component of that. So yes, there, there are two, two components of the reasons. One is that there's a lack of consumer safety. Um, it's very important to us that people aren't gonna get hurt um, by using the devices. And what, what we're seeing so far is that um, I've been speaking with people who want to use them for uh, actual commuting purposes and that the uh, provincial regulations don't actually account for the kind of um, safety aspects that they need in their product. And in fact, because they have a product that does not meet provincial regulations, they can't get it insured, even though they're trying to get insurance to protect themselves and be responsible. Um, so we're definitely having those conversations um, with citizens, but the challenge is that uh, the city is, in, is put in di a difficult position uh, because there aren't adequate um, device safety standards. And for, I'll give you an example. Um, current devices may only be asked to be tested on dry, smooth, and clean surfaces. And that isn't going to help someone who wants to use it on a daily basis for commuting or getting to and from transit stations. We want Torontonians to be safe, both in terms of the riders and in terms of non-riders. And in cities with a high pedestrian um, mode share, there is a higher percentage of injuries uh, to non-riders. Uh, one in five or even greater are injuries to non-riders. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, when my screen switches back, I will... I know Councillor Layton had questions. Yes, thank you very much. Yep. Um, just to that last point, I hadn't heard that before about how they test the vehicles. Can you, can you just repeat that and explain it? Yes, so um, there are currently standards for things like electrical um, safety, but there isn't a mechanical standard, for instance, for the braking, uh, the wheel size, the whether there's suspension, um, whether there are indicator lights. Um, we've been asking industry as well as trying to follow other associations about um, the setting of some sort of standard for both uh, commercial shared e-scooters as well as ones that are sold to individual consumers. Um, there are standards like the ISO standard or the CSA, um, and another example is the ASTM standard. It's an industry-led industry uh, standard in the U.S. Um, it's still in the process of being developed, but some of the things that are coming up as a concern are things like requiring the braking test to be only done on clean, dry, smooth surfaces. Um, and in fact, it's the cities, um, they're roughly about 50 members. 40 of those members are e-scooter companies, and then around eight are cities. So cities like Cambridge, Austin, Chicago, Toronto, um, and, and others that are, are participating. Um, when, raise, when these issues are raised about the um, wheel size and traction and the type of tires and what we call like the traversable or operable terrain, um, we were we were getting we were hearing things like oh it's very expensive and costly to test on other environmental surfaces but the ISO standard for bicycles you can simply spray something wet on the tire and then you do the brake test um, to to try for wet conditions what we're what we just want to make sure 
is that if there are any industry standards, that they are robust and that they do protect um, riders. Because what happens is the city is the one uh, that then has to pay out the claims um, and deal with the, the judgment um, that comes out of a process when someone's injured on the city's uh, public infrastructure. So, so I think there, there are problems when two thirds of a committee that is putting together the safety standards uh, are from the industry. I, I, I acknowledge that, um, but this issue of, of liability, if, if we had first and third person liability, would the city still be responsible for paying out if there were injuries on city infrastructure? So what um, we're asking for is both first and third party insurance as well as full indemnification. And I think what we've seen is that in even some of the written submissions, um, there's this needing to negotiate what full indemnification is because um, e-scooter companies are reluctant to cover anything that might be with respect to the city's uh, infrastructure. And I think Barbara can speak to our context. Aren't kind of aren't kind of we in the driver's seat here? Like if if we were to put those indemnifications on, that they would just have to comply. What we have heard, what we've heard, and what we've seen in news is that there have been difficulties in getting that upheld. So it would be, um, I think, some comments about this being the upfront cost is free. I think there's a lot of hidden subsidy. And the hidden subsidy is the amount of staffing to deal with the um, negotiation and compliance um, and having to deal with potential um, pursuing legal action if needed to get contracts upheld or in having to deal with um, uh, general compliance. I think, I think having you know, seen and experienced even in what we've heard today, um, I think there would be concerns about the the level of um, compliance and uh, I'll just give you another example in Calgary. I mean, what you're not hearing today from some of the deputants is that 40% of e-scooter users surveyed in Calgary um, spoke about device um, quality and maintenance issues. Um, so I, I think, I think there's legitimate concern about the, um, yeah, about whether that indemnification would actually be upheld. Not, not to be flippant about it, but I would complain about four out of the ten bike shares that I get, uh, just because uh, for equipment reasons. Um, now, I only have time for one more question. But did you consult the medical officer of health on this? Because I believe we were awaiting a report, and I get how busy she is right now. Um, but did we consult the board of health, or the the medical officer of health, and what was the advice we got from them? So I have reached out to my counterparts and also um, her director, and they have just not been able to work on this. They've wished us luck, but they're just too busy. Um, I can say that as recent as March of March and February of 2021, um, emergency room surgeons and doctors at Tel Aviv, um, one of their big urban hospitals, published in Orthospine News um, that e-scooters inflict a high burden on healthcare systems and um, a high burden on the patient's quality of life, given the high incidence of complex fractures. This is not um, specific just to Tel Aviv. We've seen similar um, severe injury studies and the burden on um, surgeries. In fact, in Auckland, um, there was a study regarding orthopedic fractures and that the incident of e-scooter surgeries were increasing wait times for other operable um, operations and surgeries. So there are a number of studies that have mentioned these issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Uh, are there any other questions? Councillor Pasternak and then Councillor Peruzza. Uh, great, great, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to focus back on the enforcement. Um, who, what division would be uh, responsible for enforcing any bylaws governing scooters? Would it be uh, police? Would it be municipal licensing? Would transportation set up a whole new team? How would how would that work? 
Well, for the moving violations, it is it would be Toronto Police, and then for the um, sidewalk obstructions um, and issues, it would be um, it would be transportation services uh, bylaw um, enforcement stuff. But I I think what we're seeing is that um, uh, in other jurisdictions they've needed uh, large teams. So um, I know after speaking with uh, Montreal and Ottawa and New York City's Department of Transportation, um, the kinds of staffing we would be looking at is like 10 to 20 people to deal with program oversight. And those costs are not fee recovered, the labor costs in Ottawa. Uh, the, I spoke with city staff and their labor costs are not fee recovered. Right, and we're a much bigger city. So um, we would have to go and hire. We, we'd have to put a team together that, that uh, kind of watched over this program and, and, and did their best to enforce. Um, I, anecdotally speaking, police hate um, enforcing um, cycling violations. I mean, the, they do not want to stop um, people on a bike. Um, they just cannot stand that um, part of their enforcement and they generally don't do it. Um, would a, would a whole team have to be built here or, or would you kind of second them to people from other areas or right? Or, or there's been no thought um, of that because. So, well, no, through the chair, it's Barbara. I, uh, to Councillor Pasternak, I, um, I think if we really wanted to have any kind of enforcement and compliance of any kind of rule, we would have to absolutely have people out on the street to do that work. Um, certainly, there would be a role there for police. I think um, there, as you mentioned, uh, there's challenges with um, going forward with enforcement uh, for some of these types of infractions. Um, also, as you know, this year in particular, with our Cafe Teo and Active Teo programs um, trying to be more compliant with uh, access for people with disabilities, we are going to be fairly well stretched in order to provide some kind of um, oversight and enforcement to ensure that we can keep sidewalks clear for people traveling through as well as have a, a vibrant scene for Cafe Teo. So um, I think on the go forward in future years, it would still be a huge burden. And I don't think many other cities have, have had an enforcement program with a lot of success. Um, and this year in particular, it would be uh, absolutely um, overwhelming for us. So you can legally buy one of the scooters in the city, but you can't you can't legally ride one of them. Is that is that kind of the gist of um, our situation? Our our concern is the magnitude of the issue. So while there's some, um, there might be some who are using them at their own risk. Um, the issue is opening it up more widely and having a magnitude of many new users um, who would be seriously injured, um, especially during this pandemic. Um, what we do know is the serious injuries would, would be a burden on hospital resources as well as city staff. I think what we're seeing, as I mentioned, is that savvy consumers are actually wearing full face. I mean, you heard from some deputants, they're wearing full face, either mountain bike or motorcycle helmets, um, wrist guards, knee, pa knee pads and the like. And I don't know that all consumers, if we endorsed um, a pilot widely, are going to be, um, be equipped and as mentioned, the irony is that the safer the e-scooter, if it has dual suspension, um, it actually may not be meeting the provincial regulations. Um, so we're in a bit of a conundrum at the city because the city then takes on those, that liability and the costs and the claims. So it, it is up to decision makers that they want to set aside a chunk of money to deal with the claims and to deal with the resourcing to, um, to take on um, what a pilot would require. So the bottom line is there's nothing free about this program. Sure, they put the scooters out, they put the upfront capital. And they want to enforce. We're open to liability. Uh, um, I don't know, our, our hospitals are stretched to the limit now. I would hopefully one day uh, that, that will ease up. Um, but um, the city often gets attached in lawsuits, whether we're liable or not. If there's a motor vehicle accident or pedestrian accident, they'll sue the driver, the automaker, uh, the municipality, um, you know, any, any anything else in their in their sites. Could we be attached to all kinds of lawsuits um, 
whether we're indemnified or not. I mean, I can't, I can't speak to that. I, I could just say for the e-scooter issue, we are very concerned that with joint and several liability, the city, um, even at 1% at fault, would, would be at risk of having to pay out the entire claim. But through the, through the chair, I just wanted to add also, Councillor Pasternak, that I, I do think it's very um, important to take context into account we look at the context within which we would be operating a program here in Toronto, uh, you have to take that into account in comparison to other cities who have gone down this path um, in terms of our infrastructure and, and the frequency by which we may have people who are impacted either by uneven pavement quality or streetcar tracks, narrow sidewalks, high volumes of pedestrians. We tend to be somewhat unique in that regard, uh, which is why we've done so much engagement with other cities and with stakeholders over the course of, of this investigation. Okay, thank you. That was your last question. Um, Councillor Peruta. Thanks. Uh, so, so I'm just, um, the, there, there's, a, there's a picture of a scooter in the report. So that's generally the scooter we're talking about, correct? Uh, Janet, you know way too much about this stuff and you're confusing the heck out of me, okay? Like we, we need to kind of like dumb it down a bit, all right? Hey, speak for yourself. She's doing a great job. No, no, I, I don't Fantastic. doubt that. I, I, I don't doubt that, but I'm like, I have provincial regulation, non-provincial, they're legal, they're illegal. You can buy it, you can't buy it. You can't drive it, you can drive it. Yes, you can at your own risk. I, you know, it's it's like, really, it's like, it's all over town. I just, so the guy who just, the, no. the, the guy who just cool. zipped by on this scooter outside my window, uh, he, he he's riding on our road illegally right now, correct? Uh, through the chair, yes. Okay. So, it, especially so especially if, if he was on the sidewalk. <laughs> okay. All right. And, uh, right. So there's there's gravity. So on the street, somewhat legal. On the sidewalk, way more illegal. On my driveway, he's done. Okay. I get that. Um, so what happens to the guy if the police catch him down the street? I mean, so uh, the the issue is. Um, I say the word triage because that's where we're at right now. Um, if, I mean, police obviously in terms of resourcing, um, if the person is, 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 if the person is behaving recklessly and riding on the sidewalk, there is a $90 fine. Okay. Um, so, 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 but you're right, so, you need the so, police to so, be present. Yeah. And so this guy's on this scooter, right? The police see him zip by. Is he meeting the provincial guidelines? Is he okay? Like, is he, like, can he ride his personal scooter? No, cur no current through the chair. No, currently, um, uh, Toronto has not opted in to a pilot. We have not changed our bylaws to allow for them. Um, okay. On public so the police, so the police can pull him over and give him a ninety dollar ticket, and then he gets to ride off with his scooter. Well, I mean, again. Um, I, I don't know what happens. Yeah. Like, I, I, does does the, do the police take the scooter and throw it in the truck and say, "Hey, buddy, walk home." Right. It, it's, it be, it's going through the chair. It would be his personal property. The person who does stuff in your example, Councillor Bruce, it would be his personal property. Okay. I don't know. So, so, so if he takes, yeah. if if he rides off, the police can stop him and, and give him another ninety dollar ticket, uh, and can continue to do that down the street uh, until he takes that scooter, puts tucks it under his arm, and walks it home. Right? Is that is that the current? Is that the way it works now? Sure. So, yeah, I think I think the key is, as I mentioned, the word is triage. Uh, there's there are a lot of other priorities. Uh, we are working closely with police. Um, if a person is uh, riding recklessly and on a sidewalk, they can be fined ninety dollars. Um, we've spoken with police, and it's very context sensitive. If the person's intoxicated, obviously something else would would occur. But um, again, we we really think this recommendation is based on prioritizing the safety of all riders no, 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 as well I, as non riders. I, I, I understand. I'm just trying to understand scooters and what people can do. You can go to a store and buy a scooter now, but you can't ride the scooter on the street, certainly not on the sidewalk. Uh, that's uh, in, in, in Toronto, right? And, and then I'm and then I'm trying to understand 
what happens to all those people who have those scooters out there right now or technically can happen to all those people because because there's lots of folks on scooters right and i didn't know that so there were different yeah. different types of scooters so through, with different size mm -hmm. tire sizes through the chair, yeah yeah through the chair um it would be at their own risk and the city is not liable if they're going to do something illegal so if if they injure themselves because they haven't gone that extra mile to sort of research this, then that is unfortunately at, at their own risk if they're not insured and um, they, they try to make a claim against the city. Our concern is the magnitude. If we open it up, that more and more people will say the city endorses this, the city has said this is fine, and then what, what, we're gonna, what we know will happen is that more, a significant number of people will be injured, especially when they're new users, we know that there's a significant portion yeah, yeah. that is head injuries. Jan, Janet, I, I, I read the report. I got the point. I, I, and I understand your position uh, um, and, and your recommendation. I do. I'm just trying to understand, um, uh, you know, um, if, if my kids ask me for a scooter, <clears throat> I, you know, under, under you, know, uh, you, you know, at least to be able to explain to them, um, you know, uh, uh, under the cloud that they'd be running it, at, uh, riding it. In. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, it would be full, what's, full what's PPE. The, what's the, that's what's, five minutes. Uh, what's that's the, a, that's yeah, time. What's the speed of a scooter? Last two questions, Madam Chair. I don't Squeeze it into one round, short right? question. Wrap it in one quick question. Yeah, the, 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 the maximum speed of these scooters, because I've seen them go uh, quite, a, uh, quite fast. And how long does it take to walk a mile? And how long would it take to ride a mile on a scooter? Uh, so, um, the, under the provincial regulation, it's a maximum of 25 kilometers per hour, but that is, um, you can purchase these scooters that can go as fast as uh, 80 kilometers per hour. Um, I, I speak in kilometers, so uh, one kilometer you can walk in about like 10 to 15 minutes. Um, w with an e-scooter, you can travel uh, 25 feet in a second, um, seven meters in one second is how fast you can go at 25 kilometers per hour. Thank you. Are there additional questions of the wow. committee? Okay. Additional questions? Okay, seeing none, I have a few questions. I'll reset the timer. Um, can you just, uh, in the report, can you kind of outline the differences between bikes and how bikes are insured right now versus e-scooters? Sure, I might actually ask if um, insurance and risk management would could speak to this. Okay. Oh, hi, it's Melissa here from insurance and risk management. So through the chair, uh, or to the chair, yes, um, under a homeowner's or a tenant's insurance policy, E-bikes are insured, so if you are operating an e-bike and you're involved in an incident, your homeowner's policy would defend you and pay any claims that you are legally liable to pay. E-scooters, okay. on the other hand, are not insured under a homeowner's or a tenant's policy at this time. And if we opt into this, that does not change that. There still is not that insurance there. So who... Who dictates the way insurance policy is done um, and who could make that change? Uh, to the chair, yes. Um, so the industry, in my view, would have to lobby insurance companies in order to make that coverage available. I mean, I believe the insurance industry itself is aware of, you know, the, um, the advent of micromobility within municipalities, but they have yet to come up with an insurance solution for that, uh, for that method of transportation. Okay, and then back to this issue of people are currently taking an e-scooter out at their own risk because it's not you know, technically legal in the city of Toronto. Um, how does liability work on that right now? And then if we implement this pilot and there's no insurance, how does the liability change towards us at the city? Um, sorry, to the chair, I guess it's, or sorry, I'll let Melissa. No, sorry, through the chair, can you just kindly repeat your question? Uh, so there was an earlier question about liability, right? And so somebody's out on an e-scooter right now. Um, it's at their own risk. They hit a, a streetcar bump and they get injured. 
what's the liability of the city? And then if we bring this in and bring this change, are we then assuming all liability in that sense as well? So, so to the chair, without insurance options available to um, either users uh, or to users either on a first party or third party basis, the city could potentially be on the hook. Um, as Janet mentioned, um, you know, if the city is found even 1% liable for an incident involving an e-scooter um, on city property, we could be responsible for the entire uh, settlement amount if, if that liability is determined. I apologize for the noise. No apology necessary. Okay, thank you. That answers the question. Um, Janet, just uh, one further question for you. So at this point, we're opting out of the pilot, um, and or if that's the, the recommendation that's adopted, um, should the insurance be changed by the province and the regulations and the way this is all regulated, is it possible for us to revisit this at a, at a future time when this insurance issue is changed? Um, to the chair, uh, Yes, we, we list a number of uh, conditions that we think would um, protect for safety. Uh, one of them is insurance. A second one is the adequate safety standards for the devices, um, taking into account all the concerns of the riders as well as uh, persons with um, dis living with disabilities and pedestrians. And the other one that has been brought up by a number of deputants is having a continuous protected uh, bike network so that people aren't riding on the sidewalk. Okay, so if we accept your recommendations, we're saying not now, we're not saying not ever. I would say correct, yes. Okay, thank Through you. To the chair, yes. Yeah. Uh, is there any additional questions? I just need to my screen to change back to grid view. Any additional questions? Okay, thank you. We'll move to speakers on this item. Anyone to speak to this item? Uh, Councillor Ainsley is outside. You can go first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. How long do I get? Is it three minutes or five minutes? Five. Five minutes. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have a motion that I would like to move. Uh, you're outside. You, can't, somebody, yeah. you can speak to it, but somebody else would have to move Straight. it for you. You can't yeah, move it. Sure. Yep. I was just going to say I'm, I would like to put a motion on the floor. Somebody could take care of it for me after I speak to it. Um, so basically, no, no, actually, you've got to move the motion first and we've got to circulate it. Somebody has to move it for you've you. You've got to get someone on the committee to take carriage of it and it's got to be circulated. So I'm not sure who's chairing the committee, Madam Chair. What would you like me to do? I'm just talking to clerks. You can speak to what it is, but it's not on the floor until one of us moves it. But you can speak to the intent of it. But it's yep. up to our, it's up to the colleagues on on the committee to actually move it. But you can speak towards its intent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair McCauley. Um, So my intent is hopefully somebody will take care of of a motion. I would like to refer this uh, motion or this report back to the September 14th, 2021 meeting of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee on a framework which resolves the outstanding issues in this report uh, to have the City of Toronto participate in the province of Ontario's pilot project, including insurance, indemnification, uh, utilizing city resources, including the police and municipal licensing and standard, consulting with other North American cities on how they deal with accessibility issues, designating parking areas for scooters, uh, banning them from public sidewalks, banning them from public parks and pathways, and uh, capping the number of scooters which provide, which private companies can both deploy during any pilot project. Um, so my intent, Madam Speaker, I, I appreciate all the work that Ms. Lowe and uh, Ms. Gray and their staff did on this report. Uh, my concern as that we try and deal with a vast array of transportation issues in this city, and often we talk about the last mile, is making sure that we have as many different components in the array of resources before us to deal with that last mile. And I think that e-scooters are one of those components that we need to look at. I think that if we move forward with the recommendations that are in the report before us today, 
uh, not to take part in the pilot project, I think we're going to have serious consequences. As as we've all heard uh, today, and I'll use Councillor Prutz as an example, if his kids wanted to go buy an e-scooter from a store, uh, there's nothing from preventing them from doing that. He can buy his kids an e-scooter on Amazon, eBay, Kijiji, um, and any training or knowledge that they would need to ride the e-scooter. Uh, it's completely up to him or his kids to figure out by Google, which is probably not a good thing to do. Uh, we heard from one of our deputants who sells these scooters. They get the training that they need. Um, and that's the the appropriate course of action for that training. I think it goes the same way uh, with a bicycle, an electric bike, a bicycle. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different areas that I think need to be looked at. You know, uh, the motion or the motion I would like to put it forward or have somebody take care for me deals with a lot of concerns that we heard from the deputants today. Um, and I've talked with uh, staff at the City of Ottawa, the chair of their planning committee. They, for example, have a $180 fine for scooters that are left on public sidewalks. Uh, clients have their, their accounts uh, terminated right away. There's uh, an ability of electric scooters. If they go into a certain area or a public area, um, they, can have their, they can be turned completely off. In Ottawa, for example, if you take a scooter into the Byward market, uh, it's automatically has its speed limit ratcheted down to eight kilometers. I've talked with police who, when I've asked them about scooter enforcement, electric scooter enforcement, they're not running a, a cruiser down the street to try and stop an electric scooter on a sidewalk. They Pretty much like unless there's something out of the ordinary, as staff said, it looks like the person's intoxicated, uh, they're not doing it. Um, numbers can be capped. The pilot project, it's in their second year in Ottawa. They um, capped the number of electric scooters that private companies can use. So I think there's a number of variables that we need to look at further and a more robust uh, review of other jurisdictions. So I'm asking uh, somebody on the committee to take care of of this motion for me. Thank you much, very much, uh, Madam Chair McAlby. Thank you. Additional speakers to this item? I just need to have a screen change there to see hands. Uh, uh, Councillor Wong Tam, outside first. Go ahead, five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to all the members of the committee. Uh, I have been able to listen to many of the deputations uh, today, and I just want to thank the deputants uh, for coming forward and, and spending time with this committee. Um, your, your insights and lived experiences are incredibly valuable, and I just wanted to honour uh, you with some of those words of gratitude. Um, Madam Chair, I, I'm, I'm here today largely as a, uh, as a concerned uh, Torontonian, as well as obviously um, a city councillor, uh, but I'm actually really here as the chair of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, this committee, as you know, Madam Chair, uh, was uh, was struck up and created largely to provide advice to City Council. Uh, the membership of the committee is comprised of people living with disabilities, uh, people who work in the sector, and uh, and people with lived experiences. Uh, and this committee is uh, is largely here to serve uh, and provide advice and guidance to Council. Uh, it also uh, is here largely because of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, uh, passed in 2005. Uh, the body of, of law there uh, guides and uh, is bound by all governments as well as institutions and corporations to ensure that province, the province of Ontario, uh, is going to be accessible and, uh, and obstacle-free uh, and, and equitable to all by the year 2025. Uh, so we actually are bound by legislation uh, to come to you and offer you our, our advice. Uh, we're also, as a government, City Council is bound to adhere uh, to uh, the AODA requirements. And I just want to offer uh, this to the committee members as you, as, you, as you give careful consideration to what you've heard today, is that the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee has now sp taken a position on this issue at least two times. And the issue has galvanized our committee. Uh, it has brought forward uh, a number of uh, deputants, uh, and we heard uh, across the board, with very few exceptions, 
that the introduction, whether it's a pilot project uh, but uh, or, or permanent uh, of e-scooter introduction to the city and allowing them to use public spaces, including sidewalks, uh, would create a additional hazard, an additional barrier, an additional hardship for people living with disabilities. And I cannot press upon uh, you, Madam Speaker, and the members of committee on how important this issue is to, to this community. Um, they are absolutely um, uh, fearful that if the committee takes a step forward in even introducing a pilot project, it becomes a bit of a creeping issue uh, that all of a sudden the doors uh, are open uh, quite wide. And, uh, and we cannot have that uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, people who are living with disabilities are already facing unbearable long-term suffering during the pandemic. And to have this extra hardship thrusted upon this community uh, would be just absolutely cruel. Uh, so I want to just offer um, and, and remind the committee that the TAC um, committee has offered you some advice. They have said to you uh, in correspondence that uh, the introduction of e-scooters uh, in, in all public spaces would create, uh, obviously, a general safety hazard for all Torontonians, not just people living with disabilities. They believe that it would create a further barrier for people living with disabilities, as well as those who are elderly. Uh, already, we recognize that e-scooters are poorly enforced today, even though they are not legal today. Uh, making it legal would not necessarily increase uh, or expand or improve the enforcement uh, measures, which are already woefully under-resourced. Uh, it will also uh, add further encumbrances to the existing uh, inadequate infrastructure we have. Speaking specifically to, uh, to Janet Lowe's report, that there may be some conditions that need to be met, uh, they should be met, uh, if this issue was to be brought back, uh, which is why I would urge the committee members not to support uh, my friend and colleague's uh, motion, Councillor Ainsley. Uh, we feel that there has been adequate time spent on this issue already. There are many important business matters that this committee needs to deal with. I do not think it would be a good investment of time or resources on behalf of the staff or yourself to bring this issue back, uh, not this September, uh, and not until we have all those conditions in the staff report uh, that are met. Uh, and then finally, the request from TAC to this committee is to ensure that there is active enforcement of the existing bylaw. So, therefore, people who are riding e-scooters must be informed and educated that what they're doing is not legal and there needs to be enforcement and education to ensure that those hazards are removed as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. That concludes my remarks. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wongtan, for joining us. Uh, additional speakers? Councillor Pasternak, five minutes. No, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And... Um, I would like to thank all the deputants who came uh, today on both sides of the argument. I would like to particularly thank Luis Rousseau and David Lepofsky, who, who called me up. We met um, virtually uh, on on uh, on a couple of occasions, and uh, they were very informative of some of the uh, deep concerns uh, that are about this policy. And so, when I first uh, really was introduced to to e-scooters. I saw them in action in two cities, and one was in Denver and, and one was in Tel Aviv. And I wasn't there to examine scooter uh, technology or bylaws. I just happened to be there on, other, uh, on vacation, uh, I think a conference. Um, and I thought in Denver it worked very quickly. The scooters littered all over the place, and I don't know what their enforcement regimen was or what their deal was with the scooter companies, but it was, it was really, I thought, a lot better. Uh, but when, when I first saw these, okay, they looked like fun. They look like they seem to be part of the future. Uh, future. Councillor Pasternak, um, you're breaking up. Do you want to turn off your camera for the remainder of your remarks so you, we hear you better? Yeah. Do I get my minute and a half back? Can I start again? Yeah, go, go ahead. We heard the first little bit, but... Um, you can start, okay. start back. So, I, I heard um, about the scooters in Tel Aviv. <laughs> okay. So the, the bottom line is that, um, you know, um, I think there's just too much risk here. And when it comes to new technologies and new policy, timing is, timing is everything. And the city has stretched to its limit 
on, on many of the things that we're undertaking, uh, whether it be in vaccine rollout, in public health, in maintaining city services, our financial situation, um, counselors are, are stretched to the limit as well. And I think the timing, the timing is poor. And I realized when this first came to us, there was no pandemic. Um, they dropped a scooter by my office, which I, which I gave for a test drive, um, off road, of course. And, um, and, and I thought it was worth, worth exploring, but I thought anew, and I'm going to reluctantly, um, support staff recommendations because I think cities are really defined by the way they treat their disabled and treat their seniors. And I think we have to err on the side of caution to make sure our disabled and our seniors and other people, uh, you know, look, we have to protect our young people too, who are going to be riding these things probably without ha helmets, um, mostly safely, but I guess, I guess with some, uh, some risk as well, and they could be hurt as well. So seniors, um, the disabled, uh, the riders are all at risk. And, you know, when I, um, so so basically what we what we have to look at here is we have to we have to put a we have to block it now we can't keep debating it and referring it back uh endlessly and it's important to remember that uh one, one of the first negative aspects of this was it's not for the inner suburbs this is a downtown uh initiative when i suggested uh the inner suburbs uh, you know uh, and the distances in york center there was really no interest there and at one point I suggested going up to Downshoe Park and doing a pilot there because it's federal lands. And to the best of my knowledge, no pilot uh, ever took place. I think at the end of the day, uh, we, we have to support the staff recommendations. I wouldn't call this the most balanced report. And, and usually counselors expect, um, you know, a, a balanced report uh, so that they can weigh the pros and cons of a policy decision take staff advice, take your own research, and then make a decision. I don't see that here. I see, I mean, I see a slanted report, quite frankly, um, and, but that, um, that doesn't really impact my decision. Backing up a little bit, um, a number of years ago, uh, it was uh, Councillor Vaughan and I uh, restarted what we called then the Disability Issues Committee. And uh, that had been dormant for many years. We brought it back to council to uh, activate it. And then we interviewed, uh, along with former Councillor Mary Margaret McMahon, a series of representatives and got that uh, committee going again. It's certainly been very robust. Prior to coming on City Council, I worked for CARP, Kansas Association for the 50 Plus. And of course, in the first term, second term, I chaired the committee responsible for the senior strategy. So at the end of the day, um, we can't support scooters on our streets, on our sidewalks, and take the risk and liability. The city has stretched the limit now, so we therefore um, should not take this on. So I'm going to be supporting uh, the staff recommendation not to opt in on scooters. Um, it's not a decision forever. We can always revisit it uh, down the road. Uh, but right now, I think in light of our hospital capacity, our stretch city services, our financial situation, and the staffing that's going to be required to make this work, the timing is not right. And I think we have to uh, say no at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, Councillor Leighton, five minutes. My apologies, uh, Madam Chair. I have a last minute motion I just sent to clerks. If you wouldn't mind speaking first, that'll probably give them enough time to cut and paste it into their. Uh, he said he can pull it up if you want to start. Hey, hey, maybe they already had it. That's great. Thank you. You know, I, I can read it out, and then they can put it up when they when they have a chat. It's it, it have a chance. So the city council requests that transport Transport Canada regulate harmonized micro mobility vehicle safety standards, testing and labeling, and conduct robust consultation with key stakeholders in universal accessibility, active transportation, and road safety. Given the importance of consumer safety and protection, as well as clarity for business that manufacture, import, distribute retail and provide insurance products for micro mobility. So it was like seven years ago that 
um, the folks from Line came into my office with a scooter and that had a little URL code on the back. You know, it wasn't the scooter that fascinated me about the technology. It was the Right then and there, I wrote a motion that said, I would like uh, the dockless systems to be on our bikes, at your bikes. Because you know what? If you if you've got um, you'll you'll know just how difficult they're large. They take up a lot of area in what is a in a very high demand, um, in very. High Uh, Councillor Layton, likewise, we have you breaking up. Um, do you want to turn off okay. your video for the remainder of your remarks? How's that? I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, I, Mike, I, 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 oh. Mike, I missed most of your comments because you, most of your argument didn't come through at all. Just so you know, I did. Did the motion come through? Yes, the motion was displayed. So oh, it wasn't displayed. Yeah. We heard it, but we it wasn't displayed. Okay, so we'll display the motion and we'll start again. Hopefully, this and time I'm we'll be able gonna... to hear everything. Great, thank you. So the motion is that City Council request Transport Canada regulate harmonized micro mobility vehicle safety standards, testing and labeling, and conduct robust consultation with key stakeholders in Universal Accessibility Act of Transport and Act of Transportation and Road Safety. Um, seven years ago, line comes into my office. They bring this goofy looking scooter that has this cool URL code on the back, not URL, a uh, uh, cool little coded system on the back. And so a uh, QR code. And so I, uh, I, I thought, well, while I didn't love the scooter, I like the technology. And that's because if you have bike share in your, in your community, you know, how difficult it is to site these large stations. Um, I think mine's probably the, the densest community with respect to um, bike share, and what we have is uh, these large, these large installations in incredibly high demand areas along our right of way, where people want uh, to have patios, where people want to have green space, and you know it's been a big headache. And then, I, and so I thought this dockless system has come from the gods. What a great addition to to help us make this easier, expand our network faster. And then I went to Copenhagen and saw how it works in practice, where these vehicles were everywhere, both both the bikes and the uh, and the and the scooters. And so when when Lime or I can't remember who was who it was next, but when one of the other companies came to my office, I said, "Look, you can't start a discussion with us unless you figure out this right of way issue, um, because the the accessibility community is correct." You can't have these vehicles all over the road. That's what will happen all over the sidewalk. That's what will happen unless you start to square off the uh, the corners of, of that. And what we saw, like I, I think they've come back with what what can be a viable solution uh, with the lock two function. I get I get the uh, uh, the concerns from staff, uh, and I I'm very conflicted going into this vote, and I'll tell you why. It's because I think some of these challenges can be overcome. Um, while while they might not be ready today, I think that I think that they'll be ready soon. Um, I think what what we've also heard today though are concerns from the accessibility community, very real concerns that's that are backed up with data around uh, accidents involving people that aren't using the scooters that are bystanders. Um, I'm challenged by those arguments because I ride a bike everywhere. I don't ride on the sidewalk. Haven't ridden on the sidewalk since I was seven years old when my dad had told me how to how to ride on the street in the proper place. Um, but I I could see some of the same arguments that are being used to say say no, you should never have these this type of mobility device on our roads be used against bicycles. And yes. Cycling on sidewalks is a problem. Does that mean we would outlaw all bicycles or 
all e-bikes in the city of Toronto? Probably not. Um, we would probably rely on a set of laws uh, and enforcement. That enforcement's not happening. And I, I think it was either Anthony or someone else brought it up. Like the enforcement isn't happening. And so it, it's, a, it's a major problem. Um, that we're uh, that 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 we're challenged with already. The one thing that that I've heard and I wish was in the report, uh, and I didn't make a motion on it because I suspect the staff are going to help uh, are are going to bring this forward to council, is a discussion about this from uh, our medical officer of health, who we we are in the middle of a pandemic, our our hospitals are over capacity. And what's been expressed here is a series of safety concerns. In, a, in I think, 100% of cases, I have always followed staff advice if safety was an issue. If our experts from transportation was saying this would be the wrong, this would put people at risk. And that's why I'm supporting the recommendations in front of us. There are often times where we overrule staff. Uh, transportation staff on their recommendations, but that's because they're saying they're typically saying we're not meeting the certain criteria for the installation of a light, a stop sign, a speed bump, hump, whatever. Uh, but in this case, they're they're very clearing, clearly warning us there are concerns that they have that haven't been resolved yet, and therefore, until those concerns are resolved, we shouldn't proceed uh, in this direction. And so uh, I'm I'm satisfied and yet conflicted, uh, but I'll be supporting the staff recommendations with, of course, the motion that's been made that I gather um, Councillor uh, Pasternak had some input in as well. Um, that is about trying to get some some national standards on on the subject, but I do hope that um, that our GM of transportation can ensure there's a supplemental that in that has some comment from the medical officer of health. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor um, Councillor Leighton. I don't see anyone else to speak. I just briefly, uh, I want to thank staff. Uh, sorry, Councillor Prusa. Uh, um, Chair. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, um, Councillor yes. Cole hasn't had a chance to speak. Um, Councillor Prusa, you already spoke. Oh. Did you speak? You spoke already, right? Yeah. No, no. Councillor Cole may go, and I'll speak after Councillor Cole. That's fine. I'm okay with that. I haven't spoken. I asked a question. Oh, sorry, Councillor Pruta. Um, go ahead, uh, Councillor Pruta, and then we'll do Councillor Cole. Uh, no, no, no. I'm happy if Councillor Cole is, is is on now. I'm happy to to let him go. I'm I'm good with that. All right, uh, Councillor Cole, you're up. Whatever you like. Five minutes, Councillor Cole. Uh, okay. Listen, I'll go. Uh, uh, Councillor Pruta, so kind to let me go ahead of him here. Yeah, no, listen, uh, there's been an, an incredible number of very intelligent, thoughtful, well-researched uh, deputations uh, really on both sides of this issue. I really want to thank everyone that uh, came forward, uh, you know, good friends, uh, Louise Russo and David Lepofsky and his longtime advocates, plus all these, you know, even the proponents came up with some very thoughtful uh, presentations. And uh, and again, I want to thank everybody that from this, the uh, accessibility community that came out in uh, great numbers. Uh, so, and then I, I just want to again say a special thanks to our uh, transportation staff. I mean, I was extremely impressed uh, with uh, the work they've done in this report. Uh, you know, especially I want a big shout out to Janet Lowe. And Melissa Ferreira, you know, they, they we have some excellent staff who really put a lot of uh, research time into this, and I want to appreciate their work they have done uh, in uh, a very very challenging file. Uh, you know, uh, I have uh, been running the streets of Toronto for over 50 years. I've run everywhere from Reed Curtis Park all the way to the Rouge River, uh, not in one fall swoop, but you know, and in this past year, uh, with this crazy COVID, I, I think I've logged in uh, almost 200,000 kilometers uh, on the uh, streets and sidewalks and parks of Toronto. So I've been seeing firsthand uh, what's happening on our streets. Because uh, sometimes when we are in cars, uh, or even in, uh, on bicycles, we, we can't really uh, get a sense of what's really happening on the sidewalk. 
And uh, so, but what I see happening on our sidewalks and streets throughout Toronto is that there's a growing anxiety, even though there's been a reduction in traffic, I just see uh, a lot of tension out there. And whether it's because of COVID, whatever it is, I mean, I can even remember going down Christie by uh, Councillor Layton's house, and I had some cyclist yelling at me because I had uh, gone into the uh, bicycle lane to just get around uh, somebody without a mask, and the, the cyclist almost ran me over going south. Uh, anyways, uh, but so there's tension out there, and uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, the uh, the accessibility community, the, the accessible challenge community has incredible daily, daily pressures uh, on them uh, that are uh, just uh, unheard of unless you walk in their shoes. And uh, and I know my, uh, my uh, wife has worked with the uh, Foundation Fighting Blindness for 25 years. Uh, and many of our family friends are people that have uh, Everything from retinitis, pigmentosa to all kinds of visually challenged uh, children and so forth. So, anyways, this is um, an incredibly stressful city for them. Uh, and not only do they deal with the uh, automobiles, uh, which, as you know, uh, are going faster and faster on our streets, uh, no matter what we do at Vision Zero. Uh, as you can see, it's the number one call we get uh, probably in our offices is about traffic. Uh, Concerns result the automobiles, uh, so th there is a high level of stress, you know. And then you talk to our accessibility community, and then our our seniors. Like I'm having any calls this last week about why is city council going to allow drinking in the park? I, you know, I want to be able to go to the park and sit on a bench or have a picnic. Now I can't even go to the park because the city is going to allow booze in the in the playground. So, so people are stressed, and I and I. I understand the long term uh, viability of looking at scooters, but I, I think we've got to put in the pause button, a timeout button here. I think staff has looked at this thoroughly. Uh, I think there's got to be a lot of work done down the road to uh, meet and uh, reassure the uh, disabled community about these uh, realities and uh, the threats that are to their. Uh, uh, safety uh, getting to and from uh, their work or getting to and from the corner store. So I think we need time for that to be done. Now is not the time to proceed. And and this is why I support the staff recommendation. Uh, you know, it's something that has been, uh, you know, obviously well, well uh, thought out by our staff and they've consulted widely. Uh, as you can see by their presentation, they've talked to different cities, different advocacy groups. And so I just want to uh, ask my fellow uh, committee members to support the staff recommendation and uh, to uh, again just reassure the disabled community that we, you know, share some of their uh, pain and anxiety. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kroll. Uh, Councillor Peruzza, five minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, um, so I, I, you know, I. I'm looking at the scooter and I'm going to support the, uh, the, the, the staff recommendations. Uh, um, so some time ago, I, my daughter's, uh, I got this little girl and she's great on a bike, uh, really well balanced and so on. And I bought her uh, one of these things, but not the mechanized one. Uh, there, there's one that you just stand on and you push off of one foot, right? And watching her sort of for a while, like wobble on this thing and and kind of like, you know, be sort of off balance. I finally took it and I, I put it on a shelf in the garage and and eventually gave it away uh, because I didn't want uh, I didn't want my uh, my little girl on this thing just simply because I just I, I didn't feel good for her. And, and I don't think she was enjoying it. And and, and quite frankly, um, I, I didn't feel uh, that she was uh, very safe on it. Uh, I love, you know, being on, on mechanized motorized wheels. You know, I have a motorcycle. I ride my bike uh, frequently and I'm not adverse to, you know, the occasional fall and, and, uh, and, uh, an accident. Uh, in fact, a little while ago, I crashed my bike. Uh, I, um, I hurt myself fairly significantly, but you know what? Life goes on. I'll get back on my bike and I'll ride because I just simply 
uh, love to do it. But would I would I buy myself one of these scooters? And I and, and I see these. I see these on the road. I see them on the on the ravine. I often ride on the ravine, and I see people riding these things, and they go uh, fairly fast. And the reason I asked the questions I did of staff earlier, do I believe that that scooters are going away? No. Uh, do I believe that people will continue to buy them and ride them and and uh, and so on and 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 some of these things on our streets and, and in our communities are absolutely inevitable. Of course they are. Uh, and are we are we going to be able to stop that? We're probably not going to be able to stop that because it's just simply the way you know our rules and and our work and and so on. Uh, and, and you know what? At the end of the day, I I wouldn't want that. If somebody wants to buy one of these things uh, and ride it around, I you know that's their choice. Uh, 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 but uh, given the state of our roads, you know, given potholes, uh, even our sidewalks, for that matter, and the bumps on the sidewalks and so on, and given the size of these wheels and the mode in which you're you're on this um, uh, on this gizmo, uh, it just you know, from from my perspective, uh, it 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 makes me it would make me very very uncomfortable being on one of these things. Uh, just simply because it's, uh, in my view, it's very, very unsafe. Uh, but I'll tell you what bothered me most about this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I happened to be in Italy with my family, with my wife and, and two kids. And uh, we were sitting in a piazza, uh, um, uh, a, a church, beautiful church, uh, uh, San Rist Restituta. <laughs> and, uh, and this piazza had no bikes there. Because I heard somebody say earlier, you know, Oh, I ride a motorcycle, I ride a bicycle, I'd give them up and get on one of these things. But you know what? Uh, so we were in this piazza and it, you know, there was no bikes and, and uh, certainly no motorcycles in the piazza, but surrounded like, you know, sort of uh, uh, coffee shops and gelaterias and, and, and ice cream parlors and so on. And we were sitting there, I was sitting there having, a, 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 we were having an ice cream and there was one person on one of these scooters sort of you know, zipping around in, in the middle of this piazza, you know, kind of, he was having fun uh, and, and I don't begrudge him that, but there were lots of people walking around and all of a sudden this guy completely claimed my attention. And I couldn't focus in on what I was doing. I couldn't focus on, on, on the ice cream or my family because I was focusing on this guy, just sort of, you know, like always being cognizant of the fact uh, that sooner or later he's going to hit somebody and everyone else became distracted by that activity as well because because of this guy on this little zippy scooter scootering around and i just thought to myself that's wrong why should that one person on that on that one activity you know sort of command all of our attention and he just simply made us all aware of the fact that he was doing something that put all of these other people walking around at some risk. Eventually, one guy get, got up and confronted him, and there was a confrontation. But you know what? Uh, and, and I get that. And, and we already have lots and lots of confrontation on our streets. But if we can limit it, if we can limit them, uh, I think that that's, um, uh, that that's a good uh, you know, public policy way to go, is to try to sort of uh, uh, limit those confrontations. And I think that these scooters, um, would go a long way to just making our streets uh, feel uh, that, uh, that much uh, um, riskier and, uh, and making everyone, pedestrians and, and others um, on our streets, that much more nervous uh, about uh, folks riding upright on a small little gizmo like this that goes very, very fast with such very, very small tires. Uh, and that person could be ejected from one of these things at any, you know, just a little rock in, in the middle of the street or, or a little hole in the middle of the street, and they Thank could be you. ejected from one of these. So, um, so that would that would make me very very nervous, so Thank Madam you. Chair. So that's why I'm going to support the staff right. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Pruta. Uh, I think that's it from committee. Everybody's spoken. Um, I'll just speak quickly. I I want to thank. Um, 
uh, Councillor Rongtam for, for being here today and for the recommendations of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, likewise, thank you to Councillor Ainsley for attending. Um, I, I, I can't in good faith move Councillor Ainsley's motion as, as I don't uh, believe in, in that recommendation. Um, this has, has uh, you know, come back to us several times. There are significant issues that are highlighted in this report regarding safety, accessibility, insurance, and liability. And I just feel like deferring this item further still won't solve those very, very big problems. Um, I did ask in the questions about how insurance and liability can change. That is something that we need the province to do. Likewise, through the motion from Councillor Layton, we see that there's, there's uh, work that you know, could be done by Transport Canada as well. So um, on that basis, I am uh, personally going to support the, the staff recommendations the way they're written and thank them very much for the considerable, considerable amount of time and attention they've paid to this issue. Okay, um, uh, seeing no other speakers, we will move to uh, the motion from Councillor Ainsley. Sorry, Councillor Layton. Recorded votes on everything. Okay, great. Uh, so here's the first, the first item. Members, this is the uh, vote on Councillor Layton's uh, motion on IE 21.7. All in favor of the motion. I have uh, Councillor McKelvey, uh, Councillor Pasternak, um, sorry, can I see the rest of the, the screen? Oh, thank you. And Deputy Mayor Manan Wong, all opposed? Councillor Cole. Uh, Councillor Peruzza and Councillor Layton, how do you vote? This on the balance of the motion? Uh, this is on uh, your motion, Councillor Layton, I'm sorry. She was oh, gonna I'm support sorry. it. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I thought, I thought I was called in support. I'm sorry, and Councillor Uh, Madam Chair, that is uh, five uh, to one. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. We're voting on Councillor Layton's motion. Is that it? Councillor Layton's motion. Councillor Peruzza, how do you vote? Yeah, I'm in support of Councillor Layton's motion. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, that is five to one. That motion carries. And on the item, all in favor? Chair McKelvey. Me, what do you mean by the item? Uh, is that the staff report? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so that is Councillor McKelvey, Councillor Layton. Is this in favor? Councillor Cole. Uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, Deputy Mayor Menon Wong. Uh, any opposed to the item? So Councillor Pasternak, do you vote in favor? Yeah, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm in favor of the item as amended, yes. And Councillor uh, Peruz as well? Uh, yes, I'm in favor, yes. Okay. Madam, uh, Madam Chair, that is uh, unanimous, six to zero. Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for uh, your patience on this item. Thank you to all the deputants that uh, joined us today. That brings us back to our agenda that brings us to item IE 21.8, trans Transportation Innovation Challenges Fostering Local Outcomes Oriented Transformation. Uh, we have one speaker on this item, uh, Shob, Shob uh, Ahmed. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, you have three minutes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And hello, Council Members. I'm here to speak again to you about the uh, transportation innovation, specifically item 21.8. Uh, as stated before, I'm the founder of the uh, Scooty, which is a micromobility based out of uh, Ryerson DMZ. And we are uh, attempting to address the transportation challenges. And I'm excited by the possibilities associated with the transportation innovation zone. And I would like the opportunity to join, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 
From what I've seen, the proposal is skewed towards autonomous, uh, mo autonomous automobiles rather than innovative micromobility. This is despite the fact that demand for micromobility has grown significantly over the past three years and technology and innovation in this industry is advancing rapidly. Innovative micromobility options have already reached and benefited more people than autonomous vehicles have. And innovative micromobility is far safer than autonomous vehicles have shown themselves to be. It is worth considering that innovation funding for autonomous vehicles have been shifted to micromobility because the pace of autonomous vehicles innovations have slowed. As controlled, uh, I, I ask you to consider an approach that e-scooters, uh, for, for e-scooters that would be created a controlled managed pilot instead of unmanageable prohibition. Um, now I'm asking you to think beyond autonomous vehicles, incorporate a pilot as part of the proposed transportation innovation challenges, fostering local outcome oriented, uh, outcomes oriented transformation and let it happen at Exhibition Place, Toronto's Transportation Innovation Zone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for joining us um, and for your patience getting to this item. Um, any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, any questions of staff on this item? Seeing none, anyone to speak to this item? Seeing none, I'm prepared to move staff recommendations. All those in favor? Okay, uh, all those opposed, uh, staff recommendations carry. Uh, that brings us to item 21.16, further consideration of reducing salt use in our public realm. We have three speakers on this item. The first one is Michelle Woodhouse with Environmental Defense. Michelle, are you on the line? Michelle, you need to connect your microphone. Can you hear me? Oh, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, Michelle. Thank you for joining us. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. So my ask today is simple. It is to implement the actions being recommended by Councillor Layton to address road salt contamination and the threat that it poses to Toronto watersheds, the waterways and freshwater bodies contained within them, and the broader water cycle that the Toronto watersheds are a part of. As Councillor Layden has noted, the actual cost to the environment of using road salts as the quote unquote least expensive solution for managing winter safety on our roads and sidewalks are not reflected in its price. And these environmental and ecological costs are getting very real and worse, which will have impacts for all of us since we depend on the health of our water, freshwater resources. A recent study published just last month by U of T shows that chloride pollution from road salt is a year round threat and they found that 90% of samples taken from four GTA rivers and creeks during the summer exceeded federal guidelines for long-term exposure of aquatic life to fluoride. These levels pose lethal threats to aquatic life, plant life, and our drinking water. The solutions noted by Councillor Layton, such as spraying brine and pre-wetting are tangible solutions that can be adopted to help achieve the reductions we need to see in our waterways for us to protect them. But in order for these to work effectively and be implemented, they need to be accompanied by actions such as adopting a rate of salt application, which Councillor Layton is also recommending. This could also be a helpful guidance point for further provincial water quality objectives for chlorides to be adopted so that we can see more watersheds being protected in Ontario, and it can serve as a model for other cities to do the same. Unfortunately, in previous years, when asked for this kind of objective for chlorides at the provincial level, they did not act. Toronto can and should be a leader and take its own pathway forward for addressing this urgent issue. Ensuring that there's investment for other actions, including auditing actual rates of salt of application will be critical as well so that we can measure the progress of outcomes we want to see in order to meet our water quality objectives. I'm also strongly supporting the recommendation to seek guidance from the TRCA environmental agencies and NGOs to map out ecologically sensitive regions within Toronto. This kind of data would also support other city actions that are outlined in Toronto strategies, such as the parkland strategy, ravine strategy, and biodiversity strategy, and would also support efforts being made to implement green infrastructure solutions within Toronto by the Green Streets team. I also support the motion to coordinate with surrounding municipalities for an approach to saltwater management that models integrated watershed management and practice. Many scientists, academics, Indigenous peoples and others have been calling for a more holistic approach to watershed management and managing road salt as one connecting issue where we can see this approach applied in practice. 
We also need more training and certification available to help guide companies and private and corporate landowners to stop using such a heavy handed approach to road salt application. Companies will actually save money when they adopt proper rate of application that will still ensure safety provided by de-icing. From an economic safety and environmental standpoint, it just makes sense. With more training and awareness, private landowners and staff who work for the public realm can understand that our safety needs can still be met through best management practices. Every winter, I, like so many, dread the, seeing the salt that's being used in the city at such high rates and the way that it impacts things. Many people, people hate how it makes their boots get ruined or it causes corrosion or other damages to other surfaces. And it just looks ugly being used in the winter. At Environmental Defense, we get emails constantly from Can people who are Can we get your final thoughts? Angry. Sure. For me, when I see road salt, I see all of the harm being caused to our water bodies. And I had have asked my landlord to stop using it so much on his properties, which had helped. And I say this because these small acts of spreading awareness can add up, but the reality is we need stronger policies and guidelines and objectives to be implemented so that we can help businesses, residents, corporations, and the city workers to all work together to stop our waters from becoming so saline that they're actually putting the very survival of freshwater life itself at imminent risk. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to our next deputant, Heather Sloman, with the residence group Salt Free Streets. Heather, do we have you on the line? Okay. You have three minutes. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Three you minutes. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so councillors, committee members, and everyone else attending today, my name is Heather Sloman. My family and I live near Bloor and Christie, and I'm a member of a citizens group called Salt Free Streets. We're asking the city to reduce the use of road salt. I used to think that putting salt on the streets was a good thing, melting ice and protecting us against falls, and that I was being a good Samaritan when I dumped it on my walkway and sidewalk. But then I learned that it is, in fact, a toxic substance and officially declared as such by the Canadian government. In fact, my generous use of salt meant that I was doing my own small part towards polluting our groundwater, killing plants and degrading our urban trees. Salt also hurts our pets, damages our clothes and rusts our cars. And it causes the rapid deterioration of structures built from reinforced concrete, staircases, parking garages, buildings and bridges, to the tunes of millions of dollars each year. I know that Toronto already has a goal of sharply reducing the level of road salt used within its boundaries, but despite this, the use of salt has been exponentially increasing. So I very much appreciate your willingness to consider this issue today. Councillor Mike Layton has consulted with experts and drawn up a set of seven recommendations, which I'm asking you to implement. In particular, I'm asking you to proceed with proposed actions three and four. Action three directs the city to implement industry best practices, which you will also note typically bring savings to municipalities of 20 to 50%. And action four is of special relevance because I understand that new contracts come up for tender this year. We're asking the city to require the private contractors it procures to undergo a training and certification process, such as the one provided by Smart About Salt. Training and certification has become a mandatory requirement of virtually every trade at this point. There's no reason not to expect that our winter maintenance contractors don't also have the information and training they need to ensure that they're keeping us safe while minimize, minimizing our ecological footprint and also saving taxpayer money. Not to mention that the process is inexpensive and quick. I recognize that what seems straightforward and simple to me may in fact be a more complex process for city staff and councillors who are impeded by layers of policy and miles of red tape. As a Toronto resident who is deeply connected to my city, I want to remind you that beyond all those impeding trees, there is in fact a forest and we all want that forest to remain standing and even thriving for the long term. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll move to the last deputant on this item, Lee Gould with Smart About Salt Council. Can you hear me? We can hear you. You have three minutes. Uh, Madam Chair and Councillors, thank you for the opportunity to provide a deputation in support of today's motion. My name is Lee Gould and I work to support the volunteer not-for-profit organization, the Smart About Salt Council. 
be clear, Smart About Salt operates through a safety first prism. The Smart About Salt Council was established and incubated through collaboration between municipal level government and the winter maintenance industry itself. The goal being to protect fresh waters from the winter salt applied to roads and other facilities. The Smart About Salt Council now works transnationally and offers award-winning training, certification, and verification programs. Salts are the most reliable, plentiful, and affordable resource for de-icing roads, parking lots, and sidewalks in Canada. And by far, the most the main de-icing salt used in Ontario is sodium chloride, with calcium chloride and magnesium chloride also being used. I want to emphasize that when the issue around winter maintenance discusses road salt, which is typical, it does the subject matter and those engaged a very great disservice considering that estimates support the fact that approximately half, at least half, of the salt applied through winter maintenance is applied on private parking lots and walkways. Science also supports that while there can be too little salt applied, excessive salt can also be a hazard. Think of the example of marbles on flat surface when you consider the, uh, the, the salt crystals related to sodium chloride. What is needed then is a Goldilocks application. Not too little, but not, certainly not too much in order to achieve safety. This point alone would suggest the need to have a knowledgeable professional engaged winter maintenance uh, professional undertaking the practice. After all, you wouldn't hire an electrician or a plumber who hadn't achieved the requisite knowledge through school or an apprenticeship. With the limited time, I'll set aside the very profound environmental, environmental impacts that my colleagues have spoken to. Um, and I know that are uh, addressed through uh, uh, the uh, conservation authorities uh, uh, and, and that are reporting uh, at this time of year that the salinity often approaches uh, that of uh, ocean water, allowing at one point a population of East Coast crabs to live comfortably in the Humber. Winter maintenance practices are often different for, for roads in comparison to parking lots and walkways, which are often maintained by third party contractors. In recent years, these gritty small business owners have been challenged with rising insurance costs as insurers themselves have exited the market and premiums, premiums have magnified significantly, even in the face of a history of no claims. This is because even uh, often insurance actuaries have calculated that it's cheaper to settle a slip and fall claim and then challenge its validity through the judicial system. As a society, we need these first on-site workers to be available to undertake their work in order to ensure our businesses, shops, and recreation facilities remain open. On a relative scale, uh, damages to bridges and parking uh, structures uh, are the highest with the damaged concrete pavements, underground utilities, roadside objects uh, being re less obvious. Uh, as noted in our 2013 report from the Transportation Association of Canada and Environment Canada themselves. Indeed, in the annual U.S. nationwide damage to road infrastructure caused by highway de-icing ranges in the, in the, from $60 to $140 per ton of applied salt. Perhaps grand examples of negative impact infrastructure impacts correlate to the salt, uh, correlated to the salt uh, corrosion would be the mall collapse in Elliott Lake. Can we get and, your final uh, thoughts? Yeah, the final thought is that uh, we could, there is low hanging fruit here. Uh, the, the city can take a leadership position and can uh, seek to have private contractors uh, through themselves and serve TTC and TPA and other extensions of the city um, demonstrate the professionalism and their knowledge through training and, uh, and certification. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining us today. Are there questions of staff? Okay, I have one quick question for staff. Uh, Councillor uh, Pasternak has questions of staff. You can go first, Councillor Pasternak. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'm looking at this, uh, particularly items D and F, implementation of a new standards across large publicly owned property owners, such as school boards, building owners, manager associations, the Toronto Transit Commission, Toronto Parking Authority, and also require contractors to be certified in sustainable salt use, and number F, coordinating with surrounding municipalities with shared watersheds to coordinate efforts in urban planning, road development, and salt management across the region. I mean, is this is this realistic? I mean, this would this just seems to be a whole division that would it would be the salt division. It, it's it seems ambitious. Uh, 
to the chair to Council Pasternak. So we've certainly done a fair amount of assessment of our uh, existing salt use. We know that there are some issues and challenges with regard to the application on uh, on private property and in some of the other facilities you mentioned. Um, generally speaking, the scope uh, definitely covers things that are outside of our authority. Uh, I will say, however, we are working with a, a professor at Ryerson who's uh, a noted expert in this field, and we will be coming back to a committee in November, December with a, an additional assessment of our existing health application. We also have uh, new winter contracts that are coming forward uh, starting uh, in the 22 season, and we will be, again, uh, making recommendations about uh, calibration of equipment, et cetera, uh, can certainly look at and, and talk about training and certification. So we will um, we will take that back, but I do agree that the scope is, is beyond what we uh, what we typically engage in. In fact, it would occur to me that much of this is statutory, will require provincial legislation. I don't even know how a municipality uh, can can impose these standards with uh, benchmarks or fines or inspections. Um, I don't. I, is it something that we should just put in your hands and you'll figure it out, or, 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 or we should defer some of these? Well, uh, through the chair, I mean, we uh, we will certainly take back uh, in this process that we're doing with um, Dr. Oswald at, at Ryerson and and ponder and consider, um, recommend and review our existing program and consider what modifications we need to make. And I think we can come back at that time and discuss what's outside what what we found to be outside of our scope. Um, certainly, there are uh, recommendations that can be made and training that can happen as education. We know that our education on our existing winter, winter services program has been uh, pretty effective. We've heard from people. Uh, if we can be clear about what salt applications should look like, uh, we may get better compliance. But again, um, there's our program that we deal with on the roads and sidewalks, and then there's the rest of um, the application that's done by third parties. and. Uh, private property owners, and then to your point, outside uh, in the broader uh, municipality as well. So, okay, all right, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, uh, clerks are also um, preparing a few amendments um, with you, Councillor Layton. Um, and while they're doing that, I just have a couple questions along the similar lines. Um, you're, I, I wanted to know when the next report back was on SALT, and it sounds like that's in November? Yeah, November, December to you, Chair. Okay, and the current wording here says consider, so you can look at what aspects are in your jurisdiction and action those and, and report back on it. and. And likewise, if it's not, I mean, we have partnerships with Toronto Region Conservation Authority, others as well that are looking at regional things. So, so some of those you can also kind of table with other bodies. So I, I guess, are you comfortable with the way it's worded as consider that you can bring this in with your existing resources and your November report back? Yes, we are. And I do think it's timely. I mean, we are already going down the path of, of making sure that our new winter contracts are being... Uh, as aggressive on salt as we are. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions of staff? Okay, uh, speakers. Uh, Council, I'll go with Councillor Cole first because I think Councillor Layton, they're still amending your motion. So, Councillor Cole, five minutes. Yeah, I think. Um... Uh, one second. I think this is a very uh, important uh, motion. I say good luck to, uh, but. Uh... You know, the, the odd thing is that most of the calls I get is for more salt. Uh, I've, I don't think I can recall a resident ever calling me and saying, uh, uh, I want less salt on my road or sidewalk or TTC uh, uh, island. Uh, they're always asking for more. Where's the salt? As soon as it uh, you know, gets into early winter, I get the salt calls. Uh, so, and, and you know, the, the problem with this is that uh, the salt situation is that the alternatives are a ripoff. What the uh, big box stores charge for salt uh, substitutes is, uh, you know, you've got to pay a king's ransom to get some of these uh, chemical uh, replacement things that are available, uh, supposedly, that will replace salt. And uh, 
my experience is they, they aren't worth the, the paper they're written on. Anyway, they're not worth it, but the people pay exorbitant amounts, 10, 20, 30 dollars for a lousy bag of some uh, chemical that's supposed to replace salt. So we got to deal with that too. What are the replacements that can be used that are affordable for people? Uh, because there are a lot of seniors, uh, especially who are very concerned about going out uh, down to the corner store uh, when winter comes on and you have these um, temperature climate fluctuations that are pretty uh, constant. Uh, this year, I don't think it's been as bad as last year, uh, but uh, still we get a lot of calls for you know, the condition of our uh, sidewalks, especially, and trying to get on and off our uh, streetcars and buses. And I, and I, know, I don't know what the TTC uses, but I see them out there every uh, morning whenever the storms come. Uh, I hope uh, they're not uh, using salt, but uh, they seem to be spreading something on all the TTC uh, platforms and all the bus stops. Uh, so th that's the challenge ahead. Uh, and uh, and I just want to mention, one of the deputies mentioned the Humber River. Uh, on the positive side, uh, you know, I talked to a couple of the old time fishermen there in the Humber just last week, and they said they have never seen the Humber so clean. Uh, not only are the salmon runs incredible in September, but this year the, uh, the trout, uh, the rainbow trout are remarkable. They said there's never been so many, so large, uh, so many rainbow trout going up uh, down the Humber now. They're going down the Humber River. Uh, you know, the, the couple of guys told me they caught six, seven, eight pounders, which is a rarity. But so uh, there are some good things happening, especially uh, I want to thank Madeline McDowell for saving the Humber River uh, from being paved over years ago. And it's a wonderful place for people to go and uh, see uh, the running waters of the Humber, especially in the springtime. But anyways, I want to throw in that positive note, but uh, good luck on this motion to staff and Councillor Layton. Um, we could all do with uh, less salt, uh, but uh, we've got to find a way of uh, keeping our sidewalk safe and our TDC uh, stops safe too. Uh, and our roads, yeah, uh, people still refuse to slow down. They're all coming down from North York, speeding down to Toronto every day. You got to tell those North Yorkers, Councillor Min and Wong knows all about that, to slow down when they come down to the city. Anyways, God bless. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Any, uh, Councillor Layton, and your motion is ready as well. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if the clerk could put the motion up, um, this is really just refining some of the numbers that were in it based on what we heard from uh, the Safe About Salt folks um, and it also changed the word council city council request um, just to make uh, apparently it's got to go to council okay thank you uh when screen changes back anyone I else would, uh, you know what i'll just if i could just comment quickly sorry yeah um was was there another motion or was the original motion amended the original was amended the uh Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I would just say, like, look, when we were debating salt a, a couple of months ago, um, we had I had requested a report. It came back. There was very little um, uh, uptake and 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 folks stepping forward from the community. But after we had adopted it, and this was on uh, what what staff would be taking forward in their next years, uh, in in this year's uh, uh, renegotiation of the contract, um, that uh, these individuals came forward and said, you know what, there's more you could be doing. Uh, and 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 there may be more cost-effective ways. And I agree. Like Councillor pa Pasternak pointed out, some of this may be outside of our jurisdiction, um, which is why it's worded the way it is for us to for staff to consider it and perhaps come back with reg recommendations on how we could overcome it. Uh, I can't help but think there is more that can be done. I I believe it when Councillor Cole says he gets calls that there's not enough salt, um, but maybe he wouldn't be surprised that I get a lot of calls that say, why is there an inch of salt in front of this staircase? Um, because like the way it's being implemented is people come with a shovel, they shovel it off a truck and they keep, keep driving away. And that's not the way that's, that, that, that salt should be applied. Um, it is, it is toxic to the environment. Um, well, it's also a safety issue. We need to be doing what we can to manage it appropriately. I don't think it's too much to ask that, um, those that are applying it have some kind of training in how to handle 
uh, uh, the substance and apply it appropriately. Uh, and that could result in savings with us using less salt in the end. Um, so, but I did word it carefully to ensure um, that it wasn't giving direction for very specific pieces, but in fact, just asking uh, staff, staff to reflect on them with what we're getting from uh, these experts in order to uh, uh, in order to make sure we have are using our the best practices that exist. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Uh, additional speakers on this item. Uh, Councillor Pasternak. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to reiterate some of my uh, comments that I mentioned in passing during the questions for staff. Um, I, I always try and uh, bring a policy that's doable and achievable and and go for low hanging fruit first and then build from there. Um, I find uh, some of this is um, to be kind, uh, overly ambitious, um, to be a little brittle, unrealistic, um, trying to get surrounding municipalities to agree on anything uh, is is really a challenge in itself. But um, you have mentioned in here, you do use the word consider. Uh, so staff will write back and say, uh, this is unrealistic or this is realistic. I am thoroughly convinced that you will need uh, some kind of environmental statutory override on this, especially since it crosses municipal boundaries and it's the TRCA you want involved here. So we'll need some kind of provincial statute uh, to enforce any kind of new standards or, or kind of some, some kind of blanket regulatory environment. You know, I'm reminded of a, um, a, a street that went down into uh, Earl Bales and it was extremely icy and people use it as a gateway, uh, even though it was sort of technically an unassumed road, more of a, used to be a pathway, but they, they paved it into what looks like a road, a service road. So we finally, uh, you may recall the motion, I brought a motion so that um, the city staff would uh, would keep it clear and I think Toronto Water took carriage of it, uh, which was which was great news and the community was really happy. And then we got complaints that there was too much salt. Um, you know, so it is hard to win uh, on this on this issue. You, you want people to be safe. You don't want people uh, falling and hurting themselves and, and, and breaking their legs or damaging property. Uh, you don't want liability uh, for the city and private owners don't want liability. Uh, they've got to keep uh, keep the sidewalks uh, and staircases uh, safe, clear of snow and ice. And we've traditionally used salt. Um, but if there's an alternative, I, at one point I suggested naively using sand. And they said, oh, we're not allowed to use sand. So, um, so anyway, I think it's a good discussion uh, because I know that when it comes to uh, salt is not just an environmental issue, but it's extremely expensive uh, to salt this city. And I don't know whether the alternatives will cost us more or cost us less, but we should always be reviewing uh, uh, cost centers uh, and environmental centers. And I think I think this does it, despite my uh, reluctance and skepticism that, that a municipality could do some of the things um, that are listed in it, but it will get my support, I assure you, Councillor Layton. Okay, thank you. Anyone else to speak on this item? Okay, we have uh, two two items to vote on. So the first is the amendment that Councillor Layton put on his original item. So we can vote on that one and then the item. Okay, just waiting for the screen to change back. Okay, all those in favor of the amendment? Uh, all those opposed? The amendment carries. All those in favor of the item? Any opposed? That item carries. That brings us to item IE 21.18, supporting precarious delivery workers and bike couriers in Toronto. We have seven deputants on this item. The first one is Taryn Ellis. Taryn, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you. You have three minutes. All right. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is Taryn Ellis. I'm the one who started the petition that has 
almost 1,000 signatures of drivers who are struggling with parking tickets. And we are asking for your help, the city councilors, to try to get an economic parking permit. I worked as a food and goods courier for three years. So when the pandemic began, my time became very valuable and I took great pride in helping Torontonians get their groceries without leave and having to leave their home. At the beginning of this year, I did contract COVID and I was out of work for a few weeks while I recovered. So I wasn't able to work during that time. So that's proof that couriers put their lives at risk every day. Also part of the courier work I do is beer and liquor delivery services. So I'm carrying heavy boxes of bottles for customers as well. I will mention that if there is paid parking available, I always pay. But 95% of deliveries that we make, there is no parking available. Uh, also, I would like to ask for an emer emergency measure to be put into place for couriers who have delivery signs on their dash as long as they are not impeding traffic, not parking in bike lanes, blocking driveways, or parking next to fire hydrants until there is something in place. Uh, thank you for your time, and I hope you support this. Thank you, for, thank you for your concise deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, we'll move to the next deputant, who is uh, Arash Mano, Manocharian uh, with Gig Workers United, uh, Canada, Canadian Union of Postal Workers. Arash, are you on the line? Hi there, and thank you for your excellent pronunciation. Oh, okay, I was wondering um, how bad I got that. Okay, great. Um, thank you, you have three minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Committee Members. As stated, my name is Arash, and I am a driver courier and part of the Executive Committee of the Union Gig Workers United. Couriers are performing an essential service during this pandemic era. It's because of us that the public can stay at home and observe the public safety measures that the city is putting out. But we need support to do our jobs well and to do them safely. This includes a legal and safe way to park and briefly pull over while making our pickups and drop offs, and also uh, more posts for bike lockups to combat the rising tide of bike theft. And access to public restrooms wouldn't hurt either. As my colleague St Taryn stated, she has started a petition with close to a thousand signatures on it in support of this measure and has made several appearances on news and other media sources to talk about it. The realities of the job that we do can include taking multiple trips to unload several large and heavy cases of items. For example, three or four flat packs of water or large packages of toilet paper or what have you. When dropping items like this off, it sometimes takes three or four trips from the car to the door. And that's in addition to a five to 10 minute wait for a customer to answer their door. Or even worse, if a condo has a no entry policy and we have to wait 10 to 15 minutes for somebody to come downstairs. We do all this for as little as $3 paid per order. We don't even make minimum wage. When we're making pickups and drop offs, many of us leave our engines idling to make it clear that we're not parking but briefly stopped. We turn on our blinking hazard lights. We have delivery, <clears throat> delivery placards and branded food and delivery bags. But these measures are often ignored by parking attendants. Uh, this was the case even last spring when the city issued a moratorium on ticketing to facilitate curbside pickups. I had many debates and arguments with parking attendants as I pulled up or as they were writing me a ticket uh, during that time period even though I was carrying a large branded delivery bag. Parking is often unavailable in the retail areas we pick up in, and most of the newer apartment and condo buildings don't have driveways or laneways, let alone parking. We have to park and stop illegally. We don't want to. It's only by the grace of God that we don't get more tickets. A single ticket of 60 to $100 is more than a shift. The average shift can pay as little as 40 to $80. Like I said, $3 in order is quite usual. And this is before our operating costs of fuel and insurance. Last month, I got a ticket for $100 that I tried to fight. And my request for a court date was rejected out of hand and the ticket was affirmed. An emergency measure or uh, interim instructions to parking enforcement uh, to not ticket us and maybe make an accessible parking permit available to us would help the city as a whole. In summation, the ability to pull over in no parking and no stopping zones would help us ease traffic issues throughout the city, prevent environmental issues of us idling, 
and just make things flow a lot easier. We don't want to break the law, but we need your support in order to do our job safely and continue our uh, essential work that has been keeping the site public safe during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Deputy Mayor, three minutes. Yeah, is it, is it your expectation that these measures would only be t would only take place during the pandemic and then following that? Uh, it's my hope that there would be an emergency measure for the current pandemic, but we would also like to see the availability of a parking permit that couriers could use on a regular and ongoing basis, much like the city of Ottawa introduced a few months ago, where you pay, I believe it's $100, and then you get a little permit that you can stick in your window but to pull over in no stopping and no parking zones for five to 10 minutes. Are you aware of the horrible problem we had with couriers that um, the mayor's spent, you know, quite a bit of time getting rid of with couriers stopping on streets, parking illegally during rush hour and uh, bunging up and really uh, making traffic a horrible arrangement? I'm aware of that, but uh, it's my opinion that if they were able, for example, I, this, the ticket I cited getting myself last month uh, was during rush hour, but it was on a side street, uh, uh, not, in the, not in blocking traffic in any way. Uh, if we were able to do things like that and park just a little bit off the street and in, in less traffic areas, it would reduce the issues of people parking and blocking traffic. That's not our intention. So I'll give you an example on Dundas Street um, in front of one of the towers there. Um, that's a really uh, between Bay Street and uh, Young Street on the south side. Um, the two lanes of traffic, there's a streetcar that goes down there and UPS, which is a horrible offender, parks, parks there during rush hour and goes and does a delivery and keeps the lights flashing. Is it your expectation that that person in a no no parking or no, no stopping zone should be able to park there and deliver their package? There, no, but in the kind of area you're describing, there's usually a side street, maybe 50 or 70 meters off kilter from that, uh, which also has no parking and no stopping. I'd like to be able to pull into that side street and stay there for a few minutes while I do my delivery. Okay, well, I mean, it's interesting. There's been a lot of, dis you know, I don't, I'm not sure if um, whoever put this forward, I think it was Councillor Layton. There's been a lot of discussion previously about couriers um, and trying to allow them to have drop offs in the downtown area. Are you aware of any of those discussions that have taken place in the past? Uh, I'm not aware of any like city council discussions. This is my first time participating in this process, but I can tell you that for the union as a whole, this is something that we've been discussing since pre pandemic. Um, many of us get a lot of parking tickets and while we are only stopped for 2 or 3 minutes at a time, most of the time, uh, like I said, a single ticket is worth more than we make in an entire shift. What do we do with the big companies who who, who Last like question. Uh, uh, U, U, UPS, which is a hor you know horrible company that ignores us? If we give your if we give you a permit, how can we say no to them? Uh, one way to do that would be to make the permit accessible only to small businesses. Uh, as the couriers, we are independent contractors, uh, mislabeled as independent contractors, unfortunately, but that is the current Our, framework. Uh, all right, thank you, Madam Chair. I think I've identified some of the issues to this through my questioning. Okay, thank you. Um, any additional questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. We don't believe the next two are on the line. I will call them both Umar Asgar, Houston Gonzalez. That brings us to Shanice Silva. Oh my God, it's my turn. Yes, it's your turn. You have three minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Shani Silva. I have been a food and alcohol carrier since the pandemic began, and parking is a consistent issue when delivering orders. In some cases, I have heavy boxes and bags to carry and prefer to find parking closest to the front of a house or in most cases when I'm downtown Toronto as a condo. 
most of the condos I deliver to have no parking and the surrounded areas either has minimal parking or any space at all. And then I end up having to park illegally and putting myself at risk for a ticket. An example of this would be East Liberty Street. It is a wide enough street um, and it is lined with condos, but it's also lined with signs that say no standing. Deliveries, deliveries in this area are common and most drivers risk the ticket. So, and I have myself have received two tickets from delivering to buildings in that area. And they're both about a hundred bucks each, um, which like Arash had said, it can be at least like a couple of days work. We don't get paid too much. And I can't really afford to, to lose on that kind of money to deliver items that are, especially ones that are very heavy. Um, I have also been rudely approached by parking enforcement um, about where I'm parking and how I've parked. Um, and I understand people have their days and I understand I shouldn't have maybe parked in those areas, but in order to do that, I have to do what I have to do to, to deliver and not have to walk so far. Um, it's a confrontation that I shouldn't really have to deal with. And it's not one that I like to deal with. Considering that there are so many couriers now on the roads, I believe a parking permit for drivers like myself need to be put in place. And until something done, there should be a hold on charging couriers with parking fines. We all know that the times are hard and we know that we're trying to do our best, but we can't work at our best if we can't deliver safely and quickly. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of deputants? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the next one. Bryce Sofer. Uh, hello, do you hear me? I hear you. You have five minutes. Uh, sorry, you have three minutes. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I'm, I'm here to speak, uh, and, and my name is pronounced Bryce, but I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm here to speak on behalf of bike couriers and, uh, and give show solidarity for uh, my uh, driver comrades. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the law and uh, the infrastructure hasn't kept up with the change in uh, how our society works. These are services that are used by uh, citizens of Toronto. These are being delivered by citizens of Toronto. If this business is uh, taking place in Toronto, if we know it's a reality that exists, then it's time that we uh, change the law that we adapted and that we found new solutions uh, because this is no longer tenable uh, for the people that are doing this work. Um, you know, just uh, as them, as a bike courier, I also uh, would espouse that in these new areas that uh, where development has uh, increased, like uh, Liberty Village and the South Core, that we would increase bike parking as well. That infrastructure, as well as uh, the parking issue, has not kept up with the demand of uh, cyclists, either couriers or just recreational cyclists. Um, so I would really appreciate uh, if that was made available because like them, a parking ticket, if I get my bike stolen, that is several days uh, work. Not only that I'm not able to work, but then I have the cost of acquiring a new bike. Uh, that, uh, that can be really difficult to, to, it can be really difficult to keep up with that. And it can set me behind where I would have problems paying my rent or uh, paying my bills or anything like that. Uh, these two problems are interrelated. And I think that, you know, in the new economy with, uh, with, with these, uh, these companies operating, if we're gonna allow them to operate in the city, then we need to change or update our infrastructure and the legal framework uh, within which uh, we are working uh, in order to keep up with that reality. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions for Brees? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the last deputant, Robert, uh, sorry, Robbie Murphy. Robbie, are you online? Yep, I'm here. Uh, you have three minutes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Council Members. My name is Robbie Murphy. I've been a bike courier in Toronto for various companies for about the last seven years. Uh, during this pandemic, delivery workers have been deemed essential to help keep people at home and to help keep people safe. It's time that the city does more to help support these workers that have been deemed essential and have continued to work uh, sorry, throughout this pandemic, as well as going forward. There are many areas in the city that bike parking is, not, is inadequate or entirely non-existent. And this creates problems not only for the efficiency of people who are not paid an hourly wage, but are instead of paid by the number of deliveries that we can complete. This also impacts the safety of people's doing deliveries, uh, as we are either forced to find a place to lock that is significant, sorry, significantly further away from the building that we are delivering to, forcing us to carry heavy weights, increased distances. 
or to lock our bikes to something that is not secure and potentially remove our entire ability to work if our bike is stolen. Increased public bike parking, basically not within a condo building around the city would dramatically improve Courier's work lives, mine included, as well as the lives of regular commuters, especially if neighborhoods that have little to no bike parking were to actually get some. For example, Yorkville, Bloor Street, um, as well as Regent Park. I do also understand the drivers face very similar issues in Toronto, mostly with tickets, which can effectively remove an entire day of, sorry, an entire day of pay, uh, as well as lack of parking. And as a bike courier, I'm here to stand with my fellow app couriers and cars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Any questions of the deputants? Okay, uh, seeing none, I have been informed that Umar Asgar is now online. Umar, are you with us? Yes. So I'm here. Thank you. Have you have three thank minutes. You much for, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having us here. Uh, here. We are really uh, thankful for this opportunity. Uh, as we know that gig workers are the backbone of the economy, and whether it's rain or snow, gig workers keep Canadian economy growth. We are precarious workers, and now we are called essential workers because we are working and serving, uh, serving COVID patients and those in quarantine and that's helping in keeping people safe by delivering uh, to their home uh, during this difficult time. Uh, gig worker and couriers are service providers, just like cabs, TTC, ambulance, and yet we think that we are the only ones who get the most parking tickets. Whereas when the cabbies are picking up or dropping off their passengers, loading and unloading their luggage, they don't get any ticket at all because they are assumed as service providers and we are not assumed as service providers at all. And we think that, uh, you know, parking law is sometimes used against, uh, against us instead of supporting us. So we want to be recognized as essential service providers and uh, by providing us uh, with essential work related rights. And uh, uh, gig workers, we earn, uh, you know, minimum, uh, around about minimum income level, and yet we have no work related rights like paid sick leaves, and we are all called independent contractors, and therefore we have no private health insurance. And we were going door to their door for doing our deliveries, but we were not prioritized by government for vaccination like other uh, uh, hospital health workers. And we buy our own protective gears ourselves, and we were not paid even $4 extra per hour uh, like hospital health workers for working during this pandemic. Uh, I personally got sick while making deliveries and couldn't get back to work for almost six weeks. And uh, I'm the only source of income for my family. And gig workers don't have, uh, didn't have access to washrooms as well while working in the severe winter weather. And especially talking about the parking tickets, each parking ticket costs a day or two of our income and sometimes even more uh, uh, than that. Uh, and we hardly park for a few minutes at a pickup or drop off location. Uh, I got $175 parking ticket uh, in Mississauga. Then a customer requested to bring groceries back to the door because she was quarantined. And we were just like, you know, maybe in one or two minutes in and out of the building. Similarly, $100 ticket was issued at 75 East Liberty while leaving groceries to the concierge at the main ground level. So uh, another thing is that parking spots are not enough in downtown. Most are full during rush hours, and many times we have having to lift multiple groceries bags, uh, which are going to no parking zone areas. And uh, the nature of our work demands picking up and dropping off deliveries everywhere in the city. But traffic and parking laws are not supporting uh, our essential work at all as of this moment. And we, therefore, we can't afford to pay for parking at each pickup and drop off location since we hardly earn around four to five dollars per delivery on average uh, and pay so many expenses like car loan, gas, expensive car insurances, and maintenance, et cetera. And uh, we don't create any parking or traffic issue at all while working because of our driving expertise and being so quick and considerate of others. So therefore, we humbly request exempt uh, couriers and gig workers from pay paying parking fees completely at all, or at least making parking permits as economical as possible. 
Can we get your uh, final thoughts? Be any parking. Sorry? Uh, you're at four minutes. Just asking for your final thoughts. Perfect. Uh, so there shouldn't be any parking tickets issued to Korea as well. We are providing essential service to Canadians. And uh, we're really thankful for having this opportunity. This should continue so we can bring our issues to uh, your knowledge. And uh, also, some, some, there are some traffic related issues that need to be solved, like once the thing, things get back to normal. Like, uh, uh, there should be some rules and regulations for pedestrians uh, as well while they are crossing their, uh, the signal light. Like, they should cross on, uh, you know, the, uh, when the pedestrian crossing light is on and not like any time they want to, because we cannot even drive in, in, in during the rush hour, especially in downtown, if, you know, uh, bicycles and uh, scooters and everyone is using the space uh, we are supposed to use. And uh, if we can have more faster one-way lanes for the city, like Adelaide and Richmond, one way with less traffic lights, you know, it will make our career Great, work thank you. I'm going to ask you to wrap because, up. Uh, uh, perfect. So that's all I, I wanted to say. Thank you very much for providing me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it into committee. Are there questions of staff? Uh, Councillor Layton. Just very quickly, currently, are courier vehicles allowed to park in no parking zones for the purpose of making deliveries? Uh, through the chair, I'll have Dave answer that, but I, I did want to add that through CurbTIA, we have added um, over a hundred, almost 140 uh, quick time parking spaces, so pick up and drop off zones that we uh, we made available. Uh, so those are certainly in place right now. I don't know if Dave has anything else to add on the um, legality of parking in, uh, in those zones. Yeah, guess. through the councillor, um, sorry, suit of chair, councillor, the couriers are expected to follow the parking regulations that are out on the street. So there's no leniency in that regard at the moment. But there are areas that are considered no parking that are that that loading is allowed to take place, correct? Correct. So if there's if it's no parking and you're just stopping to unload, you can do that legally. Um, no standing, um, you have to be um, letting somebody out of your vehicle or uh, picking up a passenger and no stopping is basically means no stopping at all. So the expectation is that if people are unloading packages, it happened in a, in a, in a no parking area. Because this is, we ran into this off Bloor Street with the Bloor Street pilot. We painted in loading zones in areas that were no standing, mm -hmm. uh, but the expectation was that's where people were to unload packages or vehicles would unload into shops or the Coca-Cola truck, right? Pulls up. Right now it probably parks in the bike lane, but, but it used to park in the, in, in the traffic flow lane. And then they were told, look, it's, it's no, you got to get into this, the, this loading area. Through the chair, my understanding is we did that in uh, no parking zones. Exactly. Yeah. So or we took street. no, so in no parking zones is where we expect the loading to happen. Now in areas as council Min and Wong pointed out and like, like I, I'm all for trying to make sure that traffic is move, moving efficiently. But, but there, they, those are no stopping zones there in particular during rush hour, rush hour zones are no stopping between certain hours. Correct. That's correct. So the intent of the motion is in areas where people would otherwise be parking to unload. If it was a FedEx truck, they probably wouldn't get a ticket. But if it's just some random car that doesn't have any other symbol that suggests they're loading uh, or unloading, then they might get a ticket. Uh, that may, that's editorializing, I think, more. Yeah, staff are already looking at stuff like this, correct? It's in the curbside yeah. management strategy. Correct. All this is doing is really in advance of that, is trying to get it back a little bit quicker and to look at the feasibility of a special permit, correct? Understood, understood, yes, that's correct. But you're already looking at this. Uh yeah, through the chair, yes, we, we also had recommendations, as you pointed out, in the um, in the curbside management strategy. And then uh, we took that um, 
type of recommendation and tried to apply it for what we thought was going to be helpful to people doing temporary pickup and drop off for especially food restaurants, et cetera, uh, during COVID. And as I mentioned, there's still over 130 of those spaces that still exist out there today. Um, I just also wanted to mention, because the other piece of the, of the motion was around bike rings. Uh, we do have over 15,000 bike rings in the city at this time. We're adding about another 700 this year, which um, we're currently in the process of contracting for. So, um, you know, the space limitations can be challenging, especially with uh, with CAFETO and trying to navigate all those curbside uses. But we are looking to put an additional bike storage because we know that it's necessary to support the increased number of cyclists in the city. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor, five minutes. Thanks. Just on a technicality, my understanding is, and I think Dave, Mr. Twaddle said this, um, this is kind of like a not really sort of, it's my understanding of how the, the, the bylaws work. Except for um, the no stopping, the no parking, every, as long as you're dropping off, doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's uh, no, no, no stopping, all of the no parking thing can you can beat those tickets in court because the uh, the provincial law doesn't sort of recognize it essentially. Is that correct? I'm not uh, through the chair. Like I'm not sure if you can beat it in court, Councillor. Um, I well, think it's not it's not it's protected by provincial legislation. Provincial legislation only protects the um, uh, the no the no stopping. I think the, I think the challenge here is if somebody parks and leaves their vehicle and no one knows why they're there, they're likely to get a ticket. And I think that yeah, but if they're dropping off, the, it does, you know, if they're dropping off, they can always except in a no stopping right. zone, they can beat the rack. They could say I was dropping something off or I was picking something up. Is that your understanding? It, it's possible. Yes. I mean, it's it depends on. I mean, if you go through the administrative penalty system, I mean, you have to. Have that conversation with uh, with a, a solicitor. So I'm not sure that they can always beat the rap. Um, second question is is like so. Um, taxis are going to want this too, aren't they? And courier companies are going to be next to the door as well. Uh, through you and and construct people working on construction as well. I mean, we we tend to get a lot of requests for temporary exemptions from existing parking regulations. Yes. So th this is kind of this is like a real kind of. I mean, notwithstanding that, I understand why these, um, you know, small operators who are just driving their car around trying to, you know, during pandemic times, you know, make a buck. But the big companies are going to. This is a this is actually kind of a really messy thing to kind of unbundle, isn't it? Uh, through the chair, yes. And it's one of the reasons why we contemplated it as from, from a policy basis on in the curbside management strategy, and also why we tried to respond to the COVID piece through uh, the curb TO, because we knew there was a need and an increasing number of, of people who were doing restaurant pickup and delivery. So we tried to do that during the pandemic. But I agree with you that it is a it is a challenging issue um, and and one that does require a, a pretty firm policy basis around which to move from. And some property owners could be pretty upset when their car these some not so nice delivery guys are parked there for a long period of time. That is, is correct. That right. That is correct. Okay, I think my three. I've got more questions, but I think I'm my time's up, Madam Chair. Or do I have five minutes? You have five minutes as much as I don't want to admit that oh, you have two more. <laughs> so, um, so this is just for a report, right? That's your understanding. Um, it, it's a motion. Uh, let's see. I believe it is for a, for a, a report. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm finished. Okay. Thank you. Although you do have 1 minute and 20 seconds left. Um, any additional questions this floor? Uh, Councillor Cole. Yeah, question of uh, uh, Barbara Gray. Uh, just in terms of uh, the traffic in Toronto during the pandemic, I mean, I've noticed that there's a dramatic drop off in traffic uh, over the last year. You know, I think it's uh, almost 50% of what I've seen on the, the streets. Uh, what are the figures show in uh, traffic volumes 
uh, in the city? Do we have any overall or area uh, statistics? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Cole, yes, in fact, we do. We have a travel time index that we've been charting since the beginning of the pandemic, and we do a weekly um, examination of those numbers. So you can you can track it against the different phases of lockdown to see how the congestion is is uh, progressing. We're happy to share that with you. It, it is it is uh, certainly down from what it was. I I couldn't quote you a percentage. It, it has been down as low as. Um, uh, sort of a 30% reduction at, at certain times, but I, but we have that information. We're happy to get it to you. So we don't really have an idea of overall traffic volumes in the city or congestion, uh, but uh, not handy anyways. Uh, we, we do. If you have another question, I can probably get. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to latest. get that because uh, the part I want to ask about is, uh, you know, we're worried about traffic flow being interrupted. Meanwhile, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic where traffic has been diminished. Why can't we let uh, these uh, delivery uh, people, the couriers, etc., uh, drop off their uh, goods that people need? Uh, through the chair, that's the, one of the reasons why we had the temporary pickup and drop-off zones for Curb TO. Many of those locations are along arterials that would have restrictions for um, for uh, peak hours, and so we have not been enforcing that. Uh, and in fact, we continue to work with Toronto Police on, on that enforcement, looking at a number of different factors, including what the congestion index shows, um, as well as having um, having uh, tr you know parking enforcement staff out there to provide some kind of overview on, on what they're seeing on the ground. So we are constantly monitoring it, but um, we don't direct police enforcement, as you know, but uh, certainly we are trying to provide some relief to, uh, to delivery operators through the pickup and drop off. Yeah, no, I know it's worked well at uh, Young and Eglinton there where we, with the new stock teal that's gone in, we've allowed, I think Mr. Day Twaddle knows about that and uh, Sean McGee knows about it. We've allowed some drop off pickup there uh, in a very busy street. It's working very well. But to, what about these uh, people uh, that are uh, in this, uh, which has now become an essential delivery service uh, because people can't get out and they were told to stay home. So they, uh, uh, order online. They need they need uh, the, these uh, deliveries to be made. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, let's say on all the other streets, other than these main streets where we've done these curb uh, side pickup, etc. What do we do in uh, all the rest of the city? Uh, through the chair, are you referring to side streets and in other yeah. areas where people are? Well, I mean, I, I think you know, there's there's certainly been. Um, um, again, as I mentioned, we don't direct police enforcement, but there's certainly been, uh, you know, less engagement, especially in the permit parking areas for, for a pretty long period of time on uh, permit parking enforcement, but also just uh, the investigation of parking on, on those streets. So, I mean, I think people are uh, able to access, um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm not getting very far on this council call, so I'll let Dave answer if he has any questions. I do okay. know how we get our traffic volumes for that 59% of normal at this time. Dave, I don't know if you have anything to add on the, the parking enforcement outside of the curb TO zones. No, I mean, I think, um, you know, we can work with uh, Toronto Police on that. We've had uh, various discussions with them on how to uh, approach parking enforcement during the pandemic. And I think, you know, they've, um, they've lessened the enforcement on residential uh, streets um, because of COVID. Uh, we've talked to them about, uh, and they've talked to us about whether we want to bring that back, but so far we haven't done that because of uh, the third wave. So that's sort of where we're at the moment with, uh, with that. And so what if one of these couriers, they basically put their hazards on uh, we give them a uh, a sticker to put on a little permit sticker to put on the back of their window, the front of their vehicle, and therefore, if their hazards are on, uh, they're stopping to make a delivery. Isn't it possible to show some discretion? I mean, I think that's what the motion is asking us to look at, Councillor Cole, uh, and and I, I don't think we have all all the answers for that today. Um, certainly, we would. Um, we would take a look at that as we'd identified. We we uh, opted to look at the curbside piece as part of our curbside management strategy, and I also think that um, Deputy Mayor Min Wong has brought up a couple of really good points about the the volume of different entities who are asking for that kind of relief on uh, on parking regulations for short 
short, either short, short term parking or, or a pickup and drop off. But as Dave mentioned, we are trying to work uh, with industry during uh, the pandemic and, and make it a little bit easier for them to do their, their job with the knowledge that there's still a lot of pressure on the curbside. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, uh, speakers on this item. Councillor Layton, five minutes. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I'll, so I'm the last person that would normally say, let's let people park illegally, right? Like I've probably had more words with people parked illegally than every other member of this council, uh, of this council, let alone just this committee, because because I ride my bike in, in Toronto bike lanes. And when there's, there's no separation, you know what happens? Everybody parks there. So the intent of this motion wasn't uh, and, and and the intent of this motion wasn't to allow for uh, for any old driver just to park wherever they want and run it, run in to get a Tim Hortons. Why I have put this forward is because we have a very real problem here. There are areas that are no parking in the city for whatever reason or another, and courier companies get to park there and do their business. But independent, um, the unfortunate classification of independent contractor. And and no visible label on the vehicles uh, uh, for uh, most delivery drivers that are working for some of the apps means that they're all getting tickets, and unfortunately they have to pay them. Whereas the driver in the UPX in the uh, uh, in the pure those, those drivers don't have to pay anything. The company pays it off, and in fact they got lawyers that go in and probably do exactly or exactly what Councillor Min and Wong suggested and fight all the tickets on on weird technicalities and only things that those lawyers would know and they negotiate a, a lower rate. But when you're an independent contractor driving that many hours a day, I'm um, just trying to make a living, you're uh, you're not able to do that in the same way that, uh, that these big companies are. So on top of that, these delivery drivers are actually helping those small businesses survive right now. And when you look at what uh, what's happening to our small businesses, We've got to value what's what's helping them out right now, and it's certainly not a property tax cut coming from us. So these delivery drivers have become more important to our local economy more than ever. I would say too, a, a tool of this sort, a permit of this sort, would allow us to better enforce no parking where really no parking or no stopping should be happening. Because if someone with a permit like this was caught in a bike lane, was caught in a no stopping area, was caught in a rush hour area, was caught in wherever, then we could start talking about revoking that permit. And I think it's important to acknowledge that there are some places that, that parking and deliveries should never be happening. And there are some that may just be no parking, that it, that it, that it might be very well and fine and safe to have deliveries happen of, uh, of, of this sort. It was also something that was identified in the curb, uh, uh, the curb management strategy. And so my motion was, was actually expressed some hesitation in the deadline I had for implementing it. And so suggested the fourth quarter of 2021. So I changed it in response to, uh, to staff's, um, to, to staff's nervousness about moving that quickly or. Or, or demanding a report sooner. Um, so I'd, uh, I'd hope that this has your support. It's certainly something staff was looking at. Anyhow, I would just like to set some kind of timeline for achieving what, uh, uh, what the intent of, is, of it is to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Any additional speakers on this item? Uh, Deputy, Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor followed by Councillor Cole. Sorry, I had to wait for the screens to change. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm, I understand the intent of the motion, and I'm going to support it in that regard. I just think this is way more complicated than, than um, you know, the writer of the motion realizes. Um, congestion is a, a huge problem, even even right now. You know, in some places in the downtown core during the during the rush hour, it's it's not fantastic, and it's going to come back. Um, it's been a real problem in the city and, and we went a long way to clearing it up. The courier companies were really horrible and, and uh, that's number one. Number two is there's going to be a long lineup of people who are going to be wanting to apply for these permits 
if you say yes to the the folks that are you know doing the the deliveries you're going to have to have to say yes to the taxis all the brokerages are going to want it every single driver is going to want it and you know the these many of these businesses are people that are driving ubers you know they actually have basically taken more than half of the income from these taxi drivers and here now we're going to give them an even bigger advantage i don't know how how that works out and then you know you fedex and ups they're all going to be coming and then if you know you, you look at some of the you know if, you, if they're making a delivery in an apartment building you know, you know they're going to be some of these delivery guys that are just going to park there and take their good old sweet time or there may be a, an elevator that takes forever to get up and do a delivery and then you have uh, you know someone parking in a in a no stopping zone um, where another where, where you can't get by and maybe there are two or three of them and there's a complete jam up there. I just you know as I say I'm I'm not opposed to this. I just think it's incredibly incredibly complicated and um, best of intentions, but it's it's in the detail. It's in the detail where you know uh, we've really got to focus on this. So I think most of the members are. Are supportive of what he's, of what the what the what the council is trying to achieve, but I think uh, you know achieving it is going to be a real, a real challenge. So um, I will vote for it, and I'll look to get the report back. I would also say, and I, Madam Chair, that when we do this, um, in terms of telling people about it and consultations. You know, we have to make sure that, you, you know, these courier companies have to know about it. The taxi drivers have to know about it. You know, the other thing I'll say about this is, you know, historically, because I've been involved in the livery service for, you know, 20 years. We used to have, remember, we used to have laybys in the downtown core and all the counselors in the downtown core got rid of them. Right, because they didn't want the taxi stopping in front of their buildings. All right, and here we are. This is this is the problem. They are in many in many cases are victim. They have created this problem. So and now we're now we're going to have to solve it. So, Madam Chair, with that, I'll I'll uh, stop speaking and and uh, hand hand the microphone back to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Five minutes. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll be with you in a second. Uh, I uh, certainly uh, uh, agree with uh, Councillor. Here, nothing is easy as we know. So that's what we get the big bucks for is to figure out these uh, complex issues. But uh, I just uh, uh, sort of have a lot of sympathy for these independent operators uh, uh, that uh, are uh, basically doing the right thing. They're trying to make a living in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, they may be out of work, uh, they may be poor load or whatever it is out of their original job, and they're out there hustling. Uh, and delivering, uh, uh, you know, from restaurants, uh, they're delivering food, uh, which I think is the most delivery probably is being done food from local restaurants. And so they're, they're uh, basically trying to make a living during these very challenging pandemic times. So not only uh, with this kind of consideration help the independent uh, delivery people here, but it would also help small business. Uh, uh, as they uh, make, uh, because the big guys, you know, they, they hire, uh, you know, FedEx, whatever it is, uh, Amazon, I don't know. But anyways, I think uh, that's why we need to uh, consider this. Uh, and I, I support the uh, intent of this motion. Uh, and uh, I think we've got to go forward with it. And, and like the fact is, this pandemic is not going away for the near future, folks. You know, I've been saying that for the last year. It's not just going to go away. So we got to learn to live with it. And this is part of learning to live with with this uh, disaster that's still, uh, you know, going to plague us for uh, who knows how much longer. So, uh, and uh, so this is part of the new pandemic economy, sad to say, is that people will be ordering online. They want delivery. We're telling them to stay home and not to leave. So they're uh, getting on the phone. They're uh, getting on their computer and ordering in uh, everything from, you um, you know, soup to nuts here uh, on a daily basis. So, and these uh, independent operators, again, I want to thank them for being brave enough to come before council. And most of them, obviously, they said their first time uh, they're, they're uh, you know, speaking out uh, because, uh, you know, those uh, $100 tickets, you know, whack them good. 
so you, you work all day, then you get a hundred dollar ticket. Um, you can imagine the impact of that on that person. Uh, so I, I just hope that uh, we look at ways of um, maybe mitigating the, the, the this cost in a way that's uh, reasonable, that's uh, fair across the board, so that these uh, independent operators can continue to basically uh, deliver these uh, goods that the people of Toronto want, especially in light of the fact is now uh, traffic is really dropped off significantly. I don't know, we haven't got the facts yet, but just by being on the streets every day, I'll tell you, uh, I can go up Christie any day and hardly see a car going up Christie uh, anymore, where we used to see bumper to bumper all the time, for instance, and on St. Clair and on Eglinton, on Lawrence, uh, even the Allen is looking for customers, believe it or not. So uh, if we've got to look at this during this pandemic, especially when traffic is being reduced, and these uh, people are trying to make a living. And uh, so let's uh, take a good look at this and see if we can come up with something to give them a helping hand uh, so they can continue to uh, work without being uh, whacked with those $100 tickets. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Uh, anyone else to speak? Just waiting for the screens to change. All right, seeing none, I think we can uh, vote on the item. All those in favor? Okay, all those opposed, that item carries. That brings us to item 21.5, authority to negotiate and enter into regional waste management cooperation and contingency agreements. Are there any questions of staff? Okay, seeing no questions of staff. Speakers, I know, um, Councillor Leighton, you have a motion? Yeah, yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. The clerk could put it on the screen. Um, so the most motion is to the easiest way of doing it, and I'll explain in a second. Was for me to at least it after some discussion with the chair and uh, and our GM of solid waste management. It seemed the easiest way to accomplish what I wanted to was doing the following. Um, it is to delete recommendation two and replace it with the same thing, but um, omitting the. Uh, the words energy from waste facility and adding a three as it pertains to uh, the energy waste facility or the possibility of contracting to an energy waste facility, but requesting um, a, uh, a report back if we choose to go in the way of uh, energy from waste before authorizing staff just to enter into the contract and that that report back contain a couple of things and they're listed here. Um, so. I am uncomfortable with us going down the road of energy from waste, in particular uncomfortable uh, with it because of our pending transform TO uh, targets that will be coming. Um, I know that that's, uh, I have contemplated just deleting energy from waste and leaving it at that, um, but I know that probably many of you might want an opportunity to vote for something that says not ruling out energy from waste, but looking for a little bit more information about it before we go down that path. Um, so that's how I've chosen to to draw up the recommendation, um, which says if it's a traditional landfill, go ahead and do what you do um, in the normal circumstances for these sort of emergency uh, additional um, uh, uh, disposal opportunities. Uh, but if you're if the city's going to go down the energy from waste path for the first time in a long while, then I think it deserves a report back to council um, so that we know what the implications of that are. It connected to the um, our, our transform to goal we come in later this year. So uh, yes, that's it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Layton. Anyone else to speak to the item? Uh, Deputy Mayor. I have questions of the mover. Okay, questions of the mover. Go ahead. So I didn't have a chance to review your motion extensively. Is this? So, what is the your intention in this motion with regard to energy to waste? So, I was uncomfortable with giving staff the authority to enter into agreements with respect to energy from waste. So, what my motion does is it says, here's the authority if you're going to do it the traditional way at the traditional landfill. But if you do choose, so you can negotiate the energy from waste before entering into a contract 
bring, bring back the following information to city council. So you're it not excluding consideration of it just as long as it comes to council for a vote. If it's energy from waste. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Any additional speakers on this item? Okay, briefly, I'll just say, um, you know, thank you, Councillor Leighton, for, for working with uh, both myself and the, the general manager. Um, I, I think this is a good compromise. I understand um, your request to ask for more information, but it doesn't preclude that we go down that route in the event that we had an emergency and we had waste we had to uh, dispose of. Um, and, and this is, you know, about keeping all doors open. And I've said time and time again, in, when it comes to waste, there's no free lunch. Um, landfills cause groundwater contamination. Landfills still have methane. There's still, there's no free lunch. It's all just a matter of where the contaminants and where the waste go. Um, but that said, I, I am yep. comfortable with, with, you know, a report back on, on where it's going, um, the company being used, the implications of that, and showing that it is uh, consistent with international best practice. So on, on those grounds, I, I am willing to support um, your amendment. Thank you for, the, for working with everybody um, to come up with what I think is an excellent um, uh, consensus and, and com um, compromise for everybody. Okay, um, anybody else to speak to the item? Okay, uh, all those in favor of the amendment, we'll pull that up first. Okay. Thank you, sorry. Okay, hands up now for all those in favor of the amendment. The amendment carries. All those in favor, favor of the item as amended. Hands up, the item carries. Uh, any, that's it, the, that's a wrap. No bills, no bylaws, no nothing. Okay, thank you so much everybody. Thank you to all the deputants that joined us today. Um, have a happy, I don't know what day it is, this pandemic, pandemic, Wednesday. pandemic Wednesday. Okay, have a good Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair.